So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto banished and becomes a sage. Part 2. If you guys enjoy this, what if? Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 7. Invasion. Move those timbers. Hurry with those seals. Come on, put your backs into it. Everyone along the wall suddenly freezes and stares at the busty blonde. Does this look like a piss break? Get back to work. She shouts, making everyone move in fast forward. Tsunade sighs as she oversees the bracing and updating of Kanoha's walls and defenses. A seal that Jiraiya came up with last week along with Naruto's Uzumaki scrolls is something that any cage would be interested in. In essence, it seals nature chakra into the walls, strengthening it several times what it would normally be. Add that to the chakra absorption and nullifying seals already in place on the outside of the walls, any would instantly be reduced in rank by two, and chakra would be absorbed from anyone attempting to climb it using the tree exercise. You're getting edgy. Perhaps you should take a break, a voice comes from behind her. She turns to see Jiraiya making his way over to her. I can't, not with the Akatsuki being a day away now. I can't help but get on edge. Jiraiya nods in understanding. He would be lying if he said he wasn't feeling antsy himself. Where's Naruto? He should be back here anytime now. I sent him to Taki to see if they can help out as well. They may not have a large military, but they do have the Nanabi no Kabutamushi, and a Jinch Kriki can make a large difference on the battlefield. Just then Naruto, his Aulanbu mask on, lands between the two and an orange-eyed girl landing just after him, I won't describe her, as I'm sure everyone knows what she wears and what she looks like. If not then look it up. Mission successful, is all the words he says as a fox comes out from under his hoodie and lays behind his neck. The Sandin's eyes shoot to the fox and understand immediately. However, the green-haired woman speaks, drawing their attention. My name is FK, Jinch Kriki of the Nanabi no Kabutamushi, she says respectfully, bowing low as she does so. Tsunade smiles at the young woman before her. I'm Tsunade, the god im Hokage, and this pervert is Jiraiya, the toad sage. I'm glad your leader sees Akatsuki as a threat to all of us. You will be staying with Owl and his clan houses for now along with any other Jinch Kriki that shows up. FK nods, but her eyes keep shifting back and forth between Tsunade, Jiraiya, and the shinobi around her like she is expecting an attack. This garners a knowing look between the Sanin. Seeing this, Naruto creates a clone with Jinin level chakra, so it won't dispel any time in the next week, and the clone hops up onto a nearby building. If you would like, my clone can take you to my clan compound and give you a tour. It hasn't been used in a while, but I have most of it up and running. Just ask my clone for anything you might need. FK follows the clone, eager to get away from the attention and from so many potential haters' enemies, and they jump to the top of the roofs to avoid traffic. The three of them watch her go. Naruto, not looking at the two leaders, answers the questions they both have. Before you ask, she hates most people on principle. The only people she really trusts are Jinch Kriki or her brother, Shibuki. She is always on guard around people who haven't gained her trust, which is less than a dozen people she knows. Once, her apartment complex got set on fire, and after saving another tenant, she was blamed for the fire by everyone but her brother and close friends. Luckily her brother found the culprit, but those kinds of things happen all the time for her. Jiraiya and Tsunade become slightly depressed at hearing her life story and feel hatred towards those stupid masses. They would believe the sky is falling if not for someone telling them otherwise. Someone once told them that a massive person holds the sky up as punishment for going against the gods. And a lot of people believed that too. Breaking out of his train of thoughts, Jiraiya shifts an eye to Tsunade. How is Iwa behaving? Surprisingly well. I have heard of very little complaints against the shinobi and they seem to be behaving themselves. I thought they would come in and make a hissy fit over having to save Kanoha, she says the last part with extreme sarcasm. Although I am mostly surprised at the villagers. Most of them don't care that Naruto is the son of their hero, Iwa is caring even less. That gets a raised eyebrow from Naruto and Jiraiya, but Naruto chuckles a little. At least they are consistent. It would have been worse if they suddenly had been bowing at his feet begging for forgiveness. And something tells me they wouldn't have gotten it. Jiraiya and Tsunade nod while the fox nuzzles his neck. However, the conversation turns serious again when Tsunade asks a loaded question. Any word on Kumo? Naruto looks around before using the shunshin to the Hokage office, deciding that the area is too open and too great a risk of someone overhearing or reading their lips. Instantly a sound and physical barrier go up, making it impossible for outside people to hear or enter. Kikbi hops out of Naruto's hood and onto his lap. Ujido says the Kumo will also help but with Orochimaru and Sasuke are aiding nearby towns lately, they are unable to commit a large military force. 
they will send Yujido and Killer B, holding the Nibi and Hachibi respectfully, says a now human Kikbi. I think that is for the best. I don't think Kanoha could use another couple hundred shinobi. It would get too crowded here. When will they be here? Tsunade asks. That's the thing. They won't get here until tomorrow at best. Yujido didn't know the details, but it feels like the Rakage is either hiding something or is intentionally delaying their arrival, but to what purpose is beyond me. Tsunade makes a thinking pose, but Jiraiya shrugs. Oh well. We can't count on them as of right now. Kiri has declined to allow our envoys into the city, making it clear it doesn't want anything to do with us. Suna will arrive tonight with a few dozen Jinin, along with Gara and his siblings. So I think we will do alright. Regent Kriki with two more on the way, and the most powerful Bijk is a hell of a fighting force. Plus two San and then hundreds of Jinin and Anbu level Shinobi should be more than enough to make Akatsuki think twice. Hikbi and Tsunade seem pacified by that. Kikbi looks at Naruto, who, under the mask, has a scowl on his face. Narukoi, what's wrong? She asks. She knows him well enough to know what kind of face he is making by his body language alone. I've just been thinking. Why would Akatsuki just announce their intentions to invade? And why now of all times? It seems like a setup to me. Tsunade looks to Jiraiya for the answer to that particular question. It did seem suspicious that they just happened to stumble upon a plan to invade Konoha. They didn't. One of my contacts heard it from a drunken Jinin from AIM, and that got passed down the line. Naruto shakes his head. That's what I mean. AIM has been virtually sealed for what, 10 years now? Ever since the downfall of Hanzo, the whole country has been on lockdown, and your contact just so happens to hear that. I may not know a lot about spy networks, but it seems a little obvious. Gareya thinks about it for a second before shrugging again. It could be but a lot of information is like that. Most of it is pure luck of being at the right place at the right time and my contact is one of my best. I trust her work. They may also be desperate. With Kakuzu getting back to Akatsuki that he was defeated by Kikbi they know she is out and is going to stop them. They probably want to get her and you out of the way because she is going to be the largest roadblock for them. That pacified Naruto. He stands, making Kikbi pout cutely. Well, take the rest of the day off. I'm going to relieve the shinobi working right now and have the next shift start. Make sure you get rested for tomorrow. I have no doubt that tomorrow could be our last, Tsunade says softly. Wait. Before you go, take off your mask please, Jiraiya asks. Naruto, confused at what he wants, complies. He takes off his mask and is suddenly wrapped in a large hug from the man. It's good to have you back. I just wish your mom's chakra hadn't dissipated already. She would have loved to see you as you are now. Naruto looks down in shame. Me too. I regret not spending time with her now that she is gone, Naruto says, his voice full of remorse. Suddenly a look of sheer annoyance. Bachan is the same age as her henge is showing us. I haven't and since I came back from the training mission. But now if you will excuse us, we have some rest to get. Naruto whisks Kikbi away after picking her up in a bridal style. Jiraiya laughs at her eep at being picked up. There is something funny about a bitch keeping. Namika's compound, Naruto and Kikbi arrive and walk, with Kikbi still in his arms, to their clan house. Kikbi blushes a bit, embarrassed at being carried like this. Part of her is pushing to be dominant, to make him be the one being carried. But another side of her. Something that all women share. Loves being carried like this, by the one she loves, to feel his muscles under his shirt, to be able to lean on him. You know I can walk right? She asks just to see what his response is. Naruto shrugs, making her bounce a little which garners another eat from her. I know, but that doesn't change the fact that I want to. Ikbi smiles and rubs herself against his chest, very satisfied with his answer. Who are you? Naruto stops and looks to FK, who was wandering around the compound. She is looking rather intently at Kikbi, cuddled up against Aul-san. This is my fiancé, Kayu. Kayu Haim, this is FK. She is staying here under the orders of the Hokage for the invasion tomorrow. Kikbi moves to be let down and Naruto, getting the hint, sets her down, but not without goosing her first. Kikbi sends him a mock glare, and he chuckles at her. Kikbi walks up to FK, who shies away quite quickly, drawing a kunai at the same time. Ikbi stops and raises her hands, like a civilian would. Whoa, I just wanted to shake your hand. She says with a fearful tone. Betting her plan, Naruto walks up behind Kikbi and wraps an arm around her very sexy body and nestles into her neck. It's okay. I don't think FK here meant anything by it. See, she was treated really badly in her village because she is a jinch cricky, and those bastards can't tell the difference between a person and a demon. FK's eyes go wide when Owl San tells Caillou about her status, hurt that he would betray her so easily. He had earned a little trust from her, seeing as how he treated her with respect and not as a demon. She is about to jump away, tears in her eyes when Kikbi's voice stops her. Oh, just like Naruto from here. Yeah, I always helped him out whenever we crossed paths. 
If it weren't for you, I would probably be dating him. Naruto snuggles close to her, whispering something to her ear that FK can't hear. But what Kaiu said has her thinking. She doesn't have a problem with Yunch Kriki, in fact she would date one too. Maybe. Maybe this woman isn't. Maybe this woman is okay. Kai laughs at something Owl Sense says, and FK puts her kunai away, an action not missed by either Kikbi or Naruto. She slowly, very timidly walks forward, but stops the furthest away that she can get away with. She extends her hand, but she is tense, extremely so. She is ready to pounce like a cat that has been watching a mouse hole the entire day. Kikbi slowly takes the hand and shakes it. Suddenly Kikbi moves forward and hugs FK. FK tenses, her body making concrete envious, and her hand instantly finds her kunai on instinct. FK's arm brings down the kunai, and her eyes widen when she realizes her instincts are about to kill someone just wanting to give her a hug. With a monumental effort, she brings the kunai to a stop a hair's width away from piercing Kaiu's clothes. Under his mask, Naruto smiles. He is glad that FK finally trusts someone enough to make physical contact outside of her circle. Even he hasn't touched her yet outside of a handshake. Kaiu spins them around slowly to look at Naruto, still hugging FK and looking for permission for something. Naruto nods and Kikbi squeals. Naruto makes a clone and dispels it immediately. The clone that showed FK around now knows what his creator wants. The clone makes his way to the female baths and creates more clones to start it and make it ready. Kikbi literally drags FK away down the compound. But what FK doesn't know is that the Kikbi leading her away is a clone, having Kawarimi it with it before FK saw them. Even Naruto didn't notice until a wink when FK and Kikbi were hugging. Once FK is out of sight, the fox clone comes out and transforms into her human form and instantly captures Naruto in a heated kiss. That is, after ripping the mask off his face. They stand there, making out. Kikbi wraps her arms around Naruto's neck and his hands find the back of her head. Not. That. I'm complaining. But, then don't, Kikbi interrupts him. They continue to mack for the next few minutes, not really paying attention to their surroundings. Do him. Naruto and Kikbi break apart, only if a little, and look to the intruder in their time. Hiromi chan Hiromi finds herself wrapped in a giant hug from Naruto. She laughs and hugs him back as he whirls her around. I missed you, she whispers when her feet once more find the ground. Their faces are just millimeters apart, and each can feel the other's hot breath on their skin. I missed you too. How did you get here? He asks. How do you think the summons gave contracts to begin with? We always have the ability to summon ourselves, but it costs a lot of chakra, so we mostly let our summoners do it for us. Naruto nods his head and continues to hug her when suddenly a light goes off in his head. Hold on. Let me change quickly. Both look confused as Naruto literally disappears. Less than 10 seconds later, he reappears in front of both of them, wearing casual clothes, i.e. a short sleeveless t-shirt, gloves, and boots that is his hidden armor. He forgoes his half-mask now that people know he is back, there is little reason to hide himself. He grabs a slightly stunned Hiromi and Kikbi and drags them off into the village. Before long, Naruto slows down allowing both women to grab an arm as they walk down the street. This gets Naruto some very nasty looks. All Naruto does is smirk and give each of them the bird, making each of his girls jiggle each time a person gets an offended look. This has Hiromi and Kikbi smirking at themselves, glad that Naruto is being possessive of them. Eventually they reach a park, making the girls even more confused. Naruto leads them to a bench and has them sit down. Stay here. I shouldn't be long. Kikbi opens her mouth to ask why when Naruto puts a finger to her lips, silencing her before she starts. Don't worry, it will be worth it. I wouldn't ask you if it weren't for a reason. Okay. Plus you can catch up with Hiromi-chan here. Kikbi crosses her arms, not liking Naruto going off like this, but accepts it. Naruto smiles and briefly touches her face along with Hiromi's before quickly walking off. The two non-humans sit in silence for a few minutes, not really sure what to talk about or how to break the surprisingly awkward silence. That is solved when a tall, burly man comes into view and walks straight towards them. The thing that caught their eyes is the Iwa hit I ate around his left eye. Two men behind him flank him on both sides. They too wear an Iwa brand. Both raise their eyebrows, or mentally do, as the man walks. Swaggers up to them. He stops and flexes his considerable muscles as he puts his hands over his head, making sure to flex his biceps. Hello ladies. How about I show you a good time? He says in a deep voice. Kikbi and Hiromi look at the guy in shock that he would have the audacity to ask them. Suddenly they burst into laughter at the same time, the same thought running through both their heads. The bulky man stands there, confused. What? Don't think you can handle a real man? Kikbi laughs harder and nearly falls into Hiromi, who somehow retains control of herself. Sorry, but we are taken by someone who is more manly than you will ever be. The man growls. And who would this man be? I bet I could take him. Kikbi instantly sobers up. Look, you already have been told we are taken. 
go before he comes back. The man smirks. Bring him on. Suddenly Kikbi and Hiromi are in front of him, both bending back the wrists on both hands, making each of them break with a sickening, it sounds like heaven to Kikbi, snap. The man howls in rage, but neither woman lets up on their iron grip. If you can't handle two insignificant women, how are you supposed to deal with the strongest shinobi in the village, possibly the world? Now scram and crawl back to your caves before I really get angry, Kikbi threatens, her eyes glowing a little bit. The big man is visibly shaken by the encounter and scuttles away, nearly tripping over his friends. Both women sit down and smooth out their clothing, while Kikbi shoots off a one-liner. I guess he made a prom dress and took off. Hiromi sweat drops at Kikbi's terrible comment. All things aside, I see you and Naruto have gotten close. Kikbi picks up on her slightly depressed tone and doesn't miss that out of all the topics in the world, she chose Naruto. She scoots over and wraps an arm around her, noticing her downcast gaze. Don't feel sad Ryu-chan. You saw his reaction to seeing you. Why don't you and him go out for dinner tonight? Hiromi brightens considerably but sends a questioning glance at the nickname. But a thought enters her mind and she gets nervous. She looks away, blushes, and pokes her fingers together. So. Have. Um. You too. You know. Kikbi looks at Hiromi with a confused look when Naruto walks up. He looks at the slightly tense atmosphere between them and sighs. What's the matter? Hiromi looks away shyly, but Naruto takes it differently. What happened? He says more firmly. But neither answers, Kikbi because she doesn't know why and Hiromi because she is too embarrassed. Look, I'm going to get it out of either of you so you might as well come out with it. I ask if you had sex yet all right. Hiromi snaps and instantly covers her mouth. She spins around making her legs go over the side of the bench, her face going redder than a red bell pepper. Her hands are hiding her face in embarrassment of her outburst. Naruto and Kikbi share a look. Kikbi scoots over and Naruto slides in next to, i.e. behind her as her back is to Kikbi and Naruto, Hiromi. Naruto then puts his arms around her and gently pulls her into his chest. He strokes her hair and whispers to her. She leans into it but still tries to hide her embarrassment and shame. We wouldn't. I wouldn't do that to you. We come in a package of three, not two. If you were feeling left out, then you should have told me or Kikbi. He hears a small sob and tightens his grip around her. He rocks her back and forth gently, waiting for the tears to subside. You. You don't know how much I missed you. After spending every day for the past three months with you and then suddenly you weren't there. I I there was this empty feeling inside me. So I I got jealous of Kikbi spending so much time with you. Hiromi tries to pull away, but Naruto holds her tight. Naruto takes her hand and Hiromi feels something on her finger. She looks down and gasps. On her ring finger is a ring, made from interlacing gold and platinum. But the setting is of a good-sized bright yellow topaz. It's an engagement ring. Naru. It's. Hiromi can't even talk, so overwhelmed by emotions. I'll accept you with all of your faults, your jealousy, your rage. All of you. Just as you accepted mine. At his words, she only increases the tears, but this time she latches onto him. After a few minutes Hiromi calms down and kisses him tenderly. I'm. I'm sorry for getting jealous. I. I'm so ashamed of it. It's okay. It shows you care enough about something to be worried to lose it. However, you shouldn't be asking me for forgiveness. Hiromi slowly stands from her position and kneels in front of Kikbi. Han. Can you forgive me getting jealous? Kikbi pretends to think about it for a second. Of course Ryu-chan. After tomorrow, you can go on your date and then get married. Hiromi backtracks a little. Wait. But you said tonight. Kikbi gives Naruto a glance. I did but Narukoi looks extremely tired and if we are going to be fighting a war tomorrow, we need to be getting to sleep early. Hiromi nods slowly, understanding at least, but she is still very disappointed at not being able to go out with Naruto tonight. Kikbi understands her plight and again wraps Hiromi in a hug. All the while, Naruto sits with a smile. He wants them to be good friends because he doesn't want them fighting over him. They part but not before Naruto has a nosebleed from imagining himself between them. Luscious marshmallows. Oh how he wishes he could be the chocolate in that s'more. He. Not too long before that becomes a reality. Kikbi looks over to Naruto as he quickly wipes the blood away and hops into his lap, making him groan. So. I assume you have something for me then? She asks in a giddy voice. Naruto rolls his eyes. Not that anyone can tell, but that isn't the point. He nods and whispers, spoil sport. He takes her hand and slips on another ring. When Kikbi looks down, she is stunned by it. It is the same style as Hiromi's, being made from intertwining gold and platinum, but her setting is of a ruby. Narukoi, I love it. Now Naruto and Kikbi share a kiss, a tender one as well. We should go now. We have a big day tomorrow. Kikbi nods, but Hiromi looks confused. What is happening tomorrow? I'll tell you on the way to the compound. Just know that there is another Jinch Kriki staying in the compound right now. 
Her name is FK and she doesn't like normal people all that much and she doesn't know who I am. Hiromi nods, understanding not to use his real name or to reveal the fact that she isn't human, and latches onto his torso along with Kikbi as the three of them walk back to the compound and listen to what she missed. Time skip 8 a.m. next day, Naruto wakes with a light knocking at his front door. Neither Kikbi nor Hiromi even twitched because of the sound. He creates a clone to investigate, intent on staying in bed as long as possible. After a minute or so, the clone creates another clone, and that clone dispels, informing Naruto that the Hokage wishes to see him in his living room. Naruto is bolt upright in an instant, waking his not too happy fiancés and forcing them up with him. What's going on? Hiromi asks sleepily. Both she and Kikbi are sitting up, 100% naked in bed. Achan is here with a guest. Come on girls, get dressed. Both girls grumble but comply, and they both move to the shower. Naruto really wishes he could join them, but that wouldn't be a good idea. They would probably be in there the entire morning if not longer if he listens to his desires. He quickly dresses for combat, complete with his mesh under armor and boom mask, along with several backups, and lastly his armor, not bothering to change his armor into civilian clothing. He walks out with his sword strapped to his waist, a kunai holster and a pack right above his butt. He walks into the living room and sees Tsunade with an older man with long black hair and matching eyes. Shijimi Damum. The man waves at him. Hello Namakis-san. I'm just stopping by to say hello and to meet you. Your father and I were good friends. Oh, was the reply from Naruto. An awkward silence descends on the living room and the three of them just blink at each other. You him. Well, the daemon has another reason for being here. He has his samurai here along with his guardians to aid us. Naruto looks at daemon, who is smirking. You will find my guardians to be quite helpful Namakusan. I assure you they are no pushovers. Naruto suppresses a sigh. I'm sure they are. Bachan, are there any new developments besides Mr. Confidence? Tsunade and Shijimi jaws drop at the name. Nobody dared to disrespect the two most powerful people in Hai no Kuni. However their stupor is broken when laughter hits their ears. Hiromi and Kikbi come out of the bedroom, both dressed in civilian clothing, their hair still wet. It apparently had been a very quick shower without him. They immediately wrap their arms around Naruto, making Shijimi raise a few eyebrows. He didn't miss the engagement ring on their hands. That was funny. Do you always give nicknames to people in power? Kick the ASOS. As Naruto and his fiancés talk quietly, Shijimi turns to Tsunade. How is it that he has more than one fiancé? The law states that a man may only marry one. However, before Tsunade can answer, Naruto quickly talks over her. Ah, Mr. Confidence, that is because I activated the crawl last week. I can have no more than four and no less than three. This is Hiromi and this is Kai. He wraps his arms around their waists and pulls them to him as he says their names, making them giggle and pressing their more than impressive busts into him. Shijimi gets a nosebleed as he looks upon the two goddesses, and that earns him a glare from the girls in Naruto. Well, I believe I have overstayed my welcome. If you could call one of those Anbuthinjis, I will take shelter in my bunker. Tsunade sweat drops at Daemon's term and snaps her finger. Nico appears in front of the Daemon and escorts him out of the Namika's estate though not before giving Naruto a polite bow as a clan head and a fellow Anbu. As soon as he is out the door, Naruto finds himself on the ground, courtesy of a punch to the face. Naruto looks up and finds a fuming Tsunade over him, his girls looking the other way, whistling inconspicuously. And before you ask, you damn well know what that was for. I may tolerate your nickname, but he is the fucking daemon. He could cut funds to the village and even remove me from office, you dimwit. Next time you see him, I expect you to be respectful, damn it. We have enough problems without you adding more. Naruto makes his way off the floor and dusts himself off. Yeah yeah Bachan. Seeing how you are ready, I will go over our plans and how we are going to protect the village. Time skip 5 pm. To say the atmosphere in the village is tense is like saying the desert is hot. People are on edge, almost tearing at each other's throats. Naruto sits in the shade at the western gate, waiting for any sign of attack. He is here because this gate is likely to be the one that gets attacked first. Kikbi is sitting next to him napping, her head on his shoulder. How she can sleep at a time like this he will never know. That brings up Hiromi. She is back in the summons realm waiting to be summoned along with a dozen other dragons. She wasn't happy about leaving again so soon, but it is necessary and left with a minimum of complaining. However, she didn't leave without a 10-minute snog snuggle fest with her man. People may not know it, but dragons are one of the most versatile summons, as they have more than a half dozen different types of dragons. There are your basic fire, water, lightning, and wind dragons. Then you have the special dragons. Heat, fire plus wind, ice, water plus wind, and steam, water plus fire. And then there is Hiromi, the strongest of the dragons because she has storm, wind plus water plus lighting. Having all three she can use just one element or a combination of all three. 
a storm dragon is born only once every few centuries and is destined to become the next boss summons. They are always physically stronger and the largest of the dragons, and they are always female, or they all have been so far. FK is with Jurea at the south gate, while most of the Anbu and the Guardians are at the east gate, prepared for anything that might attack them from behind. Iwa is in the center of the village, waiting to be deployed wherever they are needed. Tsuna is at the north gate as Gara, along with Tamari and Kankuro, will be more than enough to dissuade enemies with his control of sand and his Jinchkriki status. The samurai are stationed inside buildings just inside the gates, in case the gates are compromised and the area is so small, the shinobi can't use ninjutsu to its potential. The twelve guardians are all stationed around the Hokage Tower, a last line of defense if you will. However, Naruto doesn't even know where the daemon is right now. Tsunade sunshine next to Naruto, raising an eyebrow at Kikbi's sleeping state, but a scowl mares her. Youthful features. I don't think they are going to show today. Assaulting a fortified target at night is just stupid and suicidal. Half the shinobi will move back into the city, and then a third of them will go after that. Go home Naruto and get some rest. Naruto wakes Kikbi and helps her up. You would think. Lady Tsunade, our posts at the edges of all neighboring countries except tea and waves, have been destroyed completely. Chiknin Squad 84, 65, and 82 all have the same story. The outposts were all attacked several days ago and nothing is left. No reports or evidence of how they got in, how many there were, or how our shinobi died as all the corpses were burnt as were most of the buildings. Tsunade thinks for a second. Very well. You are dismissed. Chiknin gives a low bow before he shunshins away. So there definitely is an enemy presence in Hai no Kuni, but we don't know if it is just Akatsuki or an army. They were very thorough and covered their tracks well, which leads me to believe that they have an army. Why else take out an outpost when you can sneak in with just a few members? Tsunade talks to herself more than Naruto. The confuse. Oops. Like I said, they want to confuse us. It wouldn't surprise me if they had both. It also has the added benefit that we are now blind and an attack can come from anywhere at any time, adding to the confusion, Kikbi speaks up, temporarily forgetting they were not alone and not limiting her normal voice at first. Tsunade nods as Kikbi's logic is sound. Well, I will think about it and it doesn't really change anything. You two go home and make sure Hiromi is informed. She is probably trying to rip her hair out right about now in tension. Naruto nods before wrapping an arm around Kikbi's waist and sunshine to the Namika's estate. Time skipped two days. The people in Shinobi are starting to lose faith. It has been three days since Akatsuki was supposed to invade, but not a single sight of an enemy is wearing down the nerves of everyone, even Jiraiya. It got so bad that Tsunade had to personally break up a fight between several Jinin at a local bar that almost erupted into a full-blown riot throughout the city. Battle has to come and soon before the leaf destroys itself. Unknown location. Then people in black cloaks slowly move under the ground, using the Doton. Dotch Xankm, Earth Release. Underground submarine voyage. The figures close to the wall and stop directly under it. One of the ten moves to the side and appears just above ground. He looks up to an Anbu who gives him the thumbs up before turning around and ignoring the man. Said man disappears back under the ground and clicks his mic. Operation is a go. The ten figures spread out along a half mile long section of the wall and all begin to spin. As they gain speed, they start to bore into the extremely thick wall. They find it much more difficult than it should have been, but they are making progress. The Anbu squad on guard feels the ten spikes but ignores it. As per orders. Within minutes, ten foot high tubes inside the walls are hollowed out and they begin their real plan. Time skip 7 am, Buam. The entire village is woken from their sleep by an enormous explosion along the southwest wall. Alarms and sirens blare, forcing many from their sleep and hastily dress. Most, but not all. One Namek is Naruto and Kikbi no Yoko race from the western gate to the breach in the walls, just as swarms of ninja pour through the gap into the residential area of Kanoha. Screams of panic and terror reach the ears of many shinobi who had the early watch race to the scene of battle. Kuchius no Jutsu. A large puff of smoke and twenty toads appear and start to battle the ninja. Naruto looks at Jiraiya who is panting slightly. What? Summoning that many toads at once takes about two and a half times the amount it takes for Gamma Bunta. Save it. We have a fight to deal with, Naruto shouts at the man as more ninja pour into the gap in the wall. Naruto rushes into the battle to aid the toads, drawing his katana, while Kikbi lengthens her nails. The two become a whirlwind of death, sparing no one. In five minutes the breach in the walls is contained and fifty shinobi lay dead on the ground. Naruto picks up one of the headbands and tosses it to Jiraiya, who has a stunned look on his face. Kiri? Why would Kiri attack us? Naruto shrugs and tosses Jiraiya two more bands, one for Kusa and the other for Aim. I don't know what is going on but. The siren goes off at the western gate. Apparently, enemies have been sighted there. Though, I'll investigate and inform Sunity, Jiraiya orders. 
Naruto nods and runs off with Kikbi on his heels. Naruto arrives at the eastern gate to Konoha Shinobi firing after into the waves of enemy Shinobi. But the Iwa Shinobi were just standing there. Odd. Just then a signal flare shoots through the trees surrounding Konoha and into the air. Then all hell breaks loose. The Iwa Shinobi turn on them. What was once an unconquerable fortress is now in chaos. And there are a thousand Iwa Shinobi inside the gates of Konoha. Bastards. They teamed up with Akatsuki just for revenge. Idiots may have just killed us all. Naruto gives Kikbi a nod, and she gleefully jumps into the waves of oncoming shinobi just outside the gates, hell-bent on keeping them away from the gates. Naruto nicks his thumb and summons Hiromi in full dragon form. Sorry Hiromi, it seems Iwa pulled a fast one on us. I need you to go back to your summoning realm and tell your warriors about taking out any Iwa they see. I'll summon you in 30 seconds. Hi, Narukun, she says softly after a quick ear rub by Naruto. Hiromi dispels and Naruto counts to 20 and summons her again. Funny thing is, he stayed in the air, much to the confusion of the shinobi around him. He appears on top of Hiromi, but she isn't alone. Fifteen other dragons appear and take off into the sky to defend the village of Konoha. Naruto then summons four messenger dragons. Tell the other gates that Iowa has betrayed us and to kill any Iowa on sight. You, he points to one. Go to the Hokage and inform her that the eastern gate has been engaged by enemy shinobi and Kaiyu, and I are holding it. Also inform her about Iowa if she already isn't aware of it. Go. The four dragons take off. Naruto turns back to Hiromi. Go and have some fun. Hi, Naruto-kun. Naruto hops off her head and joins Kikbi down in front of the gate. Kikbi is completely drenched in blood. Not a single part of her is dry. All around her, bodies lay eviscerated and in pieces. Having fun, Bini Kasaki, Crimson Queen. Kikbi turns to see her lover standing on a particularly large pile of body parts. Oh you have no idea how turned on I am right now. If I could, I would take you right now. Naruto chuckles and despite the blood, wraps his arms around her waist and pulls her close. There is always time for that later, lover. Suddenly the two break apart as a large blade made of lava comes down right between the two. Naruto and Kikbi look to see two men standing a few hundred feet away. One is a large man in red samurai armor, and another looks to be an old man with red hair and matching beard and mustache. Look what we have here, Han. Two people want to play the hero, the older man says. The taller man just nods but doesn't talk, but steam starts to build on the back of the pack he is wearing. The older man has red hair and a matching full beard and mustache, making him look like a tomato. Kikbi then feels something stir within the two opponents. Naruto, they are Jinch Kriki. I thought you said I was Jinch Kriki had gotten captured already. Naruto narrows his eyes. I did. Apparently they fooled us so they wouldn't suspect an attack from the inside. Kikbi looks enraged. You assholes realize that Akatsuki will just come like vultures circling us, waiting until we are at our weakest to strike. We should be fighting Akatsuki, not each other, she roars at them. The man with red hair, just like Kikbi's but darker, just shrugs. It doesn't matter whether we die at your hands or Akatsuki's. We die when we die. Until then, we are tools to be used by our villages. So shut your mouth and fight. The man known as Rashi rushes forward while the samurai launches into the air via the steam pack. North Gate, R and the Sand Ninja quickly deal with the traitorous Iwa Ninja and turn their attention to the incoming ninja. Gara's gourd turns to sand, unleashing his main weapon. He directs the sand along the ground, and when the enemy steps in it, it wraps around their feet and ankles and crushes them, making them easy targets for the defenders. However, the enemy does have a few tricks up its sleeve. Mizarapa. What a release. Violent water wave. Dozens of streams shoot out from the tree line and soak Gara's sand, making it relatively useless. The shinobi then burst out, again, of the tree line, and make a beeline for the gates. Damari. Said Jinin unfurls her war fan and channels her chakra. Ai Kamatachi no Jutsu. Great sickle weasel technique. Damari then swings her massive fan at the incoming shinobi and cuts them to ribbons as the strong winds descend upon the awaiting shinobi. She and a few other Jinin fire wind after wind into the army of shinobi approaching the gates. Suddenly a massive stream of fire comes from above them and into the wind, making it far more deadly than before. They all look up to see a pale blue dragon pouring large amounts of fire into the wind. When the dragon stops its attack, it lands behind the gate and stands taller than the gate. Greetings. My name is Hitomi and I am a summons of the Anbu Owl. I am here to provide assistance. Ara and the other shinobi all make it a point to say thanks to his owl Anbu later. When they look back to the forest, they find it quite charred. The wind-enhanced fire apparently had spread a few hundred feet into the forest on top of the 200 feet of clearing between the forest and the walls. However, the gate they are standing on just so happens to explode, shooting massive amounts of rock and shinobi in all directions. 
Hitomi catches as many as she can, but quite a few still fall to their deaths after being shot a few dozen feet into the air, then falling the combined height of the wall and explosion. Hitomi looks around and sees similar explosions go off in three other directions of the village. The village is now breached. Westgate, Empton. Yogan no Kanketsusen. Lava release. Geyser of lava. Rashi slams his hands into the ground and a large column of lava bursts from the ground directly beneath Kikbi. However, he is hit from behind as Kikbi presses her advantage of getting behind him. Just then a massive explosion goes off and destroys the east gate, killing everyone on top of it and right beside it. Kikbi and Rashi have to dodge the door as it flies through the air and smashes into the forest, leveling a good dozen trees in the process. Naruto and Kikbi watch in horror as waves of enemy shinobi, all with Iwa headbands, rush into the village. His distraction costs him as the armored samurai hits him square in the face with a jaw-breaking, steam-enhanced kick. Naruto's mask shatters upon impact and his hood is thrown back, but his mask takes most of the damage, allowing Naruto to recover and dodge the next strike. For the first time in years, Naruto's face is exposed in public. The samurai stops, stunned at what he sees. Looks like my secret is out. I don't have time to play with you. Banshim Tenen. The samurai is suddenly pulled towards Naruto and curls himself into a ball to prevent as much damage to himself as possible. However, he stops just before he reaches Naruto, making him curious. He unfurls himself a little bit and his eyes widen. Naruto's hands are covered in water. Not like the water-cutting sword. No, his entire hand is literally covered in a glob of water that is staying on his hand instead of falling to the ground. Suiten. Mizu no Tsuin Nakami. Water release. Twin blades of water. With hands suspended in the air, he has no chance of getting away. The bulges of water suddenly elongate and piece his armor, chest, and bones. He then plunges the swords into the joint of his arm and torso and wrenches the swords, making a popping noise as both shoulders become dislocated. Then Naruto makes the water sword spew water into the wound, filling the gap between the ball and socket. Then Han finds the water frozen inside the joint, making it very painful and impossible to fix his dislocated arms without professional treatment. He then does the same with Han's legs, making the jinch cricky convulse in pain. Naruto begins to wonder if the man's vocal cords have been removed as he doesn't even let out a whimper. However, there is still one other thing Naruto has to deal with before Han is completely out of the game. Naruto's fingers glow purple before he slams his hand into the samurai's stomach. Ajimfkin. Five element seal. Han's eyes bulge as he is cut off from his bijk and combined with having his tendons, but he is out of the game. Meanwhile, Rashi looks over at Han getting beaten badly by the now revealed blonde, and he prepares to help out his old friend when Kikbi intercepts him. Your fight is with me. She kicks Rashi in the chest, making him fly back into a tree. Before he can even move, Kikbi is on him. However, decades of training and experience prove to be his savior, as his instincts and reflexes move him out of the way, as Kikbi comes down with a lava sword. Rashi's eyes widen as he sees the sword, an exact replica of his own. How can you perform lava release? He asks. Kikbi smirks. Why don't you ask your bitch can find out? She rushes him, her lava sword cutting through anything and everything. Rashi is hard pressed to dodge all her strikes, but things get dicker when Kikbi adds a lava sword on her other hand. Strikes that were once nowhere near hitting him now only miss by centimeters. I think it is time I level the playing field. Kazangan notes Arugi. Lava release. Sword of lava. Two blades made of lava, one for each hand, make contact with Kikbi's own. They battle for superiority when suddenly Rashi's eyes roll to the back of his head and he falls forward, his sword's now a smoldering puddle on the ground as the chakra keeping its his shape is no longer there. Kikbi glares at Naruto. Why did you interfere? I was having fun. Naruto in an instant is in front of her. I know but we don't have time for that. Iwa ninja are already pouring into the village. We have to stop them before the village is overtaken. I'll take these two to a safe location and you can have more fun with these Iwa ninja. Kikbi pouts but knows he is right. Fine, but these weaklings are not as much fun as him. Naruto briefly kisses Kikbi before looking into her eyes. But we can have more fun later tonight, na? Before Kikbi can answer Naruto shunshin away to the Hokage Tower with Rashi and Han in tow. Kikbi licks her lips, tasting Naruto's residual. It tastes good. You had better not be pulling my tails or I will hunt you down and make you fulfill your promise. Sigh I guess I better get started. The sooner I get done, the sooner Narukun and I can start. Hokage Tower, Naruto sunshine in with Tsunade surrounded by her military advisors. Shikamaru, Shikaku, Hamura, and a few other rising stars. They all look to see someone shunshin into the tower with two charges. Naruto. What are you doing here? Naruto looks to see more than half the room staring at him. Suddenly it clicks and feels his face. Luckily, his long bangs cover most of his eyes, shielding them from view. Mostly. Oh shit. 
he turns around and unseals one of his backup masks and puts it on and adjusts his hood before turning around to face everyone. Their eyes get bigger. Unfortunately there isn't time to answer questions. Al, report. Hi. Caillou is still at the western gate, stemming the stream of Iwa Ninja into the village. The gate is gone, blown up from underneath. I have with me, I was Yunch Kriki, who was reportedly taken by Akatsuki and died, but that is now false, and it seems we have been deceived. I have summoned a dozen or so dragons to aid us. Tsunade nods. Have you heard from Kumo? He asks. Tsunade shakes her head. I'm beginning to think they aren't coming. But right now, we have bigger problems than Kumo. We have retrieved headbands from half a dozen hidden villages, and it keeps climbing. So far, there have been Kiri, Iwa, Kusa, Aim, Kumo, Odo, and Tani, from Kumagakur no Sado, which is a village hidden in valleys in River Country. We also have fighting inside the village from Iwa ninjas that were supposed to aid us. Luckily the Jinin and Chknin engaged them minutes after they betrayed us, limiting the damage. Right now, I have all the reserve Anbu fighting the Iwa Shinobi inside the village, the west gate is being held by Kaiyu and the boss dragon summons. The north gate is being assaulted by Odo Shinobi, but Gara and the others are dealing with them. The south gate is being assaulted by the smaller ninja villages, while the west gate is silent. I'll be sending the Anbu at the west gate to deal with the Iwa ninja and the village, and after they are dealt with, they can assist the other gates. However, the two Jinch Kriki are to be locked in the prison, with no less than 10 Anbu or Jinin. I'm not sure what the hell has gotten into Iwa, but this is a giant flashing light to Akatsuki that now would be a good time to attack. Four of their targets in one place and possibly another two. Too big of an opportunity to waste. Naruto and the others nod, but an odd thought reaches into Naruto's head. Hokage-sama. Why would the smaller villages help? I can see Iwa and Odo, but what would Kiri, Kusa, Aim, and Tani have to gain with this? I can answer one of those, comes a voice behind them all. Dureya stands there, hassled and ragged but none worse for wear. The Megakur no Sado is the home and headquarters of Akatsuki. With the strongest openly declaring war on Akatsuki, they might be willing to forge an alliance to get the largest roadblock out of their path before it becomes a problem. But what of the others? What do the smaller nations and even Kiri have to gain from this? Naruto asks. Tsunade and Jiraiya strike a thinking pose. Well Kiri could want revenge, assuming they found your excursion was a hoax, but with them being in a civil war right now, but that would be a grave error, just to rectify some ill-gotten sense of justice. So that leaves Kusa and Tani. But one other thing has me thinking. If Akatsuki's base is in AIM and AIM Shinobi are here then why aren't the members of Akatsuki here as well? Nobody could answer that. Forgive me for intruding, but I have a possible solution to this conundrum, Shikaku interjects. When he receives the go-ahead from Tsunade he continues. With Odo being involved, we cannot leave out the possibility that Orochimaru is involved. He could have coerced the other nations into this alliance to take down Konoha. That is possible. Our axe teammate is surely capable of something like that. However, well that is a sound conclusion, I don't think that is correct. There is something off about the shinobi. They aren't using techniques that are native to each village. Kusa uses water and lightning, Kiri uses wind, Tani uses earth as well. While they could have shinobi with those abilities, I have not seen a single Kusa use a grass technique. And the grass is plenty around here. Then we must choose the option that fits the most, in that they are masquerading as ninjas from different villages to confuse us. Several of the Jinin burst into outraged screams until Tsunade shouts for order. When the impossible is eliminated, the rest must be true, no matter how improbable it sounds, Shikaku says with wisdom. The room goes silent and looks at him weirdly. What? Can't a guy watch Star Trek without getting labeled a geek? He asks emphatically. Moving on. So this whole thing may have been cooked up by Iwa and Odo. Brilliant plan but not good enough. We must. Just then a Chknin bursts into the room. Tsunade Sama. Arachimaru along with Ichiha Sasuke and several snake summons have been spotted at the north gate. Kazuki Ajisama requests immediate assistance. I'll go, Jiraiya says and starts to move. Jiraiya, wait. I'll go. I need you and the other Jinin to secure the other gates. Create earth walls if you have to but seal the village. We cannot let more of them enter. Owl, report back to the east gate after you secure your prisoners in the prison. Be alert as Akatsuki may learn of our weakness and attack. Naruto salutes crisply before disappearing in a shunshin with the two knocked out Jinch Kriki. I hope you know what you are doing Tsunade. We can't afford to replace the Hokage right now, Jiraiya says softly before he too disappears. So do I, she mutters to herself before donning her combat gear. South gate, FK decapitates yet another Tani Shinobi with her water cutting swords. The pile of body parts is ever growing, but even with her high stamina, this is getting absurd. Her arms are starting to grow heavy, and her chakra is running out. She accesses her bijks and uses it to re-energize her own reserves, but that is the last time she can. Her system is too flooded and it is beginning to show. 
burns on her skin and organs are taking their toll, and she begins to slow down. Add to that, Jiraiya had left, making all the attention on her. The few Anbu that she had are dead and she is the only thing standing in the way of Kusa, Tani, and AIM soldiers from entering the village. She narrowly dodges an earth that would have impaled her in a spike. That's it. I've had enough of you fuckers. Suetan. Bakusui Shma. Water release. Exploding water colliding wave. The colossal amount of water explodes from her mouth and sweeps across the battlefield in a 20-foot high wave, enveloping a large number of opposing ninja. Those with enough time, i.e. the ones in the back, string together hand seals. Odin. Dorakeki. Earth release. Earth style wall. The large wall of earth moves in the shape of an arrow and taller, if barely, than the massive approaching wave. The shinobi not maintaining the wall use their chakra to reinforce the wall, knowing that if it breaks through then they are gone. The wave approaches and hits with a solid impact, spilling water over the top of the wall and washing away some of the shinobi behind it, but the wall holds, forcing the water around the large group of multinational shinobi. But FK isn't done. She has had time to finish another series of hand seals for a design to pulverize instead of drown. Zurichten no jutsu. Water release. Water dragon bullet technique. From the residual water forms not one but five water dragons. Each of the dragons head for the earth barrier of the unsuspecting shinobi. They think she is out of chakra due to the sheer amount it takes to produce that much water, so they begin to lower the barrier, which sinks into mud, drenched from the previous attack. One sees the dragons heading towards them and his eyes bulge. Raise the wall. But before anyone has time, the dragons are upon them. The first dragon demolishes whatever remains of the wall was left, splattering the ninja with tons of mud and water, making it impossible to get away from the next barrage. Dragons 2 through 5 then proceed to massacre the rest of the ninja, their defenses down and vulnerable. FK collapses to her knees. That had taken the very last of her chakra, and now she is out of the game. Any more and her system will overload and she might die. She senses something and has to dodge a water whip, which leaves a five-foot deep gash in the ground. She feels. She feels coming from the direction the attack came from. From out of the brush comes a short purple-eyed man with a hook staff on his back. His face sports a scar from his left eye down his cheek and silver hair. Impressive that one would have such control over water and her bijk. I am Yagura, Yande Mizukage of Kiri and keeper of the Sanbi no Kaidai game, three-tailed giant turtle. I am here to eradicate the stain of a village. I am sorry, but I can't allow you to keep fighting. However, I am not without mercy. Join me and strengthen Kiri, and there will be a spot for you. Bigura pulls the hook staff of his back and prepares to charge should her answer be unsatisfactory. FK grits her teeth. Of all things, now she has to face a cage when she is out of chakra and can't use what she has. This will not end well. I'd rather die than join you and your buddies. Don't you see that if Konoha is gone, then nothing will stand in the way of Akatsuki from getting our bijk. It is in our best interest to stand united against the common threat. Igura shakes his head. Then my apologies. I do not wish to do this to a fellow Jinch Kriki, but I have no wish to align myself to this village. He spits the last part out like it is a revulsion just to say the word. He raises his hands, and a heavy mist rolls behind him, and out of said mist, hundreds of Kiri Shinobi appear, making her eyes grow wide. FK curses under her breath and pulls out an Injado, and hopes someone comes to help her or she is going to die. She always has a metal sword with her, but prefers to use her water-cutting sword as it is sharper and can be manipulated in length, width, sharpness, and shape. FK charges the cage, who bats the attack aside easily as his shinobi charge the south gate. FK is put on the defensive by the masterful use of the hook staff. She almost loses her head multiple times in several seconds due to those sharp hooks. Damn it. Where the hell is some backup? Pathetic. I would have thought a jinch cricky of the Nanabi no Kabutamushi would provide a bigger challenge, he taunts. Yeah well try challenging me when I'm not out of chakra or tired from fighting hundreds of other shinobi. FK goes on the offensive, tired of nearly getting pushed around. Her ninjato flashes in gray blurs, but Yugara is having no trouble keeping up. Then the smaller of his hooks pierces her hand through the back, making her drop the ninjato. She cries out in pain and falls to her knees, completely spent and out of energy. That offensive maneuver was her last ditch attempt to come away with a win, but she is too tired. HMPH. Maybe the nine tails inch cricky will provide me a better challenge, he says while smirking. He raises his hookstaff over his head and brings it down in a vertical swing, aiming right for her head. FK waits for it to end, she knows she doesn't stand a chance. All she can do is await her death with open arms. I guess the villagers get their wish after all. I I wish I could have met him. Just once. Meet Yuzumaki Naruto and see what makes him different. Igura has a look of pure exhilaration on his face as the hook descends towards FK's awaiting neck and head. His eyes dance in anticipation of seeing her blood spilled all over the ground and on his weapon. 
but that is put to a stop when a hand catches his staff, making it stop just inches away from FK. Why you? Westgate, Bigby boredly takes another life. It has lost its fun, and now it is just repetitive and monotonous. Even she has lost count of how many she has killed. Naruto then lands beside her, and her mood instantly takes a 180. Hi Naru-kun. She says happily and she slays her enemies with enthusiasm again. Hey, Kaiu Haim. It seems like this is just what Iwa and Odo's doing. Maybe Kiri but the others are fakes to make us believe there are multiple smaller villages attacking us. Oh are they? A voice comes, making both Kikbi and Naruto look to the source. An old man with a large red nose, completely bald, and the shortest ninja Naruto has ever seen. Lenoki, the sand named Tsuchikij. A pleasure to meet you, but I'm not sure who you are, Naruto addresses the two in front of him. I am Shin, Sandame Daishizinkij. The man is tall. Super tall and skinny as a rail. Nature shadow huh? You must be Kusa's cage, Naruto appraises the man in front. Indeed you are the correct boy. However, we are not here for niceties. Yes, child. We are here so Kanoha can finally pay for their transgressions against us in the third shinobi war. So. Prepare to have your lives taken, the old man says while he forms a ball of glowing chakra in his hands. Let's start this off with a bang shall we? Jinten. Genkai Hakuri no Jutsu. Dust release. Detachment of the primitive world technique. North Gate, Sunidi is on her knees, crying. No. No. It can't be, she softly chants over and over again. Standing in front of her, kunai in hand, is Dan. Her former lover, back from the dead due to Orochimaru's Ido Tensei. To Dan's side is Nawaki, her brother, looking no older than when he died all those years ago. It's true. You are a disgrace to the Hokage name. You should never have been chosen to carry on our dreams, Dan says coldly. No. 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 Just give in sis. It was your fault for me dying anyways. I thought you would have been happy about my death. I. It wasn't mine. Of course it was. Have you gone senile too? You were the one who convinced me to become a ninja in the first place. You also convinced that retarded monkey to put me on Orochimaru's genin team. So don't go and say you're blameless as it is all your fault. I know. This can't be happening. It can and has. You are a disgrace to the Senju, and I am ashamed to even have considered you worthy to be my wife. So just die. Dan shouts as a kunai plunges down to make the final killing strike that would end her reign as Hokage. Chapter 8. The God of War. The sun is shining, the birds are chirping, waves roll lazily on the banks of a lake. On the beach are people relaxing, playing in the water, enjoying a picnic, sunbathing, or cuddling with loved ones. The serene scene is peaceful and tranquil, something right out of a fairy tale. But that isn't what Kanoha looks like now. It may have a lake, but that lake is red from the hundreds of bodies that now lay dead or dying from eight different countries. The bodies are piled high by the hundreds, limbs are severed by the thousands, and blood is spilled by the gallon. The kunai descend, the Ido tense Dan hoping to end Sunidi's existence without a fight. Sunidi, on all fours with tears gushing out of her eyes, can only wallow in despair as her loved ones tear her down to absolute nothingness. The kunai is mere centimeters away when an iron hold on the wrist stops it. Madam Hokage, now is not the time to be wallowing. Your village needs you so get the fuck up and fight. Sunidi blinks through her tears and sees a heavily tanned man with seven swords, holding the wrist of the struggling Dan. Villar be at your service, he says with a flashy grin. Despite her age, she finds herself blushing at the man's extremely muscular body and somewhat handsome features. Then Nawaki tries to cult Sunidi, but B beats the kid down with a back fist to the face with his free hand. Orochimaru hisses in annoyance, and he and Sasuke appear directly in front of B and engage him. He cancels the Ido Tensei, as it costs too much chakra to maintain on someone who doesn't have the skills to beat a Jinch Kriki in a cage. Sasuke deals with Sunidi. I'll handle the Jinch Kriki. Sasuke growls in annoyance at getting the weaker opponent, but Orochimaru is already gone and engaging B. He would have to settle with her, however, it would be satisfying to see life leave her eyes. He knows how much Naruto cares for her. The only thing better would be the dope to see him kill her. He draws his sword and prepares to attack. Tsunidi shakes herself mentally, gaining control over herself. The blush goes away and she stands. She squares her shoulders and prepares to fight for her village, thanks to B's oh-so-inspiring speech. She turns to Sasuke and sees that he is ready for combat and scoffs. You think you can take a Sanin? What lies has that pedo been feeding you? I have grown strong. And you are a stepping stone to my revenge. Sasuke charges up his Shidori Nagashi and rushes Sunidi. She dodges the first strike but gets caught with a minor burst of lightning, causing her speed to fall for just a second. But that is all Sasuke needs. Tidori Senbon. Thousands of very sharp, very electrical shots towered Sunidi. She has a tough time dodging most of them, since Sasuke's Sharingan is helping him predict where she will go next. She manages to not get hit by most, but still has many shallow holes in her body. 
That's it. No more kitty play. Mukashm. Cherry Blossom Impact. Tsunade strikes the ground with ferocious strength, tearing up the earth. Sasuke has to use chakra to stay upright, but the piece of rock he is sticking to overturns, making Sasuke go with it. Tsunade moves so fast to end it, she might as well be flying towards the downed Sasuke. Just as she gets there, Orochimaru flashes in front of her. His skin is pale. Her than usual. It looks like he has used his body shedding technique a few times. Sorry, but I can't have you killing my apprentice, he says with a smirk. He lands next to her, seven swords out, and somehow managing to hold them all. Sasuke gets back to his feet and wipes the dirt off. I do not need your help. Orochimaru hisses at Sasuke's inflated ego, which he is partly responsible for. He runs through hand signs and slams his hand on the ground. Puchiya no Jutsu. In a puff, the huge form of the purple manda appears. He looks at the gobsmacked faces of the Hokage and B, then back to Orochimaru. So this is the glorious feast you promised me? I accept your offering. However, this does not get you in my good graces, only the right to retain the snake contract. Manda coils and leaps at his meals, that being Tsunade and B. Only for a leg to slam down on his face and force onto the ground. The powder blue leg then smashes his head over and over again. Manda smacks the being away with his tail and lifts his head before his head is crushed. You. I thought I killed you, he hisses at the dragon. You almost succeeded. But this time the result will be different. Hitomi throws fire at Manda who burrows underground to get away from the flames. To counter this, Hitomi takes to the air. She knows that she isn't as maneuverable on the ground with her large bulk. She circles the area, waiting for Manda to strike. On her fourth pass, Manda bursts from the ground, fangs extended. Hitomi sees and hears him coming. She uses her massive tail to literally swat him from the air. Manda hits the ground hard but slithers away to avoid a blast of fire from Hitomi. Stop running you snake and face me. Hitomi continues to blaze the forest, trying to hit Manda. Despite his size, he is moving at incredible speeds, making it difficult for Hitomi to even keep up. She chases him for a good mile, leaving behind a trail of fire. Suddenly Manda makes a U-turn and lunges for Hitomi who had been flying low. Hitomi manages to avoid his fangs, but his body grabs hold of her and drags her to the ground. Trees are uprooted, snapped and bowled over, as the two massive creatures fight for supremacy. Manda coils his lower body around her leg and takes off, dragging her along the ground. He makes sure to take sharp turns or go over any large rock formations to do extra damage. On one rock, she lands wrong and breaks a wing with a snap. She roars with pain and decides enough is enough. Making use of her bulk, she digs her limbs that Manda doesn't have and digs them deep into the ground, leaving 30 foot deep trenches. Manda slows considerably and eventually, the extra effort required to drag the dragon tires him out. He lets go of her leg and quickly makes a strike at her, trying to end this quickly. Unfortunately for him, Hitomi thought he would do so. As he lunges, fangs extended, he is met with the hottest flames Hitomi can make. Fire rushes down his open throat, cooking the flesh. Manda writhes with pain. He can feel his insides literally cooking inside his body as the head has nowhere to go. His mouth is open, trying to let out as much heat as possible. Meanwhile, Hitomi is pulling herself out of the trenches she created. Her left wing hangs at an angle that shouldn't be possible and hurts a lot. But she pushes through the pain and walks up to Manda's figure on the ground, her wing dragging on the ground. In a flash, she cleaves a chuck of flesh off of Manda, making him flail around in pain, but she holds him in place with her legs. Just before she can finish the job by cooking him through and through, Manda decides he has had enough. He vows to himself that Orochimaru will be dead by the end of the day and dispels himself back to his realm, taking with him Orochimaru's summoning contract and all the summons on the field. Hitomi lets out a mighty roar of triumph and takes the hunk of Manda flesh into her mouth and dispels it back to the dragon village. She has a wing to get healed and a wallet to make Hiromi. South gate, yo. You. A flash of red hair and the hookstaff is repulsed. FK looks up to see her savior. Long auburn hair, blue dress, green eyes. FK looks up at Mei Terumi from her kneeled position on the ground. Look at yourself, Yugura. Picking on the tired and the weak. And here I thought you were a true cage. Wait that isn't right. You abandoned Kiri just to have your revenge when you realized that the envoy was a fake. Yugura's face goes red with fury. So you did defect to those traitors. I had a feeling those leaf shinobi were lying to me. Tell me, why did you leave? Mei's eyebrow raises. You seriously think that I would stay? I hated killing my own kind. I hated every bit of your tyrannical rule, killing the bloodline users because you think they are evil and the cause of war. The only reason I stayed as long as I did was I was afraid, but I got the courage to do the right thing. Did you even realize that the bloodline clans made up for more than half of the population of Kiri? Do you know how much you have weakened our village? White wench. You have no right to speak to me that way. I fed you, trained you. I turned a blind eye and for what? For you to go and betray me. 
Did you ever ask yourself why I kept you alive? May shrugs. I didn't spend too much time on it. I merely assumed that it amused you to no end that a bloodline user was killing her own kind. Did you ever not even consider that I loved you? He says quietly. May's face goes riveted in shock. Him. Love her. The very person who ordered the death of her parents who were killed right in front of her. The parents that were trying to protect her from him. Rage boils over her and some kind of mist starts to roll off her. FK San. Please get out of here. You are in no shape to fight. Plus it can be pretty widespread. FK doesn't need to be told twice. She takes off into the village just as Jurei arrives. What's going on? He asks FK. Said woman shrugs. Some lovers quarrel. I don't really care as it buys us time. Jurei nods and takes one look at the buxom but pisses off Kanoichi. His blood starts to travel south but he smacks himself. He has a job to do. Right. On three. Three. Doton. Dorakeki. Earth release. Earth style wall. The five Anbu plus Jurea seal up the gaping hole in the wall. They pack it in, making it as dense as they can make it. Hayton. Diandon. Fire release. Big flame bullet. Jurea coats the wet mud with an intense flame, baking it and hardening it. Soon, the wall is clay, making it sturdy enough to act as a wall. With his job here complete, he and the other Anbu make their way to the other gates. Back with May, acidic smog continues to roll off her. Her eyes shine with barely restrained rage. You have the audacity to say you love me? You ordered the death of my parents. They died right in front of me, an eight-year-old girl. I will never return that so-called love of yours. You don't know the first thing about me. Futon. Fushoku no Sajiridan. Boil release. Fog bullet of corrosion. Wisps of fog lazily float towards Yugura. He huffs and sidesteps the clouds. Did you actually think I would just sit there and let the touch me? A smirks. No. I expected you to be an idiot. Look around you. He does and finds himself completely surrounded by the balls of fog. You were arrogant and fell right into my trap. Hack A. Release. The fog pulses slightly before losing cohesion just a tiny bit. Then explodes outward. The fog is so dense that May can't see through it, but she can hear the screams. The shinobi that Yugura brought are being dissolved as she thinks. Suddenly a large wave of spikes. A large amount of water rushes outward from Yugura, bringing down the fog. May catches sight of Yugura, completely healthy but covered in a cloak. You. You. And Yugura completely loses it. Yugura disappears and May dodges a strike from a chakra tail. She rolls on the ground and blocks a strike from his hands, having completely ditched the hook staff. His cloak, however, burns her. She grits her teeth to keep from grunting in pain. May wisely backs off, giving space to do something other than almost getting killed. Empton. Die Kazingandan. Lava release. Great lava bullet. Enormous globs of 1500F lava blast towards Yugura. Unfortunately, a cascade of water forms in front of the target, blocking the attack. May scowls and goes through more hand seals. Empton. Kazangan no Kanketsusen. Lava release. Geyser of lava. This time, a large column of lava shoots up from the ground, right under Yugura. He lets out a growl as his cloak fights with a superheated substance. But the cloak wins when Yugura plunges his tails into the ground and pumps it full of water, cooling down the substance. May curses. She had been counting on her lava being able to get through the shield. But she has an idea. If he can block a geyser. Unfortunately, he doesn't allow her any more time. He shoots several highly pressurized blasts of water, in upwards of several thousand psi, at her. She dodges a few, then puts up an earth wall to block the rest while she goes about her plan. She starts going through a large number of hand seals, but she is pressed for time. The earth wall begins to crack, and too soon the wall fails. The fear of Yagura looks to see May gone. May, from underneath the ground, had performed a quick that pulled her under the ground, never stopping the long chain of hand seals. It took all she had to perform the while concentrating for another one. She cringes as she feels the earth shake from torrents of water descending on her position. It seems the bitch can detect chakra signatures. She speeds up her seals now in a race to see if she can finish first before the water gets to her. Five more. Three more. One more. The top of the ground hiding her is blasted away, soaking her. She looks up to see Yagura with his tails poised to impale her. But she jumps away at the last moment and completes the last one. Empton. Yumarekawari Kubachi no Dai Gansho. Lava release. Great magma pit of rebirth. The ground opens up and beneath Yagura is a pit of pure magma, a full thousand degrees hotter than lava. Yagura can't do a thing as he plummets into the pit. May hears the shrieks of pain as Yagura hits the super liquid. May then closes the top of the pit with a thick layer of earth. She plans on keeping him active for a good ten minutes to make sure that he is dead. She lays down against the remains of an earth wall from Fu's battle and breathes hard. That is her strongest and takes the most chakra to do, half of her reserves to be precise. 
She closes her eyes and tries to regain her breath, even as she feels her chakra draining which is keeping her active. Her eyes are not closed for more than two minutes when the earth erupts in an enormous wave of water. Said green eyes go wide as she sees a hand appear, then another. In no time, Yagura pulls himself up out of the pit. His clothes are gone, melted away. A heavy blue hue surrounds him, his three tails swishing violently. She cuts them but doesn't bother getting up, exhausted as she is. That is it. I can't win. That was my. Yagura lets out a primal yell, and a seal on his chest glows brightly, blinding May. The seal keeps on getting brighter and brighter, then suddenly fades. The cloak leaves his body and his slumps over. A pale blue mist leaks from his body, which gathers outside his body. May's eyes again go wide. The mist swirls around itself and particle by particle, the mist solidifies and forms an enormous, three-tailed, armored-for-war turtle. The Sanbi is free again. But before she or the bitch can do anything, the ground begins to rumble. Westgate, Naruto and Kikbi eye the two cage. I'm guessing I can't convince you to call off the attack. You realize that Akatsuki will come for us containers, and now that four of us are here, it will be too much of an opportunity to resist. Noki snorts. I could care less about the demons. All I care about is crushing the leaf until not even the roots are left. Naruto sighs. He looks to the side of the massive crater created by Lenoki's Jinten. Genkai Hakuri no Jutsu, Dust Release. Detachment of the primitive world technique, which destroyed the dirt and the bodies. He had used the cone shape, exponentially expanding the destructive power of his over a shape like a square. The Daisha's inkage lazily goes through several hand seals. Kusabana Nin. Hana Shuriken. Flower Ninja Art. Flower Shuriken. Several flowers from inside the man's robes float in the air as if resting on an airwave. Suddenly the petals go stiff and start spinning incredibly fast. They shoot off at Naruto and Kikbi, who dodge them easily. However, they are forced to dodge again as they come back around, apparently being controlled by the nature shadow. Kikbi quickly has enough. She activates her magma swords and cuts through the flowers with ease, setting them on fire in the process. The Daisha's Inkage releases more flowers from his robe. Kusabana Nin. Yuga Hanabira no Mao. Flower Ninja Art. Dance of the Moonflower Petals. Dozens of dark purple flower petals flow from the robe. These elegant petals on their own could be described as beautiful. They swirl in a complex pattern around the field, mesmerizing several leaf shinobi. Naruto curls an eyebrow. They have to do something. Then he starts to feel it. A sick feeling coming up from his stomach. It grows rapidly to his arms and legs, making them heavy and full of lead. He drops to the ground in a heap, kick me with him. Do you like me? The moonflower is a very rare species of flora. It is so rare that it doesn't grow in one part of Kusa no Kuni and only blooms once every five years. The petals emit a sort of toxin in the scent that paralyzes the body and makes it heavy. Onoki begins running through hand seals to finish the battle and move on to destroy the village. Naruto looks at Kikbi, completely unfazed by the explanation. Hey Kaiu, how much heavier do you feel? A seemingly innocent question. Not so much if you can control gravity. She mulls back and forth for a second in no particular hurry. 76.32 kilograms. She gives Naruto a cheeky grin to which she can feel him raising an eyebrow at her. Jinten. Fukubin Jikai. Dust release. Atomic disintegration. The cloud of dirt softly makes its way from Lenoki's hands towards the downed Kikbi and Naruto. He finds it odd that neither of them are worried or feel any need to move from a move that will kill them. But if they want to die, that isn't his problem. The dirt gets within five feet when both Naruto and Kikbi simply vanish. He cuts him and looks at his fellow cage. Where did they go? The nature shadow is looking around for them. I don't know. It was definitely them. I felt their chakra. I thought you paralyzed them. Lenoki snaps as they continue to look around. Cut the shit. You and I both know my work on them, he fires back. Then how could they move? You must have done something wrong. Or maybe you two don't know about our skills, a voice comes above them. They both look up to see the woman in the man's lap with an enormous blush on her face while sitting on him sideways. Did I mention they are flying? Both men gape. No one outside of the Tsuchikage line should know how to fly. How are you flying? Lenoki asks for obvious reasons. Relax. Kanoha has not stolen Iwa's secrets. We keep our treaties. Unlike others, the Owl Mask Amber replies. On his lap, Kikbi has regained control of herself from the punishment from Naruto for her answer to his question earlier. She runs through hand seals, like Naruto, and both take a deep breath in. Pain. Karakendon. Fire release. Fire dragon flame bullet. Ton. Raijin no Daiteki Gufu. Wind release. Great tornado of the dragon god. While they don't need to make hand seals, unless they want to kill two cage, it is best to keep up appearances. Naruto, using his control of wind, creates an impossibility. Or naturally impossible. Naruto creates two very strong tornadoes right beside each other. That wasn't impossible. 
what is impossible is the fact that they are spinning the opposite direction from each other, creating impossibly strong crosswinds. Or Loki, who is in the air, gets sucked up in an instant, while Shin puts up a fight and lasts. Oh 10 seconds before the winds get the best of him and add him to the maelstrom. Then the dragons hit. Ikbi's fire dragon splits into two, without decreasing the size of either mind you, and hits both tornadoes. The technique goes from deadly to devastating in seconds. Minutes fly by as the fire show continues. Truthfully, they are keeping active to give their bodies time to recover from the toxin. While being demons, they can still be poisoned. It's just their bodies expel and metabolize the substance more quickly. But Naruto and Kikbi are far from unguarded. Their opponents aren't cage level for nothing. Oten. Chibunkaku. Earth release. Moving earth core. From beneath Naruto and Kikbi, a very large section of earth starts to rise at a very fast pace. And standing on it is a slightly crispy shin. Kusabana Ninbu. Kakemuchi. Flower ninja art. Flower stem whip. From his robes, the lanky man pulls out a flower and suddenly, the stem of the flower lengthens by a factor of dozen. Before long, he has a 48-inch whip. He uncoils it and leaps at the blonde and repeat. He takes the whip and swings it at them, intending to take them back to the ground with him. He smirks as his whip succeeds in wrapping around his leg. However, his smirk disappears when the whip goes taunt and he feels like his whip latched onto a beam on a building. He jerks as he hits the bottom of his jump and almost loses his grip on the whip's handle. He is severely confused as he is just hanging onto his whip while the man said the whip is attached to just hovering, unmoving, in the air. Just as he thinks it can't get any worse, he sees the red head look over the side at him. She gives him a smile and a wave before she makes a show of her just touching the whip and it bursts into flames. He watches in horror as the fire spreads down his whip ever closer to his hands. He looks down and his eyes go wide. He is at least a hundred feet in the air. He hadn't even noticed them climbing higher. Then the fire reaches his hands. He screams in pain as he desperately tries to not let go, but the pain is too much. His hands slip on the burnt flower and he falls. He screams as he descends to his death, as not even a cage with nothing to grab onto can survive a fall like that. He falls 80 feet with the ground getting very, very dangerously close. Shin, screaming all the way, is mere feet away when Lenoki comes out of nowhere and catches him. And by catching him, he tackles him more and slows his downward speed by quite a lot. At the cost of gaining more weight and horizontal speed. They crash on the ground and roll for a good 20 feet before coming to a stop. Lenoki blinks in pain, not able to move at all. He had hit squarely on his back, which was already precarious as it was. Now he had either thrown it out at the very least or completely shattered it at the worst. For Shin, he had hit the ground on his chest. His ribs took the brunt of the fall, snapping and breaking them multiple times. Some of the fragments were shoved into his lungs, making it very difficult to breathe. Naruto and Kikbi land gently on the ground. Kikbi whispers something in his ear and gives him the kid eyes. Naruto nods and she squeals in delight. She extends her fingernails into claws and stalks her way to Shin. Said man's eyes go wide and he tries to get away from her, but between his shattered ribs and lungs being punctured multiple times, he is going nowhere fast. Ikbi smashes her foot onto his ribsage, eliciting a shriek from the man. She then struts over to Lenoki who can't move his lower half at all. He tries to go through hand seals, but Kikbi's foot breaks both his hands. He yells in pain as his hands are useless. She smirks triumphantly and drags Lenoki over to Shin, who is trying to calm himself after that intense burst of pain. Lenoki hits the ground hard and the wind is knocked out. However, both are distracted from their injuries when Kikbi's eyes start to glow. Fire circles her hands and not any ordinary fire. No, this fire is pitch black. Amaterasu, the flames of the sun goddess herself. She is a lower density than the four creators of the universe, created by Kratos himself to serve him. And since Kikbi is from the Jibai, made from Kratos' flesh, she has access to the destructive flames. Kikbi places her hands on the chests of the two cage. They scream as the flames spread across their bodies. Soon, their entire bodies are covered with the inextinguishable flames. As the cage's bodies literally melt, their eyes are wide open, watching the smirk of Kikbi as they gleefully listen to their screams. As the light fades from their eyes, they only regret not treating it like a real threat to begin with. They close their eyes for the last time, as the flames consume the last of their bodies. Only for their eyes to flash open and see the sky. Shai's hands roam his body, feeling his cool robes, while Lenoki takes a more mental stock of himself. Before long, both are standing and looking at each other. Was it all a dream? No, it wasn't. They both look to see the owl Lanbu and the woman sitting on his lap. Shai looks confused, but Lenoki gets it. Injutsu. But when? Right after we disappeared from sight after Shai paralyzed us. Kayu here is quite the Jinjutsu caster. Which is weird if you know her at all. Lenoki and Shin share a look and get ready to fight again. But then feel a massive weight on their shoulders. Oh no. 
I'm not letting you get any more chances to fight. The only reason you didn't wake up in jail cell is because we were waiting for the paralytic to wear off. Now that it has. Owl says as he gets to his feet as Kikbi pouts because she is forced to get off his lap. However, before Naruto can seal their chakra with a seal and take them into custody, the ground begins to rumble. A large cloud of dust explodes into the air about a mile from Konoha. What comes out of the cloud makes Kikbi pale. No. No, no 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 no. Naruto uses his Rinnegan to enhance his vision and see what she does. It is Mammoth's eyes. Four legs, each the width and twice the height of the Hokage Tower. On its face are two very, very large tusks that look like each one can take out a mountain. Its back is covered by a very tough-looking triangular shell. On its long neck are rows of razor-sharp metal spikes finish the look. Think of a cross between an Adat from Star Wars, an elephant, and a turtle. The overall shape of the Adat, the shell of a turtle, and the tusks and feet of an elephant. For more go to Wikilongi, the towers over the village, and a tusk is easily 40 feet long. When they step, the earth trembles and shakes. Their bellows shake the buildings in the village and uproot trees in the surrounding forest. Oh, did I mention there are 15 of these colossal creatures? On the ground moving slightly faster are seven foot tall men if they could be called that. They have the general outline of humans, but their entire bodies are covered in a crystal-like substance. Their arms have large crystal formations on them, giving them a grotesque appearance, no two the same. For more, go to wiki sacrifice percent 28 final fantasy xiii percent 29 hundreds. Hundreds of these creatures are marching beside the goliath beasts. Then the air is filled with thousands of bird-like monsters. Each wing looks like the skin of the wing has been through a shredder. How it stays afloat, Naruto doesn't know. It has a short body and a whip-like tail. Rows of razor-sharp teeth are seen in the short head. For more, go to wiki zernitra percent 28 final fantasy xiii percent 29. Kikbi lets a tear fall from her face. So they finally came. Naruto turns questioningly to Kikbi. You know what's going on here. Kikbi looks sadly at Naruto and nods. Lucifer has decided you are too much of a threat. So he sent his army of demons. Naruto starts to panic. What are we going to do? They're coming right for Konoha. There is no way we can repulse an invasion from Iwa and Odo on top of demons. Kikbi is at his side in an instant. I know. But to keep Konoha safe I, I have to transform. And therein lies a major problem. Not only would people know she is out, but they might attack her instead. Is there any other way? What are they even doing here? No. I'm the only one that stands a chance, but even I have my limits when facing demons. I sense him nearby and his foul play. If he attacks, then all my attention will be on him and. And Konoha will fall. Naruto grits his teeth. There has to be another way. He clenches his hands in anger. There has to be something he can do. He hasn't worked this hard only to fail. He works his hands back and forth as he tries to think of something, anything. Normal aren't effective against demons, their bodies are too sturdy. And don't get started on regular steel. It would be like Putty trying to cut through rod iron. It isn't going to happen. His hand accidentally hits his sword attached to his side and freezes. Of course. He draws his sword and activates it to level 2. Kikbi watches him with sad eyes, watches his excitement in his eyes. She feels absolutely terrible for her next words. You can't help. Well that sword is divine in origin, it won't help much against demon armor that is designed to withstand holy objects. It will only make you a target. Don't forget that you are who they are trying to kill. Bigby watches as Naruto gets more and more angry. You can't expect me to just sit here. I I have to do something. I have to go with you. Bigby wraps him in a very strong hug. I can't lose you. Your death will almost be certain if you go with me. She lowers her head. And I can't have that. I can't lose you. Naruto rounds on her. So you leave me here and just watch you risk your life. How is that fair to me? How about Hiromi? Are you going to just go and leave her behind too? He couldn't believe it. She is leaving him. After all this time, she promised not to leave him, to always be by his side. A painful burning starts in his chest and spreads to his limbs. His brain focuses completely on the fact that she is going to leave. One, that pain. So familiar to me. He can't have that. He can't feel that pain again. Bigby shakes her head. I'm sorry but we don't have time for this. I love you and be safe. Pickby lifts his mask up and kisses him. She suppresses her tears when he doesn't respond, doesn't even register that she is in front of him, making contact with him. She looks into his eyes and sees him retreating into himself once more. And now she is more torn than ever. If she leaves now, then all the work she and Hiromi did is gone, but the sake of the village is at stake and with it all the people he cares about. She bites her lip, thinking fast about what to do. Then she remembers her own pact to heal him. I vowed that I would help him. To follow him down the path he chooses. Even if that means leveling the village. She makes her choice. She jumps on Naruto. Literally. 
She wraps her arms and legs around him and kisses him for all she has. His hands catch her out of reflex and hold her ass as she makes passionate love to his mouth. For Naruto, one moment he is closing himself off, protecting himself from the burning pain across his chest. The next he is holding the reason for the pain while she attacks his lips. He pulls back from the kiss with questioning eyes. Bigby's heart sinks when he breaks the kiss, fearing that it is already too late. But she doesn't let it get her down. She squares her shoulders, figuratively of course, and meets his eyes. They are half glossy, half the crystal clear blue that he has only recently regained. Forget the village. Forget the demons. Forget Akatsuki. I love you and I won't leave you for any reason. Naruto stares into her lovely red eyes, searching for signs of trickery. I forgot that I love you, not the village. Anything you wish, I will do my best to fulfill it. If you wish the death of every human, then their fate is sealed. Tell me to raise the village, and I'll turn it to ash. Tell me to give you the moon and it is yours. Please don't close yourself off again. Naruto considers her words before nodding and gently kissing her, which she has no hesitation in returning. Anything for you Haim. Just don't leave me. Bigby smiles. Never. They lean in again. Out of nowhere, Shin slices at Naruto and Kikbi with a Hanatsurugi, flower sword. He and Lenoki had been forced on the ground, but with Naruto distracted, he let up on them. Shin silently casts a flower into a very long and sharp sword. He silently crept up on them while they were in their own little world. Oten. Chinkajkin no Jutsu. Earth release. Super aggravated rock technique. From above, Lenoki falls to the ground with his entire army the raised or turned to stone. He plunges to the ground at astounding speeds because of the increase in weight. He smirks as he falls. He will make those upstart kids pay for ignoring him. As he falls and Shin closes in, those children continue to ignore him. Faster than they can react to, red tails flash into existence. They wrap around Lenoki and Shin, preventing them from even moving. A tail around each of their limbs stops any movement. Even Lenoki with his arm transformed into rock was stopped on a dime, and the tails show no signs of giving out. They look to the source of the tails and are astounded that they originate from the woman. What are you? Lenoki asks with both fear and awe because of the same reason. Power. Bigby kisses Naruto once more before letting herself down. She lets out more of her features, revealing her ears, claws, and fangs. Kikbi smirks and pulls Lenoki close, recoiling as she takes a whiff of him. Lenoki counts the tails and puts them all together. Bure. Lenoki goes silent as Naruto puts a chakra seal on Lenoki and chops the back of his head. He does the same thing for Shin. He is about to create a clone to take the cage to Tsunade when a blonde-haired woman lands in the clearing. Naruto-sama, Kikbi-sama. I'm sorry I'm late. Got wind of multiple villages going to invade Konoha and wanted to attack them from the outside. Naruto nods. Very good Yujito. Please go and take these two cage to Tsunade and follow any direction she has. Tell her Kikbi and I are going to draw the demons away from Konoha. Yujito grimaces but nods her understanding. She grabs the two cage by the scruff of their necks and takes off towards Konoha. With the cages gone, Naruto takes his mask off and smiles at Kikbi. He holds out his hand to her in an invitation, both figuratively and physically. She gives him a large smile and leaps into his arms. Just then Hiromi lands, kicking up a large dust cloud. She too had seen the demons and finished her fight with another summons quickly and hurried back. She knows just how serious it is if Kikbi is letting out her features. What are we going to do? She asks, but that is directed at Naruto knowing Kikbi will do whatever he wants. We are going to draw the demons away from the village. They can mop up with the invasion. They can't hold off an invasion from demons. So let's go. Naruto, with Kikbi in his arms, jumps up on Hiromi's head. She immediately takes off towards the army of demons. Naruto secures himself with Chakra and looks at Kikbi. You know what to do. Be safe. You too. Kikbi pushes him off and falls to the ground. But in a flash of red, Kikbi unleashes her full demon form, drawing much attention from both demons and humans. Scene change. The Saitsunity was surprised when another Jinch Kriki brought her not one but two cage to add to her day of fun. First Kanoha gets invaded not by two or three, but by four or five villages, then two Jinch Kriki show up from Iowa. Then the Hachibi Jinch Kriki saves her, the Mizukage dies which releases the Sanbi, an army of demons shows up, two cage now in their jails. Can this day get any worse? It certainly has the potential to. With eight of the nine Bijk here, Akatsuki will definitely try to attack she thinks dryly. At least Kumo showed up and helped deal with the rest of the enemy shinobi. Strangely enough, they all fled when the demons arrived. Good thing too. One less problem for me. Naruto-sama says that he and Kikbi-sama will draw off the demons from Konoha, Yujito finishes. Then a wave of familiar rolls over the village. It seems Kikbi-sama has gone and fully transformed Nibi informs me. Tsunade bashes her head against the desk. She really needs a drink. 
She wonders if she can stay drunk for an entire week after this to deal with all the shit about killing Naruto and Kikbi and dozens of other stupid requests. Ijido, find Jiraiya and bring him here. Also round up any other Jinchikriki you find. Akatsuki will be on the march with so many of you here. We will leave the demons to those two. In Flash, the Kumo version of the Shunshin, Yujido disappears. Tsunade starts to reach for a sake bottle when she stops. She can't afford to be even buzzed when Akatsuki arrives. She had been lucky when Orochimaru had retreated when his snake summons started disappearing. Sasuke had been knocked out by a tail from B and nearly killed had it not been for another timely arrival by Orochi team to save his next body. With Naruto, Naruto flies on the back of Kiyomi and activates the second level of his sword. He makes it shine so bright it could have blinded him to attract the attention of the demons. When the demons turn towards him, he lowers the light level and changes the blade into a long-range sword with segmented parts, making it into a whip. Narukan, please get on my head. Not knowing why, but figuring there is a good reason for it, Naruto does what she asks. As the aerial demons draw near, Kiyomi concentrates her chakra. She opens her mouth. Dozens of astronomically high-pressurized water spouts erupt from her mouth, each going for a different target. All of them, Naruto can't see, have an electric charge running through each spout. The demons start to dodge, but still dozens are hit. They convulse as the electricity fries their bodies. But none fall from the sky. After the shock is over, they just continue on. Normal won't work on the Rick-chan. Physical damage is the next best thing to holy jutsu, Kikbi says from the ground. Kikbi lets out a mighty roar that shakes the ground and makes the crystal demons on the ground stumble. Then she is on them. She wraps her tails in flames and proceeds to decimate the ranks of demons. That is until Kikbi is tackled. Her eyes widen when she sees just to hit her. Cerberus, she growls. The three-headed Inu demon growls and hackles at her. He has dark red lines and stripes all adorning his body, giving him a savage look. They stand a few hundred meters apart, snarling and trying to intimidate each other. A lot of time I don't see Fox bitch. I still have to repay you for that time. Give us the human and we shall leave. Higby's tails bristle. Never. Then we shall kill him by force. Tell me, why do you help the humans if you are a demon? I share the name demon only because I came from Chbais. I will never be like you. Cerberus growls and goes low. Then it is decided. I should have killed you when I had the chance. You will die today, Kikbi snarls. Cerberus seems to smirk. And by the time you do, the human will already be dead. Before Kikbi can react, Cerberus launches himself at her. Kikbi swats at him with a tail, but one of Cerberus's heads clamps down on it, making her growl with pain. However, she uses the tail to send Cerberus off course. She sends more tails after him, swamping him then coming with sharp fangs and claws. But Cerberus isn't about to take this lying down. He hunkers down, using his greater strength and weight to his advantage. Then he rips the tail in his mouth, yanking Kikbi towards him, throwing her off balance. He slashes at her with his front claws, scoring the first hit. Kikbi shrugs off the hit as she is already healing the gashes in her chest. She uses her razor-sharp fangs and tears into one of Cerberus's necks, under the middle one. Cerberus howls in pain and uses one of his paws to crush her exposed back. The blow forces Kikbi to let go, and Cerberus takes advantage of it. Two heads. Two heads gouge into her red fur, and not all of it is because red is her natural color. Blood sprays everywhere and the third head grips her throat and tears at it. Her throat is no match for the mighty beast and gives way. He stares down at Kikbi's dying body. Stupid bitch. She has gotten soft. Suddenly he roars with pain as he is slammed into the ground. He looks with his right head and sees Kikbi standing over him as she tears into his back and neck with her claws and fangs. Stupid. She has no equal with illusions. Kikbi keeps clawing into her opponent with savage ferocity and fury. She feels Cerberus trying to turn over, but she uses her tails to pin him to the ground. Out of options, he pours into his mouth. Three black balls of highly condensed form in each one. Sanju Amari. Triple-tailed beast ball. Kikbi feels the massive buildup of. Not even she can come out of something like that without being hurt. Shugo no Muhin Kayutai. Infinite sphere of protection. Kikbi's tails let go of Cerberus and wraps around her entire body, shielding her from the imminent blast. Cerberus feels Kikbi retreating to protect herself. He smirks and turns around and fires the triple Amari, each having the strength of what the Gobi can do, directly into her tails that shield her. The triple Amari fights with a red barrier before exploding. But Naruto, Naruto slices at random demons that either make passes at him and Hiromi or those they pass. The natural armor the demons have gives the sword a tough time, but he can still hack through if he puts enough force behind it. He had grown optimistic when Kikbi had taken a full third of the army out within moments of engaging them. That optimism quickly turned sour when Kikbi started her fight with a three-headed dog that is the same size if not a little bigger than she is. Hiromi can feel his agitation and finishes off as many demons as she can with her rantan. 
Around them is a maelstrom that is kicking up very heavy winds that is just tossing about the lower weighted demons. She herself is having no problems with it as she weighs several times more than the demons in the air. They have combined to cut down more than 50 aerial demons when a huge buildup of spikes. Both Summoner and Summoner look to see Kikbi get blasted at near point-blank range, with not one but three Amari. The resulting explosion tosses Naruto from Hiromi's now erratic flight due to the concussive force. It also has the side effect of making Naruto very disoriented, making it so he can't concentrate on anything. He twists and tumbles not just end over end, but spins in a clockward spiral, making it impossible to get any bearings. Then he hits the ground. With his sword sticking through his chest. With Kikbi, when the Amari fades, Kikbi's red ball is pitch black all the way around. Then a piece falls off. Then another. Bit by bit, parts flake off of the sphere. Then the sphere explodes in a shower of charged shrapnel. Cerberus finds himself flying back with an enraged Kikbi biting and clawing at his stomach. She tore at his neck, ripping right through the flesh, spilling black blood. Then she hears something hit the ground. She turns her head to see Naruto laying on the ground with his glowing sword going right through the center of his chest, through the breastplate and all. She doesn't even hesitate and is by his side in an instant in her human form. She holds on to Naruto, who isn't moving, as Hiromi also lands and changes into her human form as quickly as possible. They cradle Naruto into their laps and hold on to him, whispering and hoping that he isn't dead. Hope begins to fade as the minutes tick by and there is no sign of life from Naruto. But then Naruto's body begins to glow. It gains brightness until both women are forced to look away. When the light fades, they gawk at what they see. A shirtless Naruto standing straight up, sword gone. With wings. White wings point too. Well this is interesting, he murmurs to himself. His voice kicks both women out of their drooling and they attack him. They kiss, touch, feel, and rub all over him in happiness that he is not dead and finding out what just happened. There is no indication that the sword even scratched him as well as no blood. This is my final stage. When the user stabs themselves while the second phase is activated, the user and I merge into one being. You are now capable of using holy designs for combating demons, a new voice in his head says. And you are? Naruto asks even though he has a good idea. I am the sword. I used your mother's chakra as a medium to communicate with you in her form to take physical shape. You have merged with me completely. You are the weapon now, a powerful weapon. So. I know only a few holy, the rest is up to you to learn. Meanwhile, the girls are sorta of freaking out at Naruto's unresponsiveness. Narukun. Kikbi shouts as she gets fed up and lightly smacks his face. His eyes shift to the concerned face of his fiancée. Sorry. Apparently this is the final form of the sword. It merged with me and now I can do holy. They are forced back to reality when Cerberus comes in very fast, slashing and chomping with his three sets of fangs. Kikbi and Hiromi start to shift, but they aren't going to make it in time. Thank you. Zeno Hesu. Heaven's punishment. Almighty push. Cerberus finds himself flying backwards at mind-boggling speeds. He processes the information when he slams into the side of a large rock formation known as a mountain. That human had used holy. He has to end this before it gets even more out of hand. He flares his and a dark pool forms in front of him. Slowly, a fearsome creature comes out of the pool of obsidian liquid. It is heavily armored with a humanoid body with wings melded with a large ugly animal with four stubby legs, a short neck and flat face, and a long tail. This is Ultima Weapon, second strongest demon only to Lucifer. So strong that he is tied with Kikbi in raw power. He is a little smaller than Cerberus in height and far less in weight, but Cerberus would be suicidal to engage in combat with him. For more go to wiki Ultima Weapon% 28 Final Fantasy VIII% 29. Cerberus growls, getting the craze demon's attention. Finish the human while I distract the fox bitch. Ultima looks blankly at Cerberus before drawing a demon steel sword and advancing on Cerberus. Said demon stands his ground and raises his hackles. You know what will happen if you attack me. Lucifer has declared you under my command as his second. Ultima stops and tilts his head and stops. Without warning Ultima disappears. But Naruto. Naruto blinks, not even realizing that he just did that to a being that is as large as Kikbi's true size. He looks at his outstretched hand, still amazed that he did that out of reflex. He flexes his wings and tentatively hovers in the air. He then sees Hiromi and Kikbi in their full forms, and Naruto flies up to Hiromi's head. When he reaches the top, he collapses due to the fire shooting through the new muscles because of the lactic acid. Let's go to Hiromi-chan. We still have a lot of demons to take care of. Deciding that they will talk about this whole affair later, Hiromi does as directed. Instantly she and Naruto are swarmed. Naruto feels the sword make his holy chakra mold, and he finds himself shouting Shinyu. Tenrai Shugo. Heavenly protection. Divine safeguard. An encasement of light surrounds himself and Hiromi, making the demon skip right off of it. Hiromi then recreates the maelstrom, this time making it rain and lighting. The rain makes visibility low and the lightning. 
that is self-explanatory. She fires off after into the demons, slowly whittling them down in numbers. Surprisingly, they fired right through the barrier around the two. The sword implants an idea in his head and Naruto pours holy chakra into his hands. He sees them glow, and the white beam shoots out, startling him. However, the effects are magnificent. The beams tore right through the demon armor and cut several wings and appendages off. Naruto smirks and starts to fire off beams at the demons. His kill count skyrockets. Meanwhile Kikbi again ravages the demons on the ground, who were headed right for them. Then Kikbi sees a column of demons, the long gi heading for Konoha to exterminate them. She can see being fired at the demons, but they aren't even slowing them down. She moves to intercept the demons, worried that she will have to deal with the humans. As she approaches the gates, she sees the leading long gi take a step that would flatten a dozen shinobi crash the main gate. She kicks it up a notch, trying to get to the gate first. Just as the foot is meters away from crushing the gate, Kikbi slams into it, knocking it over. The shinobi stare in a myriad of emotions ranging from panicked at seeing a freed Kikbi to horror, as Kikbi savagely digs into the demon, ripping it apart and exposing the organs, and showering the ground, and them, in buckets of orange blood. Kikbi lets out a roar as she finishes mauling the first longi. She counts eight left and starts to panic, as the rest of the demon tanks start to charge her. Now normally a demon of Kikbi's caliber would have little to fear from a lesser demon that doesn't even have 5% of the Jibai's power, even if she is outnumbered more than 5 to 1. But even Cerberus with his body of solid muscle doesn't want to get skewered by 40-foot long tusks. Long Gi are not the fastest demons nor the strongest. They always walk at a leisurely pace. But if they do charge, as rare as it is, it would take a mountain to stop them. Kikbi has 8 charges on her. Kikbi turns her back to Konoha and wraps her tails in the same blue fire that she used at the beginning of the battle. She then charges right at the demons charging right at her. As they close in on each other, Kikbi extends her tails and intensifies the flames. She jumps into the air and starts to hop on the backs of each longi. As she lands, she takes her tails and burns the shit out of each one, cooking the insides of the demon. In seconds, all eight longi fall to the ground, writhing in agony as they feel their internal organs cooking, which makes them stop functioning. Kikbi huffs as she lets her tail fire go out. That took a lot out of her. Suddenly she feels a massive spike of dark demon yakai explode over the battlefield. Her eyes flash open and the hair on the back of her neck raises in response to one of two demons that she cannot beat. But this isn't directed at her. She stands, her instincts to protect her mate. Only to be tackled by Cerberus who had been laying in wait for her to let her guard down or for a team a weapon to make his move. The two enormous beings tussle once more only this time is in plain view of the shinobi. The humans watch as the Kikbi no Yoko, Death Incarnate, defends them. Kikbi manages to separate from Cerberus, but not before a head gets a bit on her left shoulder, making it painful to walk on. Her healing has also slowed down due to her low levels from fighting for so long. Cerberus says nothing, for once, and stands between Kikbi and Naruto. She feels another spike of the dark, signifying that a technique is about to be used, and judging from the amount that is being put into it, it is going to be very devastating. Kikbi tries everything to get past Cerberus, but nothing works. She is just too low now. But she keeps on trying over and over again. She is now bleeding profusely from multiple gashes and bites, making her body feel heavy. But even still she continues to try. The only thing on her mind is getting to Naruto and saving him, even at the cost of her life. She cannot let him die. Ikbi tries again, but her body is so heavy and she makes a mistake. She goes too slow on a turn, and Cerberus latches onto the back of her neck and wrangles her down to the ground. She howls and claws and struggles but no avail. Cerberus keeps his grip tightly on her as his other heads fend off the tails. Cerberus is shocked that Kikbi continues to try to get free, even though his jaws have her. He huffs as Kikbi continues to trash around in both pain and need. He briefly wonders what is driving her to be so energetic, to keep on going. Then he feels Ultima is ready with his attack and prepares to kill Kikbi and claim his superiority over her once and for all. The last thing Kikbi sees is her body loses both blood and is a bright light that envelopes her and the sky. Or maybe that is just her vision going out. But Naruto, Naruto is having the time of his life. Feeling the wind in his face, firing beam after beam of pure holy chakra at demons. Hiromi hears him laughing and feels. She doesn't know what she feels. It isn't happiness, but at the same time it is. She can't explain it. And out of nowhere, Hiromi's underbelly gets sliced open. She roars in pain, forcing Naruto to pay attention. He looks around and sees nothing. Then Hiromi's back left leg gets sliced, then her front right then her right wing near the base. Hiromi is in a massive amount of pain from the gashes and losing altitude fast. She concentrates on landing as well as possible, but with her wing ligament severed, her wing will not respond and cannot control herself. To protect Naruto she turns over and lands squarely on her back with a resounding thud that rocks the ground. 
Naruto's momentum carries him forward and hydroplanes about 10 feet before stopping. Naruto pulls himself out of the mud and turns back and is horrified by what he sees. A large demon standing over Kikbi with a sword more than half its height poised to kill an unmoving Hiromi. No. Either out of instinct or the sword working Naruto's chakra again, Naruto channels a huge amount of holy chakra into his palms and lets loose. The enormous beam of energy hits home and throws the beast back. Naruto nearly falls over from exhaustion and looks at his smoking palms. He shakes his head loose and focuses on the downed Hiromi. Naruto looks on as Hiromi slowly changes back to her human form and looks to see her right arm bent at a ridiculous angle that hurts to even look at. Naruto drops to his knees and lowers his head to her chest, hoping to Kami that she is alive. He relaxes when he hears the soft but steady thumping of her heart and feels the gentle rising and falling of her chest. He lets out a breath of relief and pulls her arm straight and winces at the painful moan Hiromi breathes out. He gets up and tiredly looks around for something to splint it with, but then comes the vial. It is so sudden and powerful that Naruto doubles over and throws up. Before he even stands back up, his reflexes tell him to be someplace else. Good thing because there was a deep gash in the ground where he had been standing. Before him stands the ugliest beast he has ever seen. A cross between a man, a bird, and a dog. However, he doesn't have time to worry about looks as the demon wildly attacks, without any form or thought about counters. Of course, his strikes are so fast that he doesn't leave any openings to attack to make up for it. Naruto breathes hard as he tries to keep up with the crazed demon. He also feels a buildup within the creature, and that worries him a lot. The levels just keep rising without any end it seems. I have to do something or I'm going to die as well as Hiromi. Naruto has a sudden moment of clarity. He remembers back to why they are attacking him. His name is Nidame Rikidm Senen. He has more abilities than just dodging. Shinra Tensei. Ultima weapon is blasted back, but surges at two even higher levels which negates the attack. Naruto tries his gravity manipulation, but the demon only increases him again and again. Every time he tries something, the creature just ups the amount of. Naruto now sports a multitude of gashes and is on his knees, completely out of chakra. The only chakra left in his system is just barely enough to survive on. Naruto raises his head, one eye closed to keep the blood running down his face out of it, and sees the monstrosity standing right above him. He feels all the buildings within the creature pull from its body and into the sword. More specifically the point of the blade. Naruto lowers his head and resigns himself to his fate. I'm sorry Hiromi, Kikbi. I wasn't good enough. The beast raises the blade and thrusts down at the immobile Naruto. Suddenly a translucent barrier is erected around Naruto, blocking the strike and the subsequent explosion. Naruto looks up at feeling the ground quake, but he is completely unharmed. He hears something beside him and looks to see a light blue rabbit-like creature with a large ruby in its forehead beside him. Do not be afraid. You have done well and Kami is pleased with your progress. Please sit back and let us deal with the demons it squeaks in a surprisingly high-pitched voice. But Hiromi and Kikbi. They also have a barrier over them. It would take both Cerberus and Ultima together to break my barriers, and Bahamut isn't going to let that happen. By the way, you may call me Carbuncle. Bahamut. Another like me. He is the king of the dragons, the god to you. Fiance. Right now he is circling overhead and waiting. Or not. The large white beam suddenly strikes the ground near the barrier, throwing the now dubbed Ultima away from the barrier it had been trying to get through with no success. However, the demon gets back up and attacks again. Another large blast, this time striking the demon right on the chest. It blows a large hole through it. It is so large that Naruto can't see all the way through the demon's chest cavity. The heart, lungs, ribs, aorta are gone, evaporated. But the beast gets back up. That is Ultima Weapon, a crazed demon with no upper brain functions. It acts entirely off of instinct and instinct alone. It only listens to Lucifer because its survival instincts tell it to. You did well to last as long as you did against an enemy that would have killed Kikbi. Suddenly Cerberus appears next to Ultima Weapon and holds it back from attacking yet again. We are retreating. We cannot defeat Bahamut if he stays in the air. And there may be more. An enormous pool of water blacker than utter darkness appears, and the two demons descend into it and disappear into it. As soon as the demons are out of sight, the portal closes and they are gone. For a while, all is quiet. It pressed on the ears of everyone in Kanoha who was listening to the battle. That is until Naruto asks Carbuncle to lower the barrier so he can check on Hiromi and Kikbi. He gathers Hiromi up gently, very aware of her broken arm, and limps towards the direction that Cerberus came from. Carbuncle silently follows, knowing what the half-demon will find. Hijbi. Naruto creates a clone and hands Hiromi off to the clone and hurries over to Kikbi. The red fur is slick and wet with her own blood, and blood is starting to pool around her. Naruto almost flies across the ground to get to her. He gets right beside her enormous face and starts to touch her. Kikbi-chan. He shouts over and over again. 
Her breath is shallow and labored, her throat is torn and freely bleeding, as well as her back and shoulders. Come on Kikbi Chan. You promise not to leave me. You can't die now. You can't. From the haziness in her head, Kikbi hears Naruto call for her. Relief spreads throughout her body. She didn't fail him. He is alive and that is all that matters. For Naruto, relief spreads through him when Kikbi opens one eye and looks at him. She is surprised to see him bleeding as bad as he is and so concerned about her. That's Naruto for you. Kikbi Chan, I need you to change into your human form so I can carry you. I'm almost out of chakra and can't manipulate gravity right now. Kikbi hears him, but she is so tired. All she wants to do is to go to sleep. She closes her eyes, but Naruto's voice keeps at her. Come on Kikbi Chan. You have to help me. Please. The desperation in his voice calls out to her. I will not disappoint him. I have a promise to keep. Kikbi slowly shrinks into her human form. Naruto instantly is hugging her and holding her. He is on his feet and sprinting in the direction of Konoha when a dragon larger than Hiromi lands in front of him. The scales are pitch black scales, with wings double the span of Hiromi's. The neck is very long, longer than the Hokage Tower is tall, and a long snout that matches the rest of the body. I am Bahamut, king of the dragons and overlord of the skies. I see you have one of my kin with you. Naruto looks up to the giant dragon and nods. Yes, but we don't have time for pleasantries. Kikbi is bleeding out and she needs help. Not to mention Hiromi needs attention too. Bahamut growls at being dismissed. And why should I not crush you for your insolence, boy? Naruto rolls his eyes. Either help or get out of my way. To make his point, Naruto starts to walk past the dragon. Said dragon seeds at being ignored, but a look from Carbuncle prevents him from doing anything rash. Fine. Hop on boy and I will take you into the village. Naruto doesn't wait for the testy dragon to change his mind. He gets on along with his clone and holds on while the dragon rises up into the air. Head for the Hokage Tower. Bachan can help her. Bahamut is about to make a remark about being told what to do when another look by the stowaway carbuncle stops him. A short few seconds later, Bahamut awkwardly lands right outside the tower. Naruto, being close enough, jumps from the back of the dragon through the window and into the office. Bachan. Kayubi needs help quickly. Only then does he notice that the room is filled with people. Naruto. What happened to your eyes? 4. Chapter 9. The truth of it all. Naruto. What happened to your eyes? Naruto blinks. Standing in the office is a good portion of the rookie eight, i.e. Kiba, Ino, Shikamaru, Shino, and Sakura, along with the remaining conscious Yinch Kriki, Akagara, Yujido, FK, and Karabi, and lastly Jiraiya. And did you just say Kikbi? Naruto shakes his head and moves past them. He doesn't have time for this. The Jinch Kriki all raise their eyebrows as they can feel the withinness of the woman Naruto is carrying, as low as the levels may be. He blatantly ignores the shocked looks of his fellow Leaf Shinobi and the very hurt and confused look FK is giving him. Bachan. Tsunade, who was in some kind of stupor, comes back to life and sees a very injured Kikbi who is on her last rope. Tsunade snatches Kikbi from Naruto and clears her desk of all papers with one sweep of her arm. Shizun. The dark-haired woman bursts into the office and is shocked by what she sees. Being Tsunade's assistant and a big sister to Naruto before Sakura broke him, she is privy to just who the retreat in Tsunade's desk is. She immediately goes into action and starts repairing tissue, while Tsunade starts scanning for internal injuries and other things that aren't so obvious. The males in the room all notice just how beautiful the woman is. Luckily Kikbi had thought of clothes when she changed back into her human form. Tsunade Sama, can I be of assistance? A timid Sakura asks. She approaches the desk and activates a scanning when the harshest look Tsunade has ever given someone stops her dead in her tracks. You will not come near her. Sakura, as well as the others in the room, minus Yujido, are all taken aback by Tsunade's hostility. Once Sakura backs up, Tsunade resumes her work. After ten agonizing minutes and several blood pills, Tsunade declares Kikbi stable enough to be moved to the emergency room. Shizun picks up Kikbi gingerly and Sunshine to the hospital to prepare an operating room. Tsunade walks over to Naruto and places a hand on his shoulder, making him jump in surprise. Go home Naruto. Get some rest. I'll take Hiromi to the hospital and make sure she gets help too. Naruto looks at her. I can't do that. I have to go with you. I have to see if she is going to be okay. Tsunade smiles and places both hands on his shoulders. She'll be fine, thanks to you. Five minutes lower getting her to us and there would be nothing we could have done. Go home and rest. I'll page you as soon as we are out of surgery. Naruto is about to argue, but Tsunade cuts him off. Don't make me order you. The blonde male fixes Tsunade with a harsh glare. I don't care if you ordered the entire village to stop me. Nothing would keep me from being there with them. Tsunade sighs and should have known that he would say something like that. Fine but go home and shower and change first. I will not have my hospital smelling like burnt fish. Naruto gives her a small smile and hugs her briefly. 
He then looks around the room before locating Yujito. With a very subtle movement of his head, he inclines for her to follow. Most see it but don't know what it is for. Then he actually leaves using the door. He leaves calmly but swiftly, leaving a mostly stunned crowd. Tsunade rubs her temples for a second before returning to the assembled crowd. Alright, secure the village. Jinch Kriki, you are to stay together and in the center of the village, unless otherwise directed by me only. With Akatsuki still out there, we must ensure your safety. Sakura, Hinata, Ino, and Jurei are to go out and capture and reseal the Sanbi, while it is still close. If we hurry, we can have eight of the nine bidge here and all together, and protect them from Akatsuki. But the chorus of affirmatives, Tsunade collects Hiromi from the clone and takes off for the hospital. As soon as Tsunade is gone, the rookie nine start to talk between themselves about what they just saw. Sakura, Ino, and Hinata. Follow me. You all have the highest chakra control here and are the best suited for a ceiling. Last we heard, the Sanbi was headed east back towards Kiri. We will follow it and seal it inside a kunai made of chakra-enhancing metal. Let's move out. The four of them leave the room. The other Nanjinch Kriki also take the time to leave, never having stopped talking about what Naruto said and his appearance. Yujito uses the commotion to discreetly create a clone and shunshin out the window at the same time. Naruto exits the building and is immediately accosted by an irate dragon god. We must speak, boy. Naruto shakes his head. I'm sorry but I can't right now. My fiancé is wounded and I must see them. After they are better we can talk. Snarls, torrents of black smog issuing from his nostrils. However, Carbuncle bounces from Baphomet's back and onto his snout, drawing the attention of both. That is fine. Tend to your mates but do not take too long. The fate of the entire universe is at stake here and you are the hinge pin on which everything rests. Once you are ready, summon us by calling our names. Ahmed growls in annoyance at being at the beck and call of a human, but stows his opinions. Naruto watches as the dragon takes off and soars into the sky and ultimately disappears into the ever-darkening clouds. Naruto reaches his house surprisingly calmly or just highly focused. He walks in the door and before he closes the door, Yujito is standing in front of him. She gives a curt nod of her head to him before speaking. He, however, notices that she seems to be fidgety. What can I do for you master? Naruto looks at her for a second before answering. Do you have a cloaking jinjutsu? Yujito nods. How good is it? Yujito is kind of thrown off by the question. Well, if I suppress my chakra output to a minimum level, then the only way to detect me is to bump into me unless someone is a very detailed sensor. I can still be detected by smell and sound though. Naruto nods. Good. I want you to stand watch over the fiancé that I am not currently with. I'll go and wait for Kikbi to get out of surgery, so you will be with Hiromi. I'll come and spend some time with her once she wakes up and then you'll switch to Kikbi until she is able to defend herself. I don't want people to get an idea that they can harm my fiancé. I won't allow that to happen. Deadly force is authorized but try to apprehend first. Yujito nods in understanding, but it is awkward due to her rubbing her legs together. Is there something that matters? Yujito blushes in embarrassment of getting caught by her master, but she tries to play it off. It is nothing like Naruto-sama. However, Naruto doesn't buy it. Don't make me order you to tell me. Yujito flushes again. She turns her head away from him and answers. Kentucky. Kikbi-sama hasn't been able to administer her. Treatment. I tried to hold on, but my body is reacting on its own. I usually get three a week and it has been five days, she pleads desperately. She looks down in shame as her body continues to try to rub anything to get pleasure. The wide-eyed Naruto forms an O with his mouth in understanding. Take off your pants. Ijito's head snaps up so fast Naruto is afraid she has whiplash. M Master. The blushing Naruto at what he is about to do but commands himself to continue. You heard me. I will be. Assisting you in Kikbi's stead. Ujido hears the finality in his voice and slowly slides her pants down and then her underwear. Naruto, being the gentleman he is, turns around and remembers something. He follows Kikbi's advice to get a towel beforehand and have it underneath Ujido's. He blushes at the thought. He takes a deep breath. This is the first time he is going to have any experience with this kind of thing. After taking a few calming breaths, he sits on the couch and motions for Ujido to join him. She awkwardly shuffles over to him, having her pants around her ankles and completely exposed to one of her masters. Eventually Yujito gets to her master on the couch and he directs her to sit on his lap. He places the towel on his lap just as she is sitting. Now lean back. I don't have much experience with this, but Kikbi taught me the theoretical knowledge for the technique, he says while blushing. With trembling hands, Naruto moves his left arm around and takes in a deep breath before placing a hand on her core. He only has a basic idea because Kikbi thought it was a good idea to teach him. He starts by gently rubbing up and down the sensitive folds, getting a whimper from Yujito. He goes slightly faster and presses his finger harder, making Yujito putty in his arms. 
His confidence rises as Yujito's moans get louder and louder, confirming that he is doing it right. He finally feels confident enough to do something else when Yujito bucks her hips into his finger. Yujito cries out in pleasure as Naruto slips a finger into her now dripping core. Naruto makes a sawing motion with his hand and adds another finger. Yujito plants her feet and bounces on his finger in an attempt to increase her pleasure. After a minute, Naruto makes a discovery. A tiny nub on the outside of the vagina that makes her quiver every time he brushes it. So what does a curious guy do? He messes with it. He takes his other hand and rubs the nub between his forefinger and thumb, all the while never stopping his hand that is pumping into her. Yujito shudders. Her mouth is open and her tongue hanging out the side and panting like a dog. This would be quite the insult to her if she actually cared at the moment. And now for the finish. Naruto adds chakra to his fingers on both hands. The chakra spreads into her nerves at an astounding rate and makes them all fire at dizzying speeds. Yujito's eyes widen and she shrieks as her pleasure increases a hundredfold. Naruto's fingers are ejected from Yujito's honey pot as she orgasms and squirts all over the towel. Yujito slumps over, breathing heavily and heavily fogged, and clings to the side of the couch. Her body continues to shiver and shake as her body rides out her orgasm. It was the best orgasm she has ever had, even better than what her female master does. For Naruto, he is now very glad that Kikbi gave him advice to use a towel when helping Yujito. She said that Yujito was a gusher, but he didn't know what that meant before. He gets up to put the towel in a hamper and wash his hands when a slender hand reaches out and very lightly grabs his wrist. D.H. Thank you master, she breathes out. Naruto gives her a sad smile. No problem. When you have recovered and washed up, head over to the hospital, but don't let anyone know you aren't with the other Jinch Kriki. Naruto sets out to put the towel in a hamper and curses. His pants are very uncomfortably tight. When he reaches his room he strips and is unsure what to do about his wings. That is remedied after a bright flash of light from his body, and suddenly Naruto is holding the sword again, his wings gone. One thing less to worry about. After a quick shower, Naruto starts to get dressed and notices that his armor, or at least his chest plate, is gone. This is going to be a problem. Not really Master Naruto. Naruto jumps. What have I told you about that? He angrily thinks to the spirit of the armor. I am sorry Master Naruto. You may collect me from the heavenly realm. When the sword stabbed you, I could do nothing about it. It went right through the chakra shield and metal. I was transported to the heavenly realm after that. I have no idea how you got to this realm, but I was assured that you would be here soon. Great. I guess I'll have to worry about it later. Naruto showers with cold water, then finishes dressing and calmly walks out the door and out of his compound to the hospital, sword in hand. It takes 10 minutes but he gets there. He walks up to the nurse's station and asks for the operating room Tsunade is in. Naruto had to pull rank and tell her that Tsunade is operating on his fiancé to get to tell him, but a few short minutes later, he is sitting outside the operating room. Hours later, Naruto is awoken by Shizune softly nudging him. Naruto-chan, Kayu is fine and resting. We put her and Hiromi in the same room. Unfortunately we don't have a clue as to dragon physiology so we can't heal her. The most we can do is make her comfortable until she wakes and can go back to her own village to get treatment. Naruto yawns and stands. Thanks Ni-chan. I'll go and sit in their room. Shizum smiles and directs him to a room on the second floor near the emergency stairs. He enters the room and fights a grimace. Pikby is wrapped up in so many bandages that the only real identifying feature is her hair, but even parts of it have been shaved and all of it cut to neck length. She has a breathing tube as well as an IV in her arm. Hiromi on the other hand just has her arm in a sling and propped up with several pillows. Naruto's heart sinks at the sight. How did they both get almost killed and injured and I don't have a scratch on me? He pulls a chair from the side and puts it so he can sit in between their beds. He reaches over and gently rubs the back of Kikbi's left hand and a silent tear falls from his eyes. I failed you both. If I had only been stronger. Several hours later, Naruto is awake but just barely. His head keeps nodding forward and starts to doze, then jerks up again. Cycle repeats. From the corner, Yujito frowns. She wishes she had someone to dote over her like he is over the two unearthly beautiful women. She feels a longing to feel loved and needed and someone to tell her that she is perfect in every way, someone to hold her clothes and whisper sweet nothings into her ear. The door silently opens. Yujito's eyes are immediately fixed to the person entering. She prepares to defend her masters against all threats. The nurse opens the door very quietly and steps in. She immediately sees Naruto nodding off and moves as silently as she can. She grabs the charts on the end of the bed and examines it for a few seconds. She then moves to Kikbi's right side and touches her wrist and watches the clock. Satisfied, the nurse puts something down on the chart. After a few looks at Kikbi and several more written notes, the nurse puts the chart back on the bed. She went over and did the same to Hiromi. Satisfied, the nurse leaves the room, allowing Yujito to relax her grip from her kunai. 
Outside the door, the nurse grimaces. One guard inside along the wall near the window. High amount of chakra, female, adept in Jinjutsu. This is going to make things difficult. As the nurse walks down the hall, she seemingly disappears into the floor, nobody noticing a thing. An hour later, Naruto is awoken by a yawn. He clearly opens his eyes and sees Hiromi yawning and trying to stretch. Hiromi-chan. The dragon whips her head to the side, happy at whose voice it is, and confused at the defeated tone. What's wrong? Naruto just shakes his head. Nothing. I'm just glad you're alright. Hiromi smiles and motions with her good arm for Naruto to come closer. When he does, she pulls him closer with strength that one wouldn't associate with a woman. She crushes her lips against his. The heated kiss doesn't last long. Don't hold it in. Tell me. Naruto struggles to voice his thoughts. I I feel. I feel like. Like I failed you both. Hiromi is about to argue when he continues. I trained for this and when push came to shove, I couldn't keep either of you safe. Naruto, you did just fine. Sure we got hurt but it wasn't your fault. We were facing demons, beings created from the Jibai's own centuries ago. But I wasn't strong enough. If I had only trained harder, Kikbi wouldn't have been wrapped up like a mummy with a machine to breathe for her, and you wouldn't have gotten your wings. Arm. Hurt when you tried to protect me from the fall. I have to get stronger to protect you. Hiromi gently takes Naruto's face in her good hand and looks directly into his purple eyes. Don't ever say that. You have done your best and did better than any human could ever hope for against demons. And as romantic as it is to have someone protect you all the time, Kikbi and I are not brittle. We are made for this kind of thing. Yes we got injured, but we will live and grow stronger because of it. So don't go on a guilt trip when there is no cause for it. Naruto looks at the floor. He heard Hiromi's words, but for the life of him, he can't get the feeling of letting them down out of him. Then he feels Hiromi's hand lift his face to look at her. We are not going to break over something like this. You don't have to act like we are, though most of the time it is rather sweet of you. But now is not one of those times. Hiromi lowers her head for a second before looking back. I hate to do this, but I have to go back to my realm. I need to get my wings set and healed. Your medical staff is good, but they are neither equipped nor knowledgeable enough to treat a dragon. I understand. Hiromi scowls at his still downtrodden look and tone of voice. Using her massive strength, she hauls him onto the bed and onto her lap. Hiromi holds him to her, careful to avoid her arm, as she just allows Naruto to be close. She breathes in his scent and relaxes herself, even as he is too stunned to return the hug. Her good hand absentmindedly strokes his hair. I would rather stay here with you, but I cannot. I would be back as soon as I am able to. She gives him another kiss, this time tender and loving. She looks directly into his eyes, amber gold meets bland blue. I love you, remember that. But the puff, Hiromi goes back to her realm, leaving Naruto alone with his thoughts. Said blonde, being the devoted person he is, goes back to watching over Kikbi. Hours pass and Naruto ends up sleeping with his hand in hers, with his forehead resting on the edge of her bed. This is the scene that Tsunade walked into. She smiles at the sight, though she notices that Hiromi is gone, probably back to the summoned realm to get healed properly. Tsunade is very careful not to wake Naruto and goes through her checkup on Kikbi. All is looking well. Her injuries are healing at a more rapid pace than before due to her replenishing. It will still be some time before she is completely healed, probably within a week, but it is still many times faster than any human, Jinch Kriki included, can do. Tsunade flips through hand seals and runs her glowing hands over Kikbi's chest. With a nod Tsunade's hand stopped glowing purple and grabs the respirator tube and gently pulls it out of Kikbi's throat. Tsunade holds her breath, hoping that the bitch would breathe on her own. And to her great relief, she does. Next Tsunade checks the bite marks and gashes. Most are either completely healed or close to it. So she cuts the bandages and removes them, pulling them from under the bitch in human form. Soon, Kikbi's skin once again is visible with only a little reddening of the skin due to the recent healing. With a quick flash of a pen, Tsunade updates Kikbi's chart and writes for the respirator to be taken out when the next nurse comes to check up on them and to get her washed to get the residue of the ointment and bandages off her skin. With her checkup complete, she takes the time to run a few over Naruto who had yet to get one. The worst of his injuries seems to be a few gashes and cuts that are already healing at a fairly high pace. In 12 hours or so, they should be finished. Tsunade takes a moment to watch them. Him. He has come so far in a short amount of time. A proud smile creeps on her face as she watches. She is more proud of him than he will ever know. She ruffles his hair in a motherly way, takes one more look as if embedding it into her memory, and then leaves them be. She never notices the extra pair of eyes on her the whole time, ready to pounce and protect her masters. Elsewhere, the kickbee and the dragon are both incapacitated, and the brat is too tired to do anything. Add to that the village is still in shambles from the invasion, and the shinobi are tired as well. Our targets are right there for the taking. No. We will not move to Kanoha. 
A stunned Zedu lets his shock show on his face. And why the fuck not? The dark Zedu roars out only for his white counterpart to slap his hand over his mouth, but the black Zedu fights him off. We risk our lives to get intel on them, months of planning and even longer to set up this invasion, and for what? Just to sit back while eight of our nine targets are in the same place. Yes, eight. They were successful in retrieving the three tails and are on their way back. Eight. My whole life's mission is right in front of me, and you expect me to sit back. Suddenly both Zedu are flung back against a wall, a strong hand grasping their throat with two angry men Jekyo Sharingan spinning madly. I expect you to follow orders. The demons change everything. They already made it clear that if they see me, they will try to take me out on sight. But more than that, they are watching Kanoha. If we try to attack now, they will just come back and wipe us all out at the same time. And with Lucifer watching Kanoha, so is Kami and her forces, or did you miss the giant fucking dragon that obliterated their forces with a few blasts? Madara throws Zedu into another wall where he is embedded into said wall. Zedu watches with blurry vision as Madara approaches him while upside down, Sharingan still spinning wildly. A horrifying vision of someone who wouldn't think twice about killing you to be sure. The dynamics of the game have changed. We will wait and find out who makes the first move, and then, we will make our move. I do not require your understanding, just your abilities. Do I make myself clear? Time skip 4 hours, Naruto is tired. Really tired. The sleep he got isn't the most restful he ever had, and add to the position he slept in on multiple occasions, his neck and body is creaky and sore. However, despite all of the reasons to be tired, he finds even more reasons to be awake. Like the fingers running through his hair. Naruto opens his eyes with a groan and lifts his head to see a smiling Kikbi moving her fingers through his hair. Good morning handsome. Kikbi chan Kikbi giggles. Who were you expecting? Naruto doesn't even answer, only launches himself at her. Kikbi is a little stunned at the sudden action, but welcomes it all the same. She holds Naruto to her as he lets out all his pent-up emotions all at once. His walls break down and he vents, to which she is more than happy to be used as a sponge. His barriers had started to creep up, blocking out emotions when he first saw their broken bodies. Then they rose even higher with Hiromi's leaving. But when he saw Kikbi up and talking and smiling, the walls couldn't hold the joy he felt, and they crumbled. I'm okay Narukun. I promise. True to her words, she is bandages free. But the sight of her only a few hours ago being completely covered in bandages and needed a respirator makes it very hard to believe. Believe it or not, but I've had worse. Cerberus is a nasty demon who I've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with several times. Last time I nearly castrated him if not for his underlings coming to his rescue. But you almost died. How can you be so casual about that? I had to carry you to Bachan so she could heal you. I, Naruto gets too choked up and Kikbi realizes her mistake. Before when she faced dangerous opponents, to her, she didn't have anyone waiting for her, no one to care about her well-being. But now she does and that person was forced to carry her battered and broken body toward safety, all the while not knowing if she would survive. I'm sorry about that. I've never had one. She stops, realizing that she is about to try to make an excuse. I can't guarantee that I won't get hurt again, but I promise to do my best to not put you in that situation ever again. Naruto looks like he wants to argue, but decides to drop it. They sit there on the tiny medical bed, cuddled against each other for a while. Where is Rick-chan? Naruto's face falls a bit. She had to go back to get healed properly. Her wing was cut by that monster as she was flying, and she landed on it to protect me from getting hurt. Hikbi can tell that Naruto is blaming himself. She holds him tighter to herself. Naruto, that demon's name is Ultima Weapon. It is a demon that in terms of raw power exceeds my own. The only way I could win against it is to outsmart it. Until you gain control over the demonic, you won't stand a chance against it. That is something Naruto knows only too well. That feeling of helplessness as the beast took everything he had and just kept coming like it was nothing. He never wants to experience that again. I'll get stronger. I have to. The cold knot forms in Kikbi's stomach. What are you talking about? You don't need to. Yes I do. The sharpness of his words stuns her. I couldn't do anything. My best, even the holy, didn't even scratch it. I couldn't protect Hiromi and I couldn't protect you. I'll get stronger so you don't have to fight. Are you even listening to yourself? Kikbi bellows, interrupting him mid-rant. Do you hear the nonsense you are sprouting? You are a human, albeit the strongest human living right now, but a human no less. I am a bijk, created from the Jkbai's own and second only to Lucifer in terms of both power and intellect. If I wanted to, you would have nothing to crush even with your holy. So don't spout this I have to protect you shit. I'm not a delicate flower. I am a fucking bijk, born to fight and protect humans from the likes of the demons. I have lived for centuries and let me tell you. You have no idea what demons are capable of. You haven't even scratched the surface. Lucifer could look at you and you would die. As Kikbi berates him, his feelings get lower and lower. 
he cringes at her words, the sharpness of her tongue. But one emotion overpowers his feeling of uselessness. So what would you have me do? Just roll over and play dead? He asks heatedly. Inwardly Kikbi smirks. Her words riled Naruto out of his pity party and got him to open his mind up. No. You train and get stronger so that one day we can take them on. Naruto shakes his head. So what is the difference between what you just said and what I said? Kikbi looks him straight in the eyes. The intent. Now Naruto is thoroughly confused. If you train just to get stronger to keep Hiromi and I on the sidelines, then you will distance yourself from us and your friends. You would be no better than the emotionless shell you were before. No scratch that. It would be worse than you being emotionless because we know how you feel about us, but purposefully keeping us away anyways. How do you think that would make us feel? But if you get stronger to fight the demons by accepting help from us, you will allow us to help you get even stronger than you can by yourself. We can do this far easier with three of us than you taking the burden all on your shoulders. We can train together and grow closer on top of getting stronger. And besides, Hiromi and I are tough and we can take a lot of punishment. So don't worry so much about us. We would be fine. Before Naruto can answer, the door opens, revealing Tsunade. She looks surprised to see Naruto in Kikbi's lap, but it doesn't last for long. I'm glad to see you two up and talking. Now that you are feeling better maybe you can tell me what the hell happened. The two stumble for adequate words to describe what had happened. The demons were. They were after me. Tsunade looks surprised. Of all the answers, that wasn't one of them. Explain. Naruto opens his mouth, but Kikbi stops him. What Naruto means is that they fear what he can become. He is the second coming of the Rikid Msenin. When the sage pulled the Jikbai into himself, it gave him total control over the demonic, and the demons all feared him for it. When he died, they all rejoiced and would have danced on his grave if they could have because they were free to do what they wished once more. Now when we were in Kiri, the demon I ripped apart was sent back to hell and put back together who in turn told Lucifer that Naruto has the Rinnegan and is rapidly getting stronger. Lucifer, the strongest demon ever, seeks to cut him off before he can be able to control the demons. Even I don't come close to Lucifer's strength. It would take Nanabi, Hachibi, and myself to take him on, and even then it would be close. So what tomb activates your control over? Naruto scowls slightly. The very last one and there are still two more to go before that. Tsunade purses her lips. So where is the next one? Naruto looks at Kikbi as if confirming something before looking back at Tsunade. We think that they are in Awagakur and Kumagakur. So far the tombs have been at the sites of the major villages and correspond with the element. Fire country for fire, wind country for wind, and so forth. Tsunade scowls. If you are right, the one in Iwa could be very difficult. However, we could use the fact that we have the Tsuchikage in our holding cells to our advantage. I wouldn't do that, Haim. The four occupants in the room turn to look at Jurea's form slipping through the window. His clothes are torn and sopping wet, and he looks dead tired. He tosses something at Tsunade who catches it out of instinct. Don't tell me. Yup. You are holding the most expensive and sought-after kunai in the entire elemental nations. And that kunai is the Sambi. Oh come on. Don't give me that look. It is not going to break just by touching it. You can even use it as a norm. Ureya is forced to jump out the window to avoid being skewered by the very same kunai. You're an idiot, you know that. Ureya shrugs and pockets the kunai after he pulls it out of the wall and looks to his pupil and sees how he and his foxy lady are both squashed onto the tiny bed. He suddenly gets a perverted grin on his face. We weren't interrupting anything were we? Hickby fixes him with a deadly glare. Jurea, do I need to put you in your place again? Hickby had caught Jurea peeping on her a week after she had been released. That hadn't ended well for the self-proclaimed super pervert. Kikbi nearly castrated him and surprised them all by claiming that Naruto only had the right to look at her naked. That had gotten the ball rolling on her trying to bag and tag Naruto. Jurea waves her off. Ma, give me a break. I just sealed the Sanbi and it is a little worn out right now. I divert to my more rudimentary trains of thought while tired of running low on sleep. Tsunade restrains herself from wiping Jurea off the face of the planet. What were you saying you perv? And you better hurry. I'm not sure I can keep my fist from launching you into orbit for much longer. Jurea wisely decides to get serious. As I was saying, I wouldn't use leverage for sparing Lenoki's life as a way to get Naruto into Iowa. As soon as he steps foot within Tsuchi no Kuni he will be swarmed by Iwa Ninja, just wanting to get a bit of revenge for their humiliating defeat by Naruto's old man, Cage or no Cage telling them otherwise. Not only did he single-handedly win the war for us, he also secured us a third of Iwa's B through S rank missions. After the war, Iwa went into a sharp decline for a number of years. It wasn't until Kikbi's attack did Iwa start recovering as Konoha wasn't able to fulfill those extra missions. They all are silent to contemplate Jurea's words. Then I will parade him in. Three pairs of eyes fix Kikbi with varying emotions ranging from interest to curiosity to outright worry. The room is silent, waiting for Kikbi to elaborate. 
we know that the one thing Iwan Inji respects above all above all else is power. If we make a grand show of parading not only their cage, but their Jinch Kriki as well they will be far less likely to attack. On top of that, if Naruto rides on my head, it will show that he has control of me or at least I am under his thumb. Though I personally prefer to be on top. Bigby trails off as if reminiscing. Naruto and Jiraiya sport identical nosebleeds and Tsunade sighs and gets everyone back on track. That's good in theory, but what about Akatsuki and the demons? I don't know why, but we caught a break as Akatsuki missed their opportunity to invade. I'm afraid that the second you step outside Konoha, the demons will attack again. Suddenly Naruto remembers something. Oh, that reminds me that the grumpy dragon and weird rabbit wanted to talk to me. They said something about me being a hinge pin for the universe. Bigby's eyes go wide. You. You talk to them. You talk to a guardian. Naruto gives her a confused look. Well duh. They have to tell me what they said. The dragon needs to get laid, but the rabbit is cool. Smack. Aka, speak with more respect. We are very fortunate that Kami sent them or we would all be dead. Kikbi berates her fiancé. Naruto rubs the spot where Kikbi hit him. Fine, jeez. Just stop hitting me. Bigby flashes Tsunade a victory sign he then goes back to running her hands through Naruto's hair. Silence ensues. So what now? All eyes for Tsunade. Said woman's eyes. I don't know. We need more information on everything before we make our move so for now, just focus on getting better. When you are feeling well enough, meet me at the tower to go over what we know and the clue to the next tomb. Naruto nods and has one more question. So how did we fare? Tsunade sighs again. All things considering, we did remarkably well. We faced down four cage, three jinch kriki, a half dozen hidden villages, a betrayal by Iwa, and a full-out assault by a demon army. We suffered roughly 40% losses, and most of that was against the Iwa ninjas that were inside the village. It was a good thing that the daimyo's personal guards and samurai division were here, or we might have lost containment on the situation. Right now all eyes are on us to see what we are going to do. I sure as hell won't be the one that pulls the trigger that sparks the fourth shinobi war, but I will demand reparations and restrictions. And they will agree because they can't risk war with three of the five great hidden villages when their own numbers in cage or gone are captured. We can use this to our advantage but not too much. We don't want to fan the flames even more. Oh and that reminds me. Naruto, you have a visitor. I'll tell her that she can come in now. Tsunade leaves the room while Naruto is confused. Jiraiya takes the opportunity to leave and get some sleep. In his trying to figure out who is visiting, Naruto takes notice of Kikbi's hair. Or the lack thereof. Her gorgeous hair that once went past her knees is now uneven and cut very badly. Hi Chan. Your hair. Rather startled by the suddenness of Naruto bringing her attention to her hair, she has Naruto make a mirror out of water and suspend that mirror right in front of her. She takes in her hair being cut. Do you like it better short or long? Naruto starts. He hadn't expected her to ask his opinion on her hair. He had expected her to lose it and rampage or at least comment about how long it took to grow it out. But she doesn't even think twice about changing. Uh. I'm not sure. It is. A choppy right now, he stutters out. He is completely out of his element with this topic having never thought about a hairstyle for him much less gone to a barber shop. He didn't trust people with sharp objects around him. Bigby however takes it in stride. Right before Naruto's eyes, her hair cleans itself, fixing all the uneven ends, the choppy job, probably with a kunai. Her bangs shorten, and the back seems to curl itself against her neck. Naruto's voice catches in his throat. She looks hot. Bigby giggles at Naruto's stunned but odd face. I take it you like it. Naruto can only nod dumbly. Good. Now that I'm feeling better, we can. Catch up. The blood in Naruto's body for the first time flows in the proper direction when aroused. Kikbi grins victoriously as she claims Naruto's mouth. At first they are tender, gentle. But slowly they grow more heated and passionate. Soon their tongues are battling each other with everything they have, making them groan. Buham, Naruto and Kikbi turn and glare at the interruption, but Naruto starts. Standing in front of him is Mei, the last person he ever expected to be in Konoha. Uh. Hi. It didn't take a genius to see that Mei is a nervous wreck, despite just defeating a Jinch Kriki not a few days ago. Mei here came and defeated Yugura at the south gate and saved FK2. And just so you know Naruto, your friends have been asking to see you, but I'm keeping them away for now. Many of them saw your eyes. We will have to announce your jutsu to the village and world. Naruto groans. Damn it. Why can't people just mind their own business? It isn't like I've got time to just sit and talk to anyone and everyone. Naruto takes a deep breath and calms down. It helps the Kikbi is rubbing his back soothingly. I would rather just gather them together and explain it then. I don't want my jutsu getting out just yet. I'm pretty sure that Akatsuki doesn't know about my eyes just yet and I'd rather keep it that way. Whatever kid. It's your call. Just don't wait too long. 
I'm getting tired of being pestered, Tsumidi says wearily. As Tsumidi leaves, Naruto turns his attention to Mei. So what are you doing here Mei? What happened after you left for the resistance? Aridid finds a chair. Well, I met up with the resistance a few days after I abandoned the Mizukage. They were very suspicious of me, but it helped that I had a tactical analysis of Kiri, as well as current troop numbers and guard rotations with me. I was relocated to menial tasks such as repairing buildings and walls with my Keke Genkai. After a few weeks of that, I joined a battle group. We fought a few battles, all were successful, since the loyalists had nothing to counter my lava and boil. They started to trust me more and I moved up to squad leader. One day I was brought to the war room. There I was told that they had received intelligence that Yagura had left the village with a large number of shinobi and headed out of Mizu no Kuni. At first the commander didn't believe the reports, but it was confirmed by several others within the village itself. They asked for opinions on the easiest way into the village, and I gave them the Anbu entrances and the locations of the Anbu headquarters, barracks, and armories. The commander wanted to take advantage of the situation immediately and ordered an all-out assault on Kiri. When I asked where Yagura went, I was told that Yagura was headed for Fire County. I put some things together and figured that Yagura was invading. I knew that Yagura didn't have enough shinobi with him to conquer Konoha, so he must have reinforcements. I begged the commander to let me go and help Konoha. At first he wouldn't let me but I kept at it, eventually saying that the reason I defected was because of a Konoha shinobi and that it was you who gave me the tactical analysis of Kirin and the surrounding areas. He eventually gave in under the condition that I would stay here and be the liaison for the new Mizukage. I accepted and hauled ass to get here and arrive just as he was about to kill FK. I sent FK inside the walls. Yugura. He. He told me he loved me, and that is why he didn't kill me. Mei froze into silence, clearly still disturbed by what he said. Mei, said woman looks up. Forget about what he said. Love doesn't come from just knowing or seeing someone. Loving someone means accepting someone completely, even if they have bad habits or things about them you don't like. It comes from knowing them and their likes, dislikes, beliefs, their favorite foods, what their hobbies are, what their dreams are. When I was sealed inside Naruto, I knew him like no one else. I saw his dreams, his need to be accepted, his drive to be Hokage. My heart bled for him when his heart was crushed by that bitch named Sakura. I know what he likes to eat, I know what his favorite colors are, I know he wants to meet his parents again, how he wants nothing more than to have a family. I know him inside out and I can say that I love him more than my life. Igura didn't love you. As far as I can tell, the most interaction he had with you was for missions and debriefs. You have a bloodline, he wages a war against bloodline users. He could never accept you fully. To say that he loved you is an affront to what real love is. So don't believe for a second that he truly loved you. Mei looks down while Naruto is read from her words about him. Needless to say that she was spot on with all of them. He thanks Kikbi-san. Anyways, I fought Yagura and killed the shinobi he brought with him. I ended up killing Yagura with my strongest technique and released the Sanbi. Luckily the demons decided to attack right then, so the Sanbi high-tailed it out of there. Or as fast a large hundred-foot turtle can. I was admitted to the hospital for minor burns, but it was easily healed. During treatment, I received a message from the commander. They have taken Kiri. The war is over. Naruto can see the relief spread through her body at that declaration. That secures my position here and is my first act as liaison, the new Mizukage wishes for a trade alliance with Hai no Kuni and possibly a military one with Konoha, should the village survive. So far as I know this village still stands. Naruto gets up and gives Mei a warm hug. He breaks away tactfully, not too short to be rude, but not long enough to show too much affection. He gently leads her by the arm to where Kikbi lays, and the Redeed gives her a hug too. Congratulations. What will you do now? Mei bites her lower lip, but decides the truth is the best. I partially came here to see Naruto again, and I had hoped that. That you could become involved with Nerukun. Kikbi finishes. Mei flinches and closes her eyes in preparation to be beaten down by the possessive Bijk. In the tomb near Kiri, she felt and saw just how protective and possessive Kikbi and Hiromi were of Naruto. But the hit never comes. She opens an eye to find Kikbi looking at her with an amused look. It just so happens that Nerukun has to marry three wives as he activates the craw. We need a third and you would be nice as we already know you and you know us. Mei's eyes water. You mean. You mean I have a shot. Kikbi nods and suddenly finds herself wrapped in a hug from a tearful Mei. Thank you, thank you, thank you, she chants as she hugs Kikbi. Said demon pats Mei's back and the emotional woman backs away. Kikbi then gets serious. Another reason is you also know that if you do anything to hurt him, your life is forfeit. Kikbi flowers and spikes her at Mei. Said woman pales considerably and nods rapidly. Naruto is silent the whole time, allowing Kikbi to do this. Really he doesn't care who it is just so long as he loves her, she loves him, and Kikbi and Hiromi approve. You know, news about you being out spread like wildfire. 
that draws both their attention sharply to May. All of the civilians were evacuated by the time the demons rolled around, so they didn't see you. The shinobi on the other hand. They said everything and the rumors were off. I suppose they are calling for Narukun in my head by now. May shakes her head. That's the interesting part. The shinobi on the newly sealed gate spread how you saved them from being crushed by those large things and how you defended the village. Most of the shinobi are re-evaluating what they think of you. The villagers don't believe a word of it though. Not surprising given the history of this place. And those yunch cricky. Most were talking between each other, but one green-haired girl. She had sort of an aura of death around her. Naruto starts. He had completely forgotten about FK. She had to have a lot of questions for him right now. However, FK is pretty low on his priorities right now. Thanks for telling us about Mei-san. You have given us foresight into problems that may arise in the future. Naruto creates a shadow clone. This clone will take you to my clan housing. I'm sure that Bachan will find more appropriate quarters for you soon, but the VIP hotel is probably gone, since it is very close to the Hokage Tower and the stadium, which is where most of the Iwa ninjas were when they attacked. If you don't mind, Kaiyu and I have some business with Bachan. Mei nods her understanding and follows the clone out of the window. As soon as she is gone, Naruto turns to Kikbi. Do you have the strength to stand and walk? Kikbi nods, though thoroughly confused. Yes, but what? Kuchius no jutsu. In front of Naruto stands two tiny dragons. Naruto opens Kikbi's chart and tears a couple pieces of paper and uses his fire manipulation to burn a message into them. He hands one to each dragon. Take this to Botch Anne and tell me what she thinks. He turns to the other dragon. Take this to Hiromi and wait for a response, then come back and tell me. Naruto. What are you doing? Naruto turns to Kikbi, a serious expression on his face. Tell me. Want to get married today? Kikbi's voice catches in her throat. W-H. What? Why this all of a sudden? Naruto climbs into the tiny bed with Kikbi again and puts his arm around her shoulder. You're being very affectionate today. She whispers though he hears it. In truth she loves it but would be a bad friend and lover if she ignored it. While he usually isn't the one to instigate contact, he doesn't shy away from it. But he is. I don't know. I just. I feel this. I need to marry you. Like urgently. I don't know how to explain it. It's like a hot iron in my chest that burns me when I don't think about marrying you or Hiromi as quickly as possible. When I do, it settles for just being warm. Pikby frowns. His urgency could be attributed to several things. First and the one she hopes is true. He could be afraid to have a repeat of the battle and is making the most of his time. Second. Kami could be manipulating him into speeding things up so she can meet him. Third. Someone is controlling his emotions for unknown reasons to hurry things along, like Lucifer to get him out of the village to kill him. The last two make her wary. She doesn't like her mate and soon-to-be husband to be manipulated at all, even if it is toward something that she wants personally. But she isn't self-absorbed enough to be ignorant just so she gets what she wants. But until there is more, all she can do is agree. Yes Naruto. I will marry you. But only if Rick-chan is able to. Naruto grins infectiously, something that he doesn't do enough. He moves to kiss her but a poof of smoke and one of the messenger dragons returns. The young red and golden dragon opens her mouth and out comes a piece of paper. Naruto grabs it and reads it. It's from Hiromi and she says she'll do it. She needs some time to get ready and says to summon her right before we do it. He turns to Kikbi to say something when the other dragon flies through the window. What did Bachan say? He asks immediately. Naruto waits for the messenger dragon to deliver the message when suddenly he finds himself buried into the wall. When he looks at the offender, he finds the dragon prostrating himself in submission. F forgive me Naruto-sama, but the Hokage said to hit you as hard as possible. Naruto grunts and pulls himself out of the wall. And you listen to her. The dragon has the decency to look embarrassed. W well, she promised me a free meal. Never mind. Along with a hit she says not to make rash decisions on the fly that concern her and I'm not going to do it now. I have the villagers railing for your execution and a third of the village destroyed. Naruto scowls. Fine. Go back to Botch Ann and tell her that my fiancés and I are going to meet with Kami's forces. When I come back, I will marry them even if I have to go to someone else. After giving her the message, go and tell Hiromi I will summon her in five minutes and not to dress for a wedding. The dragon nods and disappears. Naruto waits patiently for five minutes to pass. In the meantime, Kikbi, who has recovered enough to do so, changes into something a little more comfortable. Around her materializes a pair of skin-tight jeans along with a shirt that is far too small for her. The only question is if she is wearing any underwear under her jeans as she sure isn't under the shirt. All in all, Naruto likes Kikbi's new look. While her heart isn't quite as flowing, the new style frames her face better and is no less glossy and silky. Neither speak, both just preferring to keep the comfortable silence. 
That is, until the silence is broken by a summoning. When the smoke fades, a peeved Hiromi stands in the center of the room. She quickly looks at Naruto. Alright. What's going on? What a loaded question. Do you want the full version or the condensed version? Hiromi raises an eyebrow at her lover. Full. I'd rather not have any surprises later. Naruto nods and gives her just the short version of everything. Though she is a little upset that Caillou told me that she had a chance without talking to her first, she decides to leave it be for now. She also isn't happy that Tsunade wouldn't marry them right now, but understands as a fellow leader that she can't just drop everything for one person at the drop of a hat, especially whose village was just attacked. Hiromi decides to bring up a different issue. So what made you change your hair? She asks with genuine curiosity. Hikbi shrugs. It was already short from being cut from surgery. I could have made it go back to its original length, but I think Nerukun likes it this way. Hiromi raises an eyebrow at Naruto. It makes her unique. I think it works for her just like your hair works for you. Both of you are different and that's partially what I love about you both. Hiromi feels her face heat up at the words of encouragement and sees Kikbi's face do the same. Naruto opens his mouth when he spots something he should have before. Why isn't your arm in a sling anymore, Hiromi-chan? Said Dragon looks to her arm and remembers why. Well, the healers in my village came up with a new medical treatment. It combines healing, herbs, and a cast that encourages the healing of broken bones and other internal injuries. I have no idea how it works and I didn't even know about it until I got back. On a side note, Hitomi got Manda really well and is in the process of making me a purse out of his skin. Naruto grins at that. He felt so bad for Hitomi and is very glad she got that snake, literally, back. He walks over to Kayu and Hiromi and places a hand on each of their shoulders. However, he turns to look at the corner. Ijido, you are free to do what you wish for now. Just remember the things will not like the punishment Kayu and I will give you should you get captured. The blonde woman lets her Jinjutsu go and bows to both Kayu and Naruto. Of course masters. I will not fail you. And thank you, before leaving the three. Alright, let's get this show on the road. I'm not looking forward to this. In a flash, the three of them are gone Shunshin as a nurse comes in to check on them. Fields outside Kanoha. Hikbi turns to Naruto as soon as they arrive. Why did I smell her arousal when you commanded her? Naruto frowns. I don't know but I helped her with her. Addiction since you were incapacitated at the time. She said it had been a few days since her last. Hiromi looks confused but drops it while Kaiu scowls. That hussy. I treated her when I checked on her not two days before the fighting. I'll deal with her later. The three of them stand around. And wait. Awkwardly. So. What's happening? Hiromi voices nervously. Naruto scratches his head. Ah. The rabbit. Ow. And that prude of a ow. Stop hitting me. Thickby smirks which totally melts any sternness her glare holds. I will. When you start showing some respect. Naruto huffs and goes back to thinking. He said. Ah. Bahamut. Carbuncle. Hiromi's eyes go wide as the sky cracks with thunder and lightning. The clouds darken and blots out the sun as they start to swirl. Suddenly a large bolt of lightning strikes the ground, temporarily blinding them all. Standing before them is Bahamut, king of the dragons and unquestioned ruler of the skies. You have summoned me mortal. It is time to. The mighty dragon stops talking and looks intently to the ground. Kikbi and Naruto blink out the lights and follow the dragon's line of sight. Where Hiromi once stood is now the dragon woman on all fours, her head to the ground in submission and reverence. Bahamut scoffs and chuckles. Finally some damn respect. You mare eyes, Hiromi of the storm dragon. And the buxom blonde does just that, though she keeps her eyes to the ground. Thank you for your graciousness, my king. Naruto and Kikbi both raise a few eyebrows, while Bahamut nods in approval. I thought I was your king. Naruto says quietly though everyone hears him. In a flash, Naruto is decked and into the ground by Hiromi. Said dragon turns and bows again to the dragon. I apologize. Narukun is very young and has yet learned to respect his elders and betters. She then turns to Naruto and helps him out of the me-sized hole in the ground. She sets him down and she can almost see the tiny birds flying around his head. You are king of my heart but he is. You know. My king. Literally. He is not only my patron to Kami, but my progenitor of my species. Even the clan head must be approved by him. He was the one who originally forged the contract between the Yuzumaki and my people. So please show some respect. I don't want to have to pick up your ashes. Ah, it is about time. Kami was getting impatient and trust me when I say you don't want her in anything but a good mood. The three of them look to see the large blue-green rabbit with a large ruby in its forehead. So since we are all here, let's get a move on. Carbuncle's ruby flashes, widening out everything. When their vision comes back, they are standing in a large room with a lot of people standing in it. However, there is a dais and on that dais are four chairs, three of which are being sat in. Two women of impossible beauty on the left and a rather skinny-looking male just to their right. 
the first of the two women, the far left, stands, gathering their attention. Naruto is very surprised when, instead of a booming, all-powerful voice, she has a light and warming voice while still being authoritative at the same time. Welcome to Valhalla, throne of those who oversee everything. I am Asami, goddess of creation. Next is Kami, goddess of life. Next is Shinigami, the god of the dead. Kratos, the god of chaos and destruction, would be sitting here, but he is locked up. For the moment. Come. We have much to discuss. Out of nowhere, three chairs find themselves in existence at the bottom of the dais. Taking the cue, Naruto and his fiancée find their seats. Now, you have been summoned here, but first do you have any questions? The one known as Kami asks. I have one. The two fiancé of Naruto look at him in wonder. Apparently Naruto does have a limit to just how powerful a being has to be before giving respect. Who are all these people and why me? Asami smirks. I will get to the second one later but to answer your first questions. These are all deities and messengers or plain workers that help run Valhalla that have been created, conscripted, or asked to join over the many millennia we have existed. Each holds a different function. I have created Tsukiyomi, the deity of the moon. She traps the Jibai's body within the moon and keeps the moon separate from the earth, while Gaia is the mother of all things green and growing. There is also Aizanami, the deity of creation, i.e. birth and conception. Over there are Amaterasu, whose black flames purge all, and Susanoo is god of storms. They were created by Kratos to do his work for him. He never created more than two because he liked to do the destruction himself most of the time. Yomi and Saritahiko are the only ones that he made. Yomi ferries the souls to Shinigami, while Saritahiko guards the souls Shinigami hasn't gotten to yet. Amaterasu and Susanoo both answer to Shinigami as he is acting as the god of destruction. Hirkami. She has Ain no Yuzum, goddess of dawn, mirth and revelry, Aizanagi, and Inari, the deity of a lot of things. Any more questions? If not, let's get started. Surprisingly, Shinigami starts it off. I know you know this from the tombs, but I will go over it again in case you missed anything. Kratos along with the other gods and goddesses gave our power to Asami in the beginning. With our power, she was able to create the universe and everything within it. And thus we settled into our roles. Asami creates, Kami dictates, Kratos destroys and causes general mayhem, and I collect the souls when it is time to pass on or when Kratos has his. Fun. This system worked for a long while before Kratos became discontented with his current level of destruction. He craved more and caused more. Each day, I would have more souls come to me than the previous one. Something had to be done. Unknown to us though, he had already planned for this. He wished to destroy the universe, Asami's ultimate creation, her crowning achievement. He had sent down the Jibai and his deities to wreak as much havoc as possible, before turning his sights on a grander scale. Ami and Asami created and chose the Rikidm Senen to deal with the Jibai. When the creature was sealed and then split up, we turned our attention to Kratos. We tried to talk him down from the proverbial ledge, but he wouldn't have it. The fight broke out and it damn near destroyed the universe as he intended. Unable to defeat him, we settled for locking him away for all eternity. Should he escape, I'm not sure we can stop him a second time. This is where you come in. Naruto and company look at Kami. There is an anomaly within your timeline. A man has existed for far too long and has evaded Shinigami's agents for many decades. His name is Ichiha Madara and has one goal. To unite the Bij together and recreate the Jibai. He will then seal the newly reformed Jibai into himself and place the world under an enormous Jinjutsu, making himself ruler. This must not happen. Madara has no understanding of the Jibai and its powers. Should he recreate it, it will not only rampage but do something far worse. It will gather the demons it split off itself. And then return to Kratos, freeing him once more. The silence in the room is palpable. Like us, Kratos split his power to create his deities. That creation leaves us temporarily weakened until we can regain the lost strength. Kratos hadn't yet recovered from his creating the Jibai before attacking. That monstrosity he created could very well be considered a deity all on its own with the power he gave it. Anyways, he wasn't at full strength when we fought and good thing too. If he had been. Well, we wouldn't be talking about this. Ami sees Naruto's confused face. The point is, when we locked Kratos away, we made sure that he couldn't recover past what he had when he started the fight, meaning he is still missing Jibai's power. Kratos is calling to his lost power of Amaterasu and Susanoo, as well as the pieces of the Jibai. We have reduced his calling of Amaterasu and Susanoo, but there is no getting rid of it. He will always call for them. Just like he calls his deities, should the Jibai reform it will return to its creator to which he will have his full strength, allowing him to break free of the prison we created. You must complete the tombs and assume your role as the Nidame Rikidm Senen. Only then will you have the power to combat Ichiha Madara and save the universe from destruction. Now to answer your earlier question. We chose you before you were born to do great things. We used Madara's plans to our advantage. 
Not once since the Rick and Senen has someone with such potential come about. The Jinch Kriki of the Kikbi, the last Yuzumaki and heir to the Yuzumaki's most treasured artifacts, son of the legendary Yandame Hokage, summoner of the dragons, half-demon, able to wield the Mitsuki no Kami, eyes of God, use holy. You are exactly what we were waiting for. Naruto is silent in thought as is his fiance. So what about Madara do you know? Kikbi Asos. Kami takes her cue. Nothing extraordinary about him until he and his brother develop the final stage of the Sharingan separately and without killing each other. Once he realized that his sight was leaving him, he killed his brother and took his eyes. Somehow, this made the degradation of the Sharingan stop as well as his body, granting him the eternal Magicum Sharingan. After losing to Hashirama, he falls off the grid and little is known about his activities since then. All we know is that he made Kikbi attack Kanoha and he is forming a group to go after the Nine Bijk, but other than that, he is a complete mystery. You will have to get much stronger in order to face the challenges ahead of you. We aren't going to tell you what they are, but trust me when I say that you haven't scratched the surface of what's to come. Make no mistake, we wish for you to be victorious, but getting handouts from us will not help you. You and you alone must triumph in this. However, before we forget. Ami snaps her fingers, and in Naruto's hands is his breastplate. Naruto immediately puts it on, feeling much better with it on. Welcome back Master Naruto. I was beginning to worry if you would ever come to retrieve me. Naruto ignored the obvious jab at his punctuality. Thank you. So what happens now? I know there are still three tombs left, but as soon as I move out of the village, the demons will just attack me. From the crowd of assorted deities and other important figures in Valhalla, one moves forward to be beside the three in front of the dais. That is why she will be teaching you. She knows holy as well as many things from ninjutsu to speed. Naruto turns his head and his world stops. Standing right in front of him is his mother, Kishina Yuzumaki. Only now her hair is white and her eyes golden. But other than that, she is identical to the Kashina the sword it imprinted. She wears a short white toga-like dress that wraps around her body and is loose, while being tight enough to not hinder her movements. Hello Naruto. I'm sure you know who I am. I was granted a spot as a messenger and warrior of sorts for Kami. She is always on the lookout for souls to help her rule. I was lucky enough to be chosen or perhaps that was her plan all along. I was very excited to learn that I was going to be able to meet you. Why? Why are you doing this? Hiromi asks Kami. In truth, Hiromi is a little jealous. Now Naruto has another woman in his life that has another connection to him that she can't compete with. However, her curiosity is skyrocketing past her jealousy. Because it is the least I can do. I made him go through some pretty horrible things, so I thought he deserved a break. Between having you two plus two more and his mother back, I owe him that much. Plus his road will not be easy and will need all the help he can get. Hiromi seems to accept the answer but doesn't like it. As for the demons, we shall have a few guardians standing by to jump in, should you encounter any demons that you can't handle. Though between a storm dragon, Kikbi, the Samsara eyes, and a Valkyrie you can probably handle a lot. Nobody replies to that. All eyes are on Asami as she stands, as do her fellow rulers. I think our time is at an end. You now know the severity of the situation and why you must not fail. We will contact you should we find out anything else, or if you are needed somewhere specific. On the plus side. I do believe you have a wedding to get to. In the blink of an eye, the four of them are standing in the same clearing they were before, only several hours later, and the sun is setting. Wait for. Naruto is suddenly smothered by an emotional Kashina. He has no choice but to hug her back, but motions for the other two to move in. He is grateful when they do so. It makes it not quite too awkward to have a gorgeous woman, who the mother you never knew, smash herself up against you. She quickly calms down and runs her eyes over him. My boy. You have grown up so much. I'm. If you're going to apologize, forget it. I don't need an apology for something that was out of your control. She looks like she wants to press the issue, but decides to back off for now. Ayu, Hiromi. How do you want to do this? Ayu instantly shrugs, being a bitch, she never paid attention to such things as marriage, as she has no need to give it any time out of her day. They both turn their eyes to Hiromi, who shrinks back a little bit. Well. I would love a huge ceremony with a lot of people there to show you off, but that wouldn't be practical. In my village, mating is the same as marriage, so we never had a ceremony, just a ritual to be performed privately. After a few minutes of debate, they decide upon a simple way to go about it. Naruto sends another message to Tsunade while the girls run off to a clothing store, leaving Naruto to get formal attire and the rings. As for Kashina. They all agreed, even herself, it would be best to not reveal that she is back, even if it is temporarily. She takes off for the Namika's clan house. Naruto had insisted that she take the master bedroom like before, but she vehemently refused, claiming that he is the head now and needs to sleep there. She will take one of the unoccupied clan houses that doesn't house an ambassador or Jinch Kriki. 
After a short time of going to the jewelers and finding appropriate rings, he finds himself some formal attire. Nothing too fancy but still appropriate to get married in. After that, he picks up the rings that we put on a double rush to get done in time. When he finished that, he used a shunshun to get to the Hokage Tower. A short ceremony later with two very gorgeously dressed women, three matching gold rings, and a signed marriage certificate, Naruto takes his new brides to his compound, leaving Tsunade to finish the mountain of paperwork required for such a marriage. However, there was one small hiccup. Kikbi can't get married as Kikbi. So Naruto came up with a name on the spot. Flashback, what do you mean I have to choose another name? Kikbi yells at Tsunade. Said woman lets out an annoyed sigh. Look, there is no way anyone will approve of this if the name Kikbi no Yoki is on the marriage license. And before you ask, yes I will marry you, but that marriage has to be submitted to the IMLC, the International Marriage License Committee, before it will be legal, and none of them will approve you no matter how much pushing I do. Kikbi huffs and concedes. Fine. Anyone have any suggestions? How about Chio? Naruto suggests lightly. Kikbi glares at him while crossing her arms under her breasts in a decidedly feminine way. Are you calling me old? Think carefully before answering that question. Naruto chuckles. I'm only kidding. How about? Manami. The three present women blink. That is surprisingly a good name. Affectionate beauty. I like it. Let's do this. From this point on, Kikbi will be called Manami most of the time. Get used to it. The newly named Manami, Hiromi, and Naruto face Tsunade as the ceremony starts. Then flashback, as they walk through the compound, he starts to head towards his clan house, only to be stopped by his wives. It feels so weird to call them that. Kishina was right. You are a clan head and need to be where you belong. We will be right beside you the whole way. You don't have to be afraid. Seeing how he is outnumbered and outgunned with his arms being pushed between their massive breasts, he gives in. They make their way to the stairs between the second and third floors of the clan center. His hand reaches for the door and finds it frozen again, just like last time. However, he finds two sets of soft hands pushing the arm forward until the hand is around the knob. They give him a comforting smile, and he turns the knob and opens the door. It is too dark to really see anything, but the moon through the windows makes navigating easier. Having a dragon who has excellent night vision has its perks. Hiromi leads them through the floor, looking in each of the half-dozen rooms. She hides her tears and emotions. Or tries to. She is surprised when Kikbi pulls both her husband and her wife into a hug and pushes them forward. The last door on the floor at the very end leads to the master bedroom. They enter but don't turn on the light. Hiromi guides them all to the large bed with sheets made and clean from the seals placed around each house and building. They sit there for a minute, not sure of what to do. Then Kikbi does something neither expected. Go ahead and have him tonight, Rick Chan. I'll get him tomorrow or later. The dragon is stunned, flabbergasted, shocked, and whatever other word fits. But. But you've known him longer. I thought you would like to be his first. Kikbi smiles at her harem sister. I would. In fact I would love to. Hiromi opens her mouth when she silences her with a slim finger. But, I've seen your frustration, your circumstances that keep making you leave, the insecurity that he will pick someone over you. If this relationship is going to work, we all have to compromise, and I'm giving you the chance to have him first. Hiromi looks ready to cry and hugs Kikbi tightly, whispering her thanks. But that settled, all three of them strip with only Hiromi really able to see well in the low light. When Hiromi and Naruto are completely naked, she guides Naruto down to the bed. They lay side by side for a second. We don't have to do this. Hiromi bites her lip and kisses him. But I want to. Seeing as how she is sure, Naruto kisses back fervently. They kiss and swap tongues for a while, while rubbing up against each other. Suddenly Naruto rolls on top of Hiromi, making her groan in appreciation. Takes a hand and lightly massages her large breasts, earning a low moan from her. Her pleasure continues to rise as Naruto's head slips downward and captures her right breast in his mouth. She shouts at the unexpected warm suction feeling, while his other hand continues to massage her. He switches breasts after a minute or so, making her shiver from the suddenness of the cold air on her very hard nipple. Naruto. She moans. Her hands aren't idle as he imitates a baby. She roams his muscles on his back, arms, neck, his hair and face. She takes it all in and is turned on even more just thinking about all those hard muscles. Her world is broken up when he breaks off from her chest and captures her with another kiss. They battle it out with no clear winner though her temperature skyrockets when his hands run up and down her sides. Enough. I want you now. Already at full mast, Naruto reaches down and maneuvers himself, but stops short of doing the deed. Are you sure? We can stop at any time. Hiromi's only response is to take her legs and pull him inside. All the way. They both cry out in pleasure and pain as Naruto bottoms out. While he isn't large, he is no mean small. Hiromi could try to determine his size if she could form any kind of coherent thought. 
All she can focus on is the white hot, throbbing in time with his heartbeat, man meat. The heat soothes the small pain of being stretched for the first time, but this is nothing compared to the size of a dragon in true form. Her walls are made to accommodate much larger cocks in both girth and length. That doesn't mean she isn't tight, just that it isn't very painful for her. Naruto waits with a held breath. He is afraid of her being in pain from what he heard of what normally happens. That thought, as well as any other thoughts, are blasted away when she bucks her hips, not 10 seconds after getting penetrated. You can move. I'm not in pain. In response to her, he starts out slow, not sure of how fast or his own limit. He finds that despite this being his first time, he is doing just fine. Her walls may be tight, but they are very slippery, like she is making too much lubrication. He builds up speed, much to Hiromi's pleasure. MMMM. Faster. Naruto complies and goes as fast as he dares, which isn't all that fast. But for the first timers, it is perfect. Naruto can feel his end approaching and decides to warn his lover. I'm. I'm close. Hiromi isn't. Not to say she isn't enjoying it, but being a dragon on top of a woman means that she has more stamina than he does at this point. Keep going. Don't hold back. I'm on a contraceptive. A few seconds later, Naruto releases into her. She holds him close as pleasure racks his body. She finds it a weird sensation to have his gunk in her. How? How was that for you? He asks. In other words, did you get off? I loved it. Everything I could have hoped for my first time. So you didn't. She hears the disappointment in his voice, and she rushes to head off the direction he is going. No, but that isn't unexpected. Men are naturally lower in stamina initially than women. I'm sure. She is cut off when Naruto suddenly starts sawing into her around the speed he had been going last time, but this time with a lot more power behind it. WH. What are you doing? She asks between thrusts. She had no warning to the pleasure-inducing stabs into her willing and welcoming love hole. She thought he had gone limp and ready to call it a night. Apparently not. Naruto doesn't answer, but makes his determination to see her orgasm by moving up slightly on her and using his body weight to power his thrusts, making her cry out with pleasure. Right there. Don't stop. He has no intention to. He continues to hammer into her, gradually getting faster. He focuses his mind on the woman writhing beneath him, making sure to have her feel the same pleasure he felt. He multitasks and finds a breast with his left hand and kisses her at the same time while his right arm is over her head to keep himself up. Naruto feels her moan loudly into his mouth and feels her walls shudder before clamping down on him. He lets her scream into his mouth as her pussy claims his baby batter. They stay connected as Naruto collapses on a sweaty Hiromi. Again they just hold each other close as they come down from their highs. That. I could get used to that, Hiromi breathed out. Naruto nods in agreement as he slides to the side and out of Hiromi. They feel the bed shift and Naruto feels Kikbi lay herself on his chest. Of course, she is naked as they are. Are you ready Manami-chan? He asks with a tone of playfulness. The redeed smiles at his attempt, but there is no mistaking the tiredness in his voice. Go to sleep. You've had a long day and I can wait. I don't want you falling asleep on me. Naruto doesn't protest, and they all climb under the covers and away from the mess made earlier. It is with Naruto in the middle with a fox demon and a storm dragon curled up next to him that they fall asleep for the first time as husband and wives. Chapter 10. Some catching up to do. Naruto wakes early in the morning, his energy having been refilled from the previous nightly actions. However, he isn't the only one awake if his senses are correct. He opens his eyes and lifts up the sheets to see one of the sexiest sights of his life. Kikbi or Manami for everyone else not in their circle, giving him a blowjob with her short red hair and looking right in his eyes. He groans and closes his eyes as Kikbi renews her vigor, sucking and licking his pole. Naruto groans and tries to hold it down for the blonde who took his virginity last night is still sleeping next to him. Kikbi tries everything she knows, which is very extensive for someone who hasn't had sex yet. She sucks and slurps and licks and nips. She even flicks her tongue into the small hole on the tip. While her mouth works the tip, her left hand works the shaft, and her right fondles his sack. But for the recently de virgined blonde, it is all too much stimulation, and he releases into his other wife's awaiting mouth. Kikbi wastes none of it and swallows it all, making a show of it. If his penis had gone soft, there is no evidence of it now. Kikbi crawls over Naruto's slightly sweaty form with his labored breath and rests herself on top of him. I hope you like that, Koi. Naruto can only nod and find her as naked as he is. Good, because it is my turn to have you. Naruto is about to protest when Kikbi rolls them away from Hiromi. But she rolls them twice so that she is still on top. Just relax and let it happen. She smashes her lips onto his, and despite having his own seed drank by the woman only moments ago, he doesn't hold back. He wrestles with her but loses to Kikbi's sheer enthusiasm. They wage war with their tongues for a few more moments before Kikbi backs away. 
Naruto gasps when he feels her touches a rock-hard tool and places it at her entrance. She crushes herself against him and gives him a nod. Thus do it and get it over with. He holds her clothes and then plunges himself into her. She tries to cry out, but his mouth covers hers and muffles the scream. His hands find her cheeks and wipe away the tears while he stays completely still from the waist down. After a few agonizing moments, Kikbi starts to move in earnest. Naruto picks up on it and starts to move with her, though slightly curious about her quick recovery. Demonic healing is much greater than normal humans. You should know that. He mentally smacks himself over the head, but soon forgets everything as Kikbi picks up the pace. She rides him for all he is worth. At some point, he could no longer resist her swing fun bags of flesh waving back and forth right in front of his face. He grabs them, squeezes them, sucks on them, tweaks and massages them. They are very squishy unlike Hiromi's. His hands sink into the flesh while Hiromi's are more firm and solid. But he still loves them as he gets the best of both worlds. Not long afterwards, Kikbi releases onto him, the stimulus of his hands all over her chest, and the dick inside her becomes too much. Due to her release, Naruto's release happens just seconds later. Kikbi's mouth is open in a silent scream as she is filled with his seed for the first, and definitely not the last time. She comes down from her high and collapses on his chest. She feels his arm snake around her, drawing her in closer. Though she doesn't know it now, Naruto loves the feeling of a naked woman laying on his chest. There is something about it that makes him feel complete, makes him feel human. He loves the feel of the warm breath on his neck, the feel of large but soft breasts mashed against his chest, the way her warmth adds and amplifies his. He feels. Loved. Naruto sighs, completely content with just staying like this forever. So how was it? Both look to see Hiromi looking at them with her deep purple eyes. Better than I imagined, Kayu says honestly. Hiromi moves to cuddle with them as Kikbi makes room for her. The three of them just lay there for a while until Naruto speaks. So how long were you awake? He asks the dragon. Hiromi looks to Kikbi before both of them turn to him. We were awake about a half hour before you. We wanted to wake up first to make sure you were okay. Naruto gives them a confused look. Take a look around and sits up despite the females on his chest and does just that. His eyes tear up as he sees what Hiromi saw last night. In the pale light of the morning, he sees his parents' bedroom complete with clothing, jewelry, notes, but most of all pictures. Pictures that smile back at him with wide, happy grins. Pictures that tell a happy and or exciting story. Pictures that give proof that his life would have been good if they had lived. Naruto gets up and goes to a picture where Minato is kneeling in front of Kashina and has his ear to her expanded belly, his eyes closed. His face couldn't get any happier or more content than that moment. Kashina has a brilliant smile on her face as she looks down at her husband and runs her fingers through his hair. Naruto closes his eyes and nearly collapses to his knees, but is caught by his wives. He openly cries while holding on to them like a lifeline. Hiromi and Kikbi steer Naruto to the bed, and all three of them crawl on it. They stare wrapped in with each other for quite some time while Naruto deals with this. After a full 20 to 30 minutes, Naruto calms down enough to stop crying. He wipes his tears and smiles at them both. That smile makes them weak in the joints as it is not faked or forced, but a true smile of gratitude. Thanks. I don't think I would be able to get through this without you both. Hiromi and Kikbi smile back at him radiantly, but it is Hiromi that moves forward and claims his mouth. Naruto doesn't hesitate to kiss back or to deepen this kiss. A small whimper from Kikbi reminds Hiromi that she isn't the only one who wants some of the action. So with a little reluctance, she pulls herself away only for her spot to immediately be taken by her harem sister. Kikbi's kiss is no less in passion or intensity and leaves Naruto breathless. She giggles when she sees his blank look when she backs away. You two are going to be the death of me. Kikbi's smirk is identical to Hiromi's. But you will die happy and sated in every sense of the word, Kikbi whispers huskily. Naruto shivers not only from her tone but from the images that run through his mind. But you won't die yet. We have many more positions to try before then, Hiromi adds. If Naruto's heart on could get any firmer, it could have been mistaken for steel. Hikbi notices his discomfort and gets an idea. Let's take a shower. We need to see what Tsunade wants us to do, but we could take our time. She intentionally trails off. All three of them share a look before they scramble for the large shower. After another two rounds with each of them and two hours later, they are finally clean and dressed. Luckily no one will notice that the hot water is completely gone. Naruto has on his usual shades that hide his eyes, while the girls have on tight-fitting outfits that could kill via nosebleed. Why not? Both shout at the same time. Because Konoha will be annihilated if you two go out like that as I would have to kill every person who gets a nosebleed. Both women sport light blushes but don't back down. Forget about them. We aren't dressing like this for them. Only for you and you alone. We want to show off what hot women you have for wives. We want to show off. Naruto groans. But I want to be the only one who looks at you two like that. 
I should be the only one who looks at you like that, and clothes that nearly leave nothing to imagination doesn't help. Look, I know why you want to and personally I want to flaunt you both around too, but not in those and not today. You both have beauty and sexy in spades, even without wearing those clothes. I'm not saying I don't appreciate the sentiment or that you can't ever dress up, but not to just parade around. Please. For me. Kikbi and Hiromi look down. Does it matter that much to you? Naruto nods and Kikbi and Hiromi sigh and begin to strip. They put on shinobi pants and long sleeve shirts that are baggy enough to downsize their busts, but tight enough to entice Naruto. They also wear coats as it is getting later in the year and getting chilly in the mornings and nights. Better. Naruto gives them a hug. Much. Now let's go and pick up Kishina and go see Bachan. They walk downstairs and see the white-haired Kishina sitting in a chair reading a magazine. She pretends to keep reading the magazine, but subtly looks up and smiles as she sees Naruto's warm expression and relaxed demeanor. Who is this David Hasselhoff and why was he voted the world's hottest man? She asks aloud as they near. They all read the title of the magazine to be Kinoichi Monthly. International Edition. On the cover apparently this David Hasselhoff and Hiromi and Kikbi will both agree later on that he is somewhat attractive, he has nothing on Naruto. I don't know but we should go see Bachan before she is too inebriated to think straight. Kishina gives a disapproving scowl at Tsunade's habits, but Minato has his. Each to their own. Hokage office. Three figures appear in a column of fire inside the Hokage's office, making a half dozen Anbu appear in front of Tsunade to protect her. The other half dozen appear in a right circle around the intruders with weapons drawn. Then the fire goes down, Naruto and his new wives stand there, and Tsunade scoffs. It would be you. Why didn't I think of that? Anbu, you're dismissed. The Anbu gives Kikbi a harsh look to which she gives them the finger as they vanish. So what do I have the honor for? I thought you three would still be in bed. Naruto blushes as Tsunade snickers at his face. You have no idea. He is absolutely amazing and just wait until you see him. Enough. I admit defeat already, Tsunade shouts as she covers her ears dramatically. This, of course, presents her large bust to the world. Naruto can almost feel the lecherous stare from Jiraiya. Get out here Jiraiya. This applies to you too. Said pervert materializes from the wall. Am no good brat. Always spoiling my research. As a tick mark appears in Tsunade's forehead, Hiromi leans over to Naruto. Shouldn't we get this going? Kishina isn't going to wait forever. Naruto grunts in agreement. He steps in and prevents Jiraiya from being obliterated by defecting the orbit launcher that is Tsunade's fist. Jiraiya looks at him with stars in his eyes. I always knew you would come around. Shut it. We came here to warn you. Suddenly a flash of white light blinds the room. Jiraiya and Tsunade find themselves buried within the walls. Not about her. The Hokage and Jiraiya pull themselves out and wonder what hit them until their eyes fall upon the worst sight they could have seen. Hush. Wham, smack, pow, crunch. The white-haired woman thrashes the both of them, and the Anbu are surprisingly absent and not stopping the one woman from stomping a new mud hole in the two Sanin. Kishina stops for a second to look back at her son and his family. You might want to go. This may take a while. Naruto just shrugs. Who is he to argue with her? He knows from experience that it is just easier to give in and let her do what she wants. Hiromi and Kikbi press his arms into their chests before they disappear in a leaf shunshin, this time courtesy of Naruto instead of Kikbi. Scene change streets. They appear in the middle of some street as Naruto hadn't really cared one way or another. So what do you two want to do now that we have some downtime? Both women shrug and they walk down the street just wandering around, looking for something to catch their eyes. They are walking for only five minutes when they hear a familiar voice. Naruto. All three of them stop and look. Shikamaru is standing there with Shinji and Ino. Oh. Hey. It is really clear that he doesn't know how to interact with them anymore. Shikamaru detours from his path and walks over and to Naruto's surprise, shakes his hand. It's been a while. Hey, are you busy? Naruto shrugs. Nah, not really. We were just walking around looking for something to do. That's when Shikamaru notices the other two women. He blushes lightly at their sheer beauty rolling off of them in waves. Hell, they are making Ino blush. Shikamaru gives them a polite nod of the head before turning back to Naruto. If you're not busy, why don't you come with us? We are on our way to our meeting that we go to twice a month. It will be the rookie 6 plus team 10. Naruto looks at his wives who shrug also. They hide identical smirks because Naruto just got to see both of their breasts jiggle as neither are wearing bras. They see him smirk as he realizes it as well. Sure. I'm sure Bachan will be busy for a while anyways. Shikamaru is confused by that, but leaves it alone. The trip is silent as they walk down the street with Hiromi and Kikbi, taking up their usual spots. All three of the Ino Shikacho squad blush when they do. They look at Naruto who only shrugs. Who is he to complain if two of the hottest and sexiest women on the planet want to put his arms between their large breasts? 
few minutes later, they arrive at a plain building with no name on the front, just a sign that says, Shinobi only in the front window. Shikamaru opens the door for the others as they file in. The lighting is barely above the bare minimum, the tables are far apart, and the atmosphere is quiet. In fact, he can't hear any conversation going on around him, just soft music played by a live band in the background. Ino leads the group to the back of the restaurant, back towards the booths. Naruto spots the other rookie 6 plus 3 along the back wall. Hey guys, look who we found, Ino announces to the others. They all look up and their eyes go wide. Naruto. At once there is a clambering to get him seated. Tenten and Ino tried to sit next to him, but Kikbi and Hiromi blocked them off and sat next to him. That earns a glare from the younger Kinoichi, but they shrug it off easily. So I think introductions are in order, Kiba says from the corner and not bothering to hide his staring. Naruto suppresses the urge to wipe that smug and lecherous grin off Kiba's face, but manages to restrain himself, right? Hiromi is the blonde while Manami is the redeed. Kiba's grin goes wider. Now Naruto, why would those lovely angels be walking around with a loser like you? This time, Naruto makes a move for his katana, but stops when the waitress comes by. No need in getting kicked out within five minutes of arriving. Hello and good morning. My name is Shinobi Cards please. Everyone but the obvious and Naruto pull theirs out and the waitress looks them over before returning them. She turns to Naruto and he hands her his. When she gives it back she looks expectantly at the only people who had not offered their licenses. Ma'am, in order to stay, I must see your shinobi license. They don't have one, Naruto interrupts. But I can vouch that they are indeed shinobi of the highest caliber. The waitress shakes her head. I'm sorry but the rules are rules. I must have an ID that shows you at least have been a shinobi or you will have to leave. Naruto shoots her glare, not that she can see it. Alright, we leave your nameless establishment. The three of them make to get up, but Shikamaru moves to intercept them. Wait. Isn't there a way they can stay? I am a Jinin and I know Naruto is an Anbu. I'm sure his word is trustworthy enough to stay this once. The waitress seems to consider it, but then shakes her head. I'm sorry, but the only way they could stay is if they are or have been a shinobi or they are the spouse to a shinobi. Naruto blanches. Really? Oh well, then the problem was solved. Everyone looks at him expectantly to elaborate. Naruto sighs and lifts his left hand. On it is a simple gold band. A wedding band. That shocks them. But it blows their minds when Hiromi and Manami put their left hands next to his. All three have the same style ring just shrunk down to fit their smaller fingers. The whole table is quiet. Everyone, meet Hiromi and Manami Yuzumaki, my wives. Everyone stares while Hinata falls out of her chair, coed before the bell even rings. The others have less severe reactions but still are quite stunned. Lucky bastard, Kiba mutters. Slowly, everyone comes back from their stupor, and the waitress just awkwardly disappears into the crowd. Ino and Tenten feel rather guilty for glaring at Naruto's wives now, while Kiba is severely put out that two of the hottest women are taken by the same person. So Naruto. How have you been? It is a pitiful attempt to get things back on track, but it's a start. Pretty good. We got married yesterday, and most of you should know that the craw has been applied to me seeing how you are all clan heirs and will be on the council one day. The waitress comes back with menus and they all put their orders in. Needless to say that the waitress didn't linger. So what's up with this restaurant not having a name? And why is this place so set on shinobi only? Lee leans across the table. That's just it. It has no name so when people talk about it, nobody listening in knows what they are referring to unless they have been here before. We just call it nameless. And as for shinobi only, you must have noticed the private atmosphere. This place is meant for shinobi to unwind and talk things through without the risk of people overhearing. The identification cards they ask for are just for making sure you're a shinobi, but one of this village. They are highly trained to spot fakes and were set up by Tsunidi at Jurea's request to help weed out spies, Shikamaru pipes in and fills in the rest. Naruto nods in understanding. It makes enough sense to him. After all, this place would be a magnet for spies. It would also be ideal for a spy to operate such a place and put listening seals inside the booths to get what everyone says. The waitress finally comes back to get their drink orders and what they want and leaves, without saying two extra words. Naruto looks at Shikamaru after that. So what's with the rookie six? Well, with Sasuke gone and Sakura. We won't say anything about her. And you are gone. People forgot about you. So we became the rookie six. Team 10 never got lumped in with us as they are a part of their own year and not ours. The guys then chat about training while the girls along with a newly revived Hinata discuss various things that women discuss. So Naruto, what was up with your eyes and why do you have sunglasses on? Kiba asks suddenly. All conversation stops and all eyes are on Naruto. Said person looks to his wives for their opinion. He is sadly disappointed when neither woman gives him anything to go off of. They are oddly acting in tune with each other without speaking to each other. I'll have to investigate later. Naruto stands. I assume this has a privacy seal. 
the regulars nod, and Jai switch places with me. The large teen gets squashed between the goddesses, making him sport a large blush while the woman on each side of him scowl at losing their pillow. Naruto finds the privacy seal and activates it. Now don't freak out. I've got these eyes right after I left here for training with Jiraiya. It has to do with my heritage and ancestry. It's all very complicated and long so I won't go any further into it. They all lean in as Naruto reaches up to his glasses. They hold in a collective breath as he takes off the glasses. And a face fault, another pair of sunglasses is revealed. Kikbi and Hiromi are snickering at them, while Naruto is openly laughing at them. The group recovers quickly and hackles Naruto about the practical joke. Sorry, that was too good to pass up. Slightly put off, the group once again intently looks at Naruto. He takes off his glasses, his eyes closed. When he opens them, the group gasps. The Rinnegan allows me to use all elemental affinities outside of bloodlines like ice and lava. That includes gravity. And I don't really want to go into how I have it, just suffice it to say that it is passed down through Uzumaki blood, but it is extremely rare for one to unlock it. While the others assimilate the information, the food comes. Naruto moves back between his wives, leaving a slightly disappointed Chujai. Damn dude. If you had that in the academy, there would have been no way you would have been dead last. Naruto smiles cheekily at him. Amazing how the dead last can become top dog in only three years. Kiba growls at the Jai while the others chuckle at Kiba's expense. The rest of breakfast goes quickly with a little talk about recent developments in their circle. Turns out Jai is scheduled to take the Jinin exams in two months, while Ino is under the apprenticeship of another Yamanaka in the tea department, Ibiki. Hiba is getting ready to study under his mother for clan head, as is Shikamaru and Shino. Hinata is interning at the hospital as an herb expert. The conversation is light and enjoyable. Until one had to ruin it. So Manami, how is married life? Or should I say Kikbi? All conversation stops. The Yuzumaki family just stares at Shikamaru with restrained hostility. However, the genius isn't to be put off. She looks just like the woman you brought in, and Tsunade and Shizun healed on her desk. You called her Kikbi and we all saw Kikbi a few days ago, out of your seal and very much free. And what of Hiromi? If that indeed is her name. Kiba, what does she smell like? Kiba seems to shrink back, but takes a couple of sniffs of her. Like lilac and grass. God she smells good. Wait. Under that, I'm. I'm not sure. I've never smelled anything like it. Except. Except when we saw that huge dragon in the training field. Realization dawns on Kiba and points a finger at her. You're a dragon, aren't you? They are startled when Naruto stands up sharply. I think we've overextended our welcome. The other two rise to go with him. Wait. I'm not attacking any of you. I just wanted the truth out in the open. Please sit, Shikamaru asks quickly as he attempts to salvage the situation. He had misjudged the effect it would have on Naruto. Naruto glares at him. He neither sees nor continues to leave. I'm listening but make it quick. I won't stand for anyone insulting my wives. Anyone who has a problem with my wives has a problem with me. In other words, if you have an issue with them, then don't expect me to be your friend. Shikamaru nods his head and continues without hesitation. Look, from the stories we heard and read in our childhood, Kikbi is supposed to be this giant magnet of destruction, death, and despair. However, a few days ago, she showed us that we are wrong when she defended the very same village she attacked 16 years ago. I can't speak for all of us, but I for one don't hold any hatred, hostility, or grudges against her. And if Hiromi is a dragon, she and her kind did help us and hasn't attacked us or shown any hostility to anyone. Well anyone minus Akura. Again, I don't have any resentment over her not being human. Naruto looks around the table and sees Shikamaru's feelings on all their faces. He feels very relieved that he accepts his wives. He would have stopped being their friend had they shown resentment and wouldn't have thought twice about it. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't want their friendship. Naruto retakes his seat. I'm glad you all feel that way because anyone who hates my wives is no friend of mine. All nine nod their heads in understanding. Yes, you are right. Minami is really the Kikbi no Yoko. She was released over two years ago and since then has been nothing but supportive. It was with her efforts that I got over my fear of being hurt again along with Hiromi here. And yes, she is a dragon. Actually she, the boss summons, the largest and strongest of the dragons. He enjoys their gobsmacked expressions. The conversation returns to what it was before, stopping only when a white-haired woman shows up. Naruto, Hiromi, Minami. It's time to see the Hokage. Said people stand and say their goodbyes and leave with a mystery woman, to the others, out the door, but of course, not before paying for their meals. Kishina sunshine away in a burst of white light that temporarily blinds the people in the restaurant. Who was she? I didn't recognize her, Ino asks. Kiba wrinkles his nose. I don't know but she didn't have a scent. You mean you couldn't smell her scent, Ino corrects. Damn it, Ino. She didn't have one as it was non-existent, not there. Akamaru confirmed it. 
she didn't have one. I know there are 34 people working or eating in this place because each one has a distinct and unique smell. She didn't have one at all. Shikamaru scowls as he takes a drink of his green tea and contemplates what Kiba just told him. Hokage's office. When the four arrive, they are stunned to see the Sanin in the condition they are in. All except Kishina who had dealt them the injuries. But god mom. Were you that angry at them? Gireya and Tsunade both look like mummies, Tsunade to a lesser extent as she actually has to work. But Gireya's entire arms, legs, torso, crotch, and most of his face are wrapped up in gauze with splints under them. Tsunade is less injured but no less in pain. Her legs, torso, and most of her head are wrapped up. Only her arms weren't injured because she has to sign things. Well, it will hurt like a bitch to do so, she can still pick up a pen, hold it, and sign her name after reading it. Unlike if she had splints or casts on her arms. I had a lot of making up to do, is all the explanation that she offers. Now, time to get to business. I am here from Kami as one of her Valkyrie to train Naruto in the use of holy. During that time, I will also be training him in the Yuzumaki arts as well. To do this, we must travel to Yuzushio. Tsunade uses a hand to unwrap her ear, then uses the same hand to clean it out. Did I hear you right? I thought you said you're going to Yuzushio. Kashina holds up a hand. Yes, I know it was destroyed, but that is only the top. Underneath is where we kept all our records and sealing arts. That fact stays in this room by the way. She lets her threat be felt through her kai. We will be there for as long as we need to be. And tell us how you are going to keep him safe from not only Akatsuki, but the demons as well. Kashina's kai spikes slightly. You forget that I am no longer of this world, and you assume that my methods are as well. I am a member of the god's court and as such I have knowledge well beyond your comprehension. Did you forget that in order to teach someone something, the teacher must be well versed in what is being taught. Tsunade slouches in her chair. There's nothing I can say that will deter you is there. Ashina shakes her hair. No. Nothing will keep me from my responsibility to teach my son, my right. She turns around and faces a stunned Naruto. I assume you have no objections. Ah yes, Hiromi and Kikmi can come, the trip will last a few years at most a few months at best, we will leave in a week at the latest, and I can't talk about that here. Family secrets and all, she finishes for him each time he opens his mouth to ask a question. That's good. I want to relax a little before I leave the village for a long time again. Kashina smiles and nods at him. I think I'll go back to the compound and dip into the bath. It has been over 16 years since I have taken a bath. She moves to leave, but then suddenly stops. Oh and Sunity, remember my promise if you use medicine or have someone to heal you or Jiraiya before I said you could. Sunity pales at the threat. Satisfied, Kashina turns to Naruto. We need to have a talk. Are you free later? Naruto shrugs. Yeah, we just came to ask what Bachan wanted to do now, but I guess that is answered. We have no plans for right now, but I'll see you later at home. Wait. Since you're going back there, we should too. There is someone we need to talk to and it won't be pleasant. Better to get it over with now before it becomes an issue. Right. I don't mind. Gather round. The four of them disappear into a flash of white, leaving the two San into their injuries. Namika's compound, they appear at the gates to the compound, just inside. The next second, Naruto finds himself engulfed by an emotional Kishina. Naruto is a little stunned, but accepts the hug all the same. It feels different than when his girls give him hugs. It feels more. More. Wholesome. Something about it just makes him feel more complete than before. I'm sorry you had such a hard time before. I would watch you from Valhalla and wish I could be with you so many times. Every time you got beaten, when your stomach growled in hunger, when you needed a bath, every time you needed help with our training. I'm so sorry. Naruto just hugs her back and figures it out. He was never hugged like a mother hugs. Oh how he enjoys this feeling of acceptance, of love. It is different from his wives but no less enjoyable. Just different. Naruto's eyes water as he hugs his mother as she does something that only a mother can do. There is something that only the love of a mother can do. Before he knows what's going on, both are crying on each other, lost in the emotions of the moment. Hikbi and Hiromi just stand to the side, happily watching Naruto embrace more of his emotions. His heart is mending. He is becoming more and more human and less of a machine. They wait until the two break apart to join in. Ashina tried to get away, but the two other women wouldn't have it. They all hug each other in the first ever family moment for Naruto, and they want Kashina to be a part of it. Naruto momentarily takes off his sunglasses to wipe his eyes with a very large smile on his face. Then his eyes fall on FK coming out of one of the clan houses. She sees him and does a 180 degree turn and walks back inside. His smile falters a little at seeing her reaction to him. Achan, we'll talk later. Right now, I've got some explaining to do. Ashina nods and walks on into the compound. Whatever she is going to do. Go on without me Narukun. I've got something to do as well. Inside Naruto, he is conflicted. 
he never really has gone anywhere or done anything without Kikbi here, and to tell the truth, he doesn't like the idea of her leaving without him. Some small part of him whispers that she won't be coming back. However, he doesn't want his insecurities to make her feel trapped to restrict what she does. So he smiles and kisses her briefly before she disappears in her unique shunshin. Now that she is gone, Naruto feels a kind of empty space that Kikbi's presence seems to have filled. Apparently, it is transparent as Hiromi snuggles up next to him and tries to melt herself into him. He hugs her back and they stand there for a few minutes. Naruto kisses her in thanks to her support to which she has no problems returning. In fact she is related to finally being the one to give him support and comfort and not Kikbi or sharing with her. Naruto schools his features and walks down to the house FK is using hand in hand with Hiromi. They walk up to the door and he knocks twice. When she doesn't answer or make any indication that she is there, Naruto knocks again. When she still doesn't make a sound, Naruto tries to open the door but finds it locked. Apparently, she doesn't want to talk. FK, I'm coming in. He opens the door and gets blasted in the face with high pressure water. Only by using gravity and water manipulation did he slow the water down enough to not get thrown off his feet. I guess I deserve that, he says more to himself as he wipes the water out of his face. Using his wind and fire manipulation, he dries himself and Hiromi as she had been standing next to him before they step over the threshold. Inside, it is small but quaint. Each house is modeled after a theme, and this one is water. Everything is a shade of blue. And sitting on a couch is a steaming FK. Go away. Naruto sighs. Look, I only came to say that I'm sorry for deceiving you. I am Naruto Uzumaki, and I was the Jinch Kriki of the Kikbi no Yoko. A few years ago, my sensei and I released her from. You saw her before and probably recognized her body uses. I don't want you to hate me for not telling you and even misleading you a bit, but if you do, then I wish you the best of luck. Having said his part, Naruto turns around and starts to walk away. FK watches him go with mixed feelings. He knows my pain and what I've been through. He still talks to me and wants me to be his friend. And he is rather handsome. But he lied to me and he could lie again. But then I'll be alone again. However, she decides right then and there that keeping a grudge isn't worth losing her only friend. Wait. Tell me about her. Naruto stops and looks at FK with a smile on his face. Sure. Time skip four hours. Naruto groans as he falls back against the side of the onsen. It is the first time since the invasion that he has relaxed like this. He had spent several hours with FK, just talking with her about Kikbi, whom she was referring to. Hiromi had cuddled into Naruto's side like always, and after an introduction, she offered bits and pieces where appropriate. After comparing notes between Bijk, they talked about other things like how it feels to be married. She had shared with him her deepest wish. To find someone who will love her enough to marry her. Naruto wished her the very best in finding her soulmate. Naruto looks up as he hears someone climb into the pool and is gifted to see his naked wife moving across the open water towards him. His mouth waters slightly at the sight of Hiromi's sexy body moving towards him. So much so that his penis is instantly hard at the very sight. Is someone happy to see me? She teases as she poses for him. Naruto smirks back at her coy grin. Always, Hiromi's grin turns into a smirk and finishes getting to him. However, instead of sitting next to him or even on his lap, she slips his cock into her pussy while facing away from him. Naruto groans as she does so, but she makes no effort to move after that. She is perfectly content to sit there with his arms around her with his man meat inside of her. They sit there for a while, just enjoying the hot water and the bonding time. But Naruto can't resist. He moves his hands to her breasts and plays with her. Before he was intent on moving on, but now he can play with her tits for as long as he wishes. She moans lightly as he does things that he didn't think he would enjoy doing as much as he is. Eventually, she can't stop herself. She starts to bounce up and down on his pole, Naruto all the while never stops playing with her tsunami sized bust. Both are lost in each other, they don't even notice someone else until they hear a splash. Both instantly stop and look to see the last person they were expecting. Achan, what are you doing? Naruto asks even while his hands are still on his wife's chest. Ashina shrugs, making her naked chest bound slightly. Don't mind me. She is unfazed when their staring doesn't stop making her sigh. Look, this is a mixed onsen, isn't it? I have no reason to be ashamed of my nakedness, and neither do you. The fact that I gave birth to you doesn't mean that I'm not a female, you aren't a male, and that you weren't just having sex with your wife in a public bath. Plus, we need to chat and I would rather do it in a comfortable place like this. Wouldn't you? Naruto and Hiromi share a look. She does have a point. They both agree to quit having sex for now in lieu of certain company. Any company besides Kikbi. So they did what they were doing before and just enjoyed the hot water with each other. Naruto. Kishina grabs their attention again. We need to talk. About what? A lot of things. First and foremost, it is about Madara. When I died, I learned a great many things and made the choice to join Kami Court instead of just existing. 
On that day, I got an unabridged history of the world, as well as the future plans for you. Madara isn't what he used to be. He is a weak and tired old man. Well the EMS grants his body immortality, his brain wasn't designed for it and therefore is losing his sanity. The reason behind his weakness isn't due to his mind going, but because of an event that occurred a few years before his fight with Hashirama. When Madara concocted this insane plan, he summoned the demons for their help, thinking they would help him. He was wrong. They don't want to return to the Jibai. They wish to retain their independence, their own lives. Should Madara succeed, the Jibai would pull them back into itself before returning to Kratos and sending the universe back into war. The demons that Madara summoned were some of Lucifer's lieutenants. Diablos, Pandemona, and Leviathan. The second they heard what his plans were, they attacked him. They say he fought like the devil and somehow managed to escape, but not before several grievous injuries were inflicted on him. Though he survived, his power was severely limited and while is still quite strong, he is only a shadow of his former self. When the demons returned to Lucifer, he gave a kill on sight command for Madara. That is likely why he didn't attack during the invasion. He and Akatsuki would have been targeted by the demons as well. Naruto takes this information in stride. Okay, that was informative but not earth-shattering, Naruto says while trying not to look at his mother's mid-sea range bust that is just floating above the water. So far he has been successful by distracting himself with his wife's bust instead, much to her approval. While not all that shocking, they will take any opportunity to take you both out if possible, even if that means attacking Kanoha when they know Kami's court is watching this place and ready to act. This means that if Madara is ever in the same place as you, run. Don't trust Madara to fight the demons with you. He will stab you in the back just as he did his brother. Naruto nods his understanding. Good. Now as for your training, once we get to Yuzushio, we will be working on your control of your elements that you do have and creating holy. I can teach you the basics and a few, but that is it. You have to do the rest. Kami didn't want it to be too easy for you, but that doesn't mean you can't come to me to bounce ideas off of or to help with a particular aspect of the technique. Depending on how fast you pick up the training, which probably isn't going to be very quickly, we should be there for over a year. And it has nothing to do with you just how difficult the training will be for you. But I learned the others easily enough. Ashina shakes her head. That is because the sage was smart enough to include some of his memories for the techniques and how to perform them. Using holy is completely new for you. You don't have a firm understanding of how it works or how it feels. Now Naruto is confused. But I was using holy before. That was the sword doing most of the work. Being sentient, the sword can do what the armor does and offer advice to taking control of your body for short periods of time. It was calling on the holy element and then molding it. You were just the channel it drew it from and you directed the attack. It did all the hard work. Naruto hangs his head. That was not what he wanted to hear, but then things don't always go your way. Suddenly the doors to the onsen burst open, revealing Kikbi. Her eyes lock onto Naruto and Hiromi, and she is next to them but not in the water. Her eyes burn with restrained desire. You. Me. Her. Bedroom. Now. Before Naruto can even say goodbye to Kishina, Kikbi has them in their bedroom and is attacking her husband. However Naruto pulls away from her and holds her arms. What the hell is going on? Why are you doing this? I was having a conversation with Kachan when you came bursting in. Kikbi doesn't answer him and tries to push forward again, but is stopped but Naruto, and this time Hiromi helps restrain her. What is going on here? Kikbi sighs and stops trying to rape Naruto. Look, I don't want to talk about it right now. All I want is to be fucked into unconsciousness right now. I can't explain it right now, but please just go along with it. Naruto gives her a harsh eye. He has never seen her in such a state. You promised to tell us later. Pikby nods very enthusiastically. Once more Naruto and Hiromi exchange glances and Naruto gives him. With a loud squeal of joy, Kikbi nearly tackles Naruto and strips out of her clothing in record time. Her ferocity pushes Naruto back onto the bed with her on top of him with a grunt. She wastes no time in sticking his penis in her and starts riding him at a hard pace. Hiromi just stands off to the side in shock at Kikbi's frenzied state and just how fast she went from pleading to now impaling herself over and over again. It had to be less than 10 seconds. However a sudden chill makes her realize that she is naked as much as the others and her need is increasing at watching the two fuck. Yes, this is carnal sex, fucking in other words. Not the slow loving pace their first night. No, this is purely for making each other pass out with sheer pleasure for those gifted with enough stamina to do so. Though you won't catch Naruto complaining. Right now, he is holding Kikbi to him as he lays with his back on the bed and working the established, a frenzied pace. Kikbi's beautiful face is set almost in a permanent O as she is being cut in half. God this woman will be the death of me. Suddenly Kikbi sits up, gracing him with her sweaty front and bouncing breasts. However, his side is suddenly obstructed by Hiromi kneeling over his face. 
he gets the hint and starts to eat her out with gusto. He is sloppy as he is inexperienced in such things, but he makes up for in sheer tenacity. Soon both women are released, as is Naruto. Kikbi slumps to the side, and his cock is quickly claimed by Hiromi. She picks up where they left off by sitting with her rear to him and immediately starts moving. It isn't the fast-paced moving from before, but it is still a good pace. She bounces on it like it is a pogo stick while Kikbi recovers. But too soon for her, she is quaking as she climaxes herself. She falls to the side opposite of Kikbi as she and Naruto regain their breaths. However, Kikbi is back and raring to go again. She climbs atop of Hiromi's sweaty form in the 69 position and wags her ass at him, enticing him into action. He plunges himself into Kikbi once more, earning a moan from the repeat. As he saws in and out of his wife, the repeat eats out the blonde under her. When Hiromi comes to, she finds Naruto's dick moving in and out of Kikbi's pussy right above her and her own pussy getting pleasured. She cranes her neck up and uses her tongue to stimulate Kikbi's clit, making her groan into Hiromi's honeypot. For Naruto, the sight of his wives pleasuring each other is definitely a turn on, and his erection grows even harder. He picks up the pace and drills Kikbi from behind, making her shout in pleasure. He suddenly gets an evil smirk and without warning, sticks his index finger up to the first knuckle into her ass. Kikbi's eyes go wide as the sudden and unexpected penetration of her ass. It becomes too much and cooms, making Naruto coom with her. With Kikbi indisposed right now, Hiromi allows Naruto to climb over her and insert his tool into her. He holds her legs over her head as he doesn't waste time and starting slow, her walls more than easily take the normally brutal speed. As Naruto jackhammers into her, she is moaning and groaning all the way. But she tires of this position as Naruto is just hammering away, but it isn't doing anything for her. She doesn't know if it is because she has coomed twice already or if her nerves are just numb, but she needs a change of position. So she sits up and is now sitting in his lap as they both bounce. Naruto is in the perfect position to latch onto her breast and he does so. Meanwhile, his hand sneaks around behind her, and with the same finger he used for Kikbi, he puts it in Hiromi's ass to the first knuckle. She squeals at the new sensation. Her ass is just like her pussy in the fact it is made for pen eyes as larger than a human one, but it is much more sensitive than the human one. Her eyes go wide as the coil tightens at a much faster rate than before, as he uses his finger in her ass to pull her up as she bounces. Hiromi screams as she releases, the strongest climax of her life rocking her body. She feels full as Naruto pumps more of his seat into her. If it weren't for her arms around his neck, she would have fallen back. This night is easily climbing the charts for one she will always remember. Naruto lets Hiromi go and they both pant heavily. He finally thinks it is over. Until Kikbi gets back up with the same hungry eyes. We are far from done. Let's test the springs on the bed shall we? There would be nothing but pleasure filled moans from that room for several more hours before it goes quiet. Time skip next day. Naruto wakes to him and his wives covered in dried sweat, coom, and blood. Kikbi had gotten a little too into it and actually bit him on the shoulder, and it only increased her libido. He groans as he tries to sit up, but his body is so sore after last night he is sure that his dick would fall off if he has sex one more time. Seriously, a dragon and the queen of demons at the same time. It would be enough to tire anyone out. Fortunately for him, they had both passed out after one last send-off of coom and sweat. But now Kikbi owes them answers and from the feeling of things, none of them are going to be getting out of bed anytime soon. However, it is still early and he doesn't have anywhere to be, he snuggles up closer to his pillows and goes back asleep. Time skips six hours. After a much-needed shower and soak in the tub for all of them, they are seated at the table where Naruto's clones are making them dinch as and lunch dinner. As much as we enjoyed last night, you promised us. Kikbi sets her face. I'll start out from the beginning. Yesterday, I went in search of Yujito. I needed to set some things straight with her. But after searching for a half hour, I couldn't find her. So I came here and contacted her through the slave mark. When I came into her mindscape, I drew her in with me. Naruto, she took advantage of you. I know for a fact that I saw her not two days before she arrived here and gave her the treatment. She took advantage of my husband and her master's kindness, and that isn't something I will tolerate. So I punished her both physically and mentally. I had a shunch into this location to where I lashed her with a switch, a thin, highly flexible branch. The smaller the more it hurts, no thicker than until she bled and welted. After that, I activated the slave seal for a while. When I was done, I took her back to her room and left her there to weep alone. But. But I was so. So. Horny. My god, I've never felt the need for sex so much in my life. I don't know what was worse, the craving or the fact that I got horny over the suffering of another sentient being. But I just. Needed to have a penis stuffed into me and make me pass out, and you are the only choice for that. But last night. I don't think I've ever had a great night. I've never passed out from pleasure, and it is the greatest thing in the world, sans feeling loved and loved in return. They can't argue with that. 
Naruto however doesn't know how to respond to Kikbi's treatment of Yujito. His heart goes out to the girl that is for sure but she is still a human being and doesn't deserve that kind of treatment. I, I know you have more experience with having slaves than I do but. But I don't like the punishment you gave her. I can't help but feel that it was excessive. I know you do but you have to remember that she is a slave. And she is also a human being. I agree that some punishment was needed but can you say that you weren't angry when you saw her? You were angry and wanted to hurt her and so you did more than she deserved. Bigby starts to get defensive. You are too young to be lecturing me on the treatment of slaves. Try again when you. Stop it. Both look to her Omi. Look, you both are right. Kikbi, you were excessive. It would have been fine if you used either one, but not both the switch and slave mark. Naruto, she gave her what she thought was an appropriate punishment. Had Yujito not learned her lesson, she would have done it again and would have grown bolder until she tried something. Let's just sit and have some lunch okay? There is no need to get hostile and end up saying something you are going to regret later. Neither can say anything against that. I'm sorry Kaiyu-chan. I shouldn't have said anything. No. I should be more understanding. I know that you empathize with her for being a jinch cricky and you see her not as a slave but as a human being. And don't stay quiet. I don't want you to resent me, which will happen if you don't talk with me about such things. There. Problem solved. Now let's dig in. They eat a moderate meal, all the while Naruto and Hiromi told Kikbi of what Kishina had talked about. Said woman joined them halfway through and joined them. They share a pleasant conversation and stay indoors the whole day. Naruto declines having sex when it draws time to go to bed, citing that his dick needs time to recuperate. Though that got difficult when Kikbi and Hiromi got into it, pleasuring each other. But Naruto stays strong. He knows that this is a test to see if they can break his willpower. Any other man would have but if nothing else, Naruto is a proud person and will keep his word until his dying breath. The next morning however, he was unable to resist when he woke up to both giving him a blowjob. They won that round. Currently, they are sitting and relaxing with FK and May, playing a board game known as Monopoly. Here and now version. Hiromi is in the lead, owning the five major villages, as well as a number of smaller villages, Naruto has been eliminated, May is on her last leg with just Kusagakur, Hidden Grass and Hashigakur, Hidden Star, Kishina is in second place with Omegakur, Hidden Rain, Takigakur, Hidden Waterfall, and Yukigakur, Hidden Snow, FK third with Yugakur, Hidden Hot Water, and Tanigakur, Hidden Valley, while well, Kikbi forfeit and started making out with Naruto. They are having a good time, and Naruto is glad to see FK enjoying herself around others. She needs to learn to socialize with others and get out more. However, they have run out of sake. So Naruto takes a sake run to Tsunade's secret supplier with Kikbi as she is already out of the game. So Naruto is outside the compound with his familiar glasses and a satisfied Kikbi walking next to him hand in hand. They take their time, take the scenic route and just walk around. Once they reach the store, Naruto buys a half dozen bottles of high-grade sake, directly imported from rice country. On their way back, Kikbi hackles Ray's. Her sharp eyes caught something. Naruto, said male turns his head towards the female voice. Standing there is Sakura. Kikbi moves in front of Naruto and resists the urge to growl. What do you want, Haruno? She flinches at his tone but steals herself. I want you to forgive me so I can have my life back. Naruto sighs. This again. Dream on, bitch. Narukun isn't the type to. Am I talking to you? No, so step aside whore. Kikbi is stunned by Sakura's blatant words. Kikbi anger boils, but an arm around her midsection calms her. Haruno, if you want my forgiveness it is best not to insult my wife. Sakura's eyes widened. It is almost unheard of for Shinobi to get married. Most prefer to just be in a relationship together. Yo. Your wife. That's right. My wife. I got married a few days ago. Now, about this forgiveness. Give me a reason to. Sakura fixes him with a look that screams is he serious. How about I didn't do anything wrong? How's that for starters? Naruto has to hold Kikbi back from jumping. Do you seriously believe that you did nothing wrong? Of course. I was only following what Sasuke said to do. Naruto resists the urge to slap himself. And therein lies the problem. You believe, even to this day, that the Uchiha is good enough to dictate what is morally right, what is socially acceptable, and what is the overall direction of the universe. Get a clue. He is a deranged lunatic with a serious superiority complex and homicidal tendencies. He sees Sakura shake in fury. Don't you speak about him that way. Once again, Naruto has to hold back Kikbi from just killing this girl. Until you figure it out, Haruno, I suggest that you stay away from me and my wives lest something happen because I'm not around to stop them from beating you into the ground. Naruto pulls Kikbi away from a still steaming Sakura. He walks her down the road with his arms still around her midsection. Though she breaks out of that quick enough. Come on, just let me end her. It will be a relief for all of us, Kikbi pleads. No. Don't touch her. 
I'm going to tell the same to the others, but she is off limits. I don't want you going intentionally near her. Bigby's face shows pure shock. Look, she needs to figure this out on her own. You say you want to punish her, well she is receiving punishment right now, and she doesn't need any help from you or anyone else. Though I feel that she will fall even further before eventually figuring it out. I want your word that you won't harm her intentionally or have someone else do it for you. Promise me. Bigby isn't happy about his words. She wants to just storm up to the bitch and show her exactly what she thinks of her. But her husband isn't moving on and is waiting for her word. She sighs as he isn't going to let it go, and she isn't one to disappoint him. Fine, Naruto smiles at her and hugs her to him. Thank you. I want her to figure it out, and she won't do that if she has constant interference. I know it isn't easy for you, but I believe it is the best way to go. I'm not happy. And you will receive your punishment tonight. Now sex for a day and you have to watch Rick-chan and I help each other. Time skip three days. The large crowd gathers to see off Naruto and his family. The older shinobi recognize Kashina, but know better than to ask questions. Tsunade and Jurei are now healed, having served their sentience. Both San and hug Naruto and shake hands with the women leaving with him. Also there are the rookie six and team ten. Then they are gone, having re-summoned Hiromi in her dragon form. It doesn't take long for the four of them to reach their destination. The moment they touch down, Kashina turns to Naruto. Your training begins now. Chapter 11. The Price of Power. In the depths of Odo, Sasuke Uchiha is sweaty. His body is in constant movement. His thoughts are focused and his breathing is shallow. His mouth is pursed in determination. Underneath him, the redeed is very loud, much to his annoyance, which is why she is on her stomach while he is plying her from behind. More Sasuke. Faster. Sasuke's only response is to grab her hair and haul her up to his face. Shut up, he snarls at her. He then slams her face back into the bed and puts his entire weight on her head while he focuses on his own needs. Karen whimpers from his harshness but stays quiet. All too soon, Sasuke feels the familiar contracting in his balls. Underneath him, Karen shudders in an orgasm of her own, forcing him all the quicker. He pushes faster and harder, completely ignoring the fact that Karen is now wincing from the force. At the last second, he pulls out and sprays his seat all over the redhead's back. He restrains himself from hitting her as she groans from the emptiness. Why didn't you cum in me? I told you it was fine. She asks in a small voice as she turns to face him. In a flash, Sasuke has her pinned to the bed with her arm twisted behind her painfully. Because I already told you why. You are unworthy to bear my children. You are a whore and a tool, nothing more. Better get used to it. Now get dressed and remove yourself from my sight. Sasuke climbs off the bed and gathers his robe, allowing the naked Karen to leave the room. It is at times like these that she wonders why she likes him or even has sex with him. Oh yeah, because he would just take her body without a permission. This way, it is just less painful and less traumatizing. With his robe tied, Sasuke exits his room for the showers. Having sex with Karen always makes him feel dirty and disgusting. However, every man has his urges, and she is just an end to that satisfaction. After exiting the shower and dressing for training, he enters the training area. Inside, he finds Arachimaru practicing with Kusanagi. I won't lose to that inch cricky again. I will not be humiliated in my own chosen art ever again. He senses Sasuke enter and stops his own training to turn to him. Hello, Sasuke-kun. Have you recovered from your injuries? Sasuke scoffs. What injuries? That hag with the oversized melons can't hurt me seriously. The Ichiha is surprised when Arachimaru gives him a serious look. From now on, I will no longer coddle you. If it weren't for me, you would be dead right now. The snake master tosses Sasuke a sword. He catches it, but immediately has to block a strike from Orochimaru as he attacks with the flat side of Kusanagi. Your training intensifies now. I won't pull punches and I won't stop until you fall unconscious. Now fight. Sasuke rolls away, activating his Sharingan as he does so. He blocks an overhead strike from Orochimaru only for Kusanagi to go right through his sword. He curses and backpedals, but Orochimaru doesn't let up. He avoids many strikes that would normally cost him due to his Sharingan, but his options are limited. He doesn't want to use his chakra sword as Kusanagi would chop it to pieces, and chakra conducting swords are very expensive. Sasuke makes several hand seals, but finds his hands bound but a snake from Orochimaru's sleeve. Sasuke sees the large foot of his sensei approaching him, but with his hands bound, there is nothing he can do but make it hurt less. When the foot makes contact, Sasuke goes with it instead of fighting it. He does this by jumping just as the foot arrives, allowing his body to not resist as much. In turn it won't do as much damage. But even with his plan, Sasuke flies through the air and hits the training wall and nearly cracks his skull. He slides down the wall only to see Orochimaru in front of him, sword poised to strike him down. The snake-like face glares down at his apprentice with something that lights a fire in Sasuke. Pity. Pitiful, truly shameful. 
You are a disgrace to your lineage, and I am embarrassed to call you my apprentice right now. Get up or I will kill you where you stand. Time skip one week, it took a full 10 minutes for Orochimaru to knock Sasuke out. He called for Kabuto and had him heal the life-threatening and grave injuries, but to leave the little things. Perhaps this will be a wake-up call that he isn't invincible. It is like that every day. Sasuke would incur more injuries only for Kabuto to heal the major ones, leaving him in constant pain. And Sasuke grows bitter. He dreams of ripping his teacher a new asshole turns out to be only that. A dream. For all his boasting, Sasuke was nowhere near Rachimaru's level of skill and experience. Over the next week, Sasuke grows more and more bitter. He is now to the point where he doesn't even consider Rachimaru his sensei. Sasuke doesn't see the long-term benefits of this kind of training and finds it barbaric if it can even be called training. But there is one who loathes Sasuke's new training more than him. Karen, once again, finds herself presently unwillingly being pounded into by an aggravated Sasuke. She holds in the whimpers as he smacks her around and doesn't bother being gentle. He takes out his rage and frustration on her, and even though he just started, she sports a dozen new bruises already with more accumulating by the minute. She can't raise a hand or voice to him, lest he get more violent. He does this every day instead of once a week like before. Her scars and bruises don't even get a chance to heal before more are inflicted. Add to that, Sasuke has taken to biting her to heal his own injuries, making her lose chakra constantly and sport even more scars than before. To say the least, the mystic that Sasuke is the one biting her has been lost. As Sasuke finishes, once again spraying himself on her back and uncaring that she didn't even climax once, he slings her across the room where she impacts the wall with a dull thud. He walks past her prone figure on his way to the showers, leaving her with the unsaid threat that she had better be gone by the time he gets back. Perrin grits her teeth. She will have her revenge one day, but that isn't any time soon. She must tread carefully for Sasuke as Rachimaru's next host, and therefore he will protect Sasuke from permanent disfiguration or disability. She drags herself from the room and down the hall, not even bothering covering herself up. Her naked form crawls along the floor a few hundred feet to her own room, scraping her already bruised and broken skin, where she can tend to herself. And she does just that. She climbs to her bed and applies a bomb to her bruises and scars. While they won't go away, the bomb will help make it fade faster. It takes her an hour to fully apply the bomb. It is at times like this where she wishes she had a clone technique. Some spots are just awkward or difficult to get to without help. She then goes and takes her own shower, riding herself off Sasuke's dried seat on her back and his stench. She then goes back to her room and applies a second coating of bomb, the first one having been washed and scrubbed off. It is during this coating that she feels it. Even when not concentrating, her sensory skills are second to none. She feels. Something like nothing she has ever felt before. Something so vile it makes her want to puke. It is dark and terrifying from just the aura. What's more surprising is that it is emanating from Sasuke's room. She focuses on the source of the disturbance. Now that she is concentrating, she feels two distinct patterns. One is Sasuke's, and the other is the petrifying and sickening aura. Sasuke's chakra is swirling like he is upset or angry, which is most of the time. God his chakra feels so. So. It wasn't Sasuke's good looks, or his status as an Achiha, or his desire for power that initially drew her to him and still is. It is his chakra. She is so skilled in sensing chakra that she can distinguish emotions, even tell if someone is lying. His chakra is strong and powerful, more so than even Arachimaru's. Never before has she felt such a strong chakra flow. It draws her to him, demands that she know this chakra, demands that she feel this chakra all the time, demands that she love this chakra, demands that she be intimately connected with it. Just like now, his chakra was mostly turbulent, unsteady like when he first came. His raging emotions guide him despite his calm and emotionless demeanor. But when his chakra settles when asleep and that is when she first felt just how. How euphoric his chakra feels to her. Even when chaotic, his chakra draws her in and makes her legs go wobbly, but when calm, she nearly faints. The closer she is, the stronger the effect. For a while now, she has been trying to cut herself off from his chakra, trying to distance herself from him. It has been hell to do. She has been going through withdrawal-like symptoms every time she tries. She can't sleep, can't concentrate, can't get her mind off of his chakra, can't function effectively without it. Sometimes, she gives in, just to let herself get to sleep or when she really needs that fix. But she always regrets it as she is pulled back in, same as before. Her mind doesn't want to be around him anymore, but her body requires it. With him raping her, all dreams of a romantic relationship with him went out the window and was blown up with a fire dragon bullet. But some part of her body always shivers in anticipation of getting that close to his chakra again, to feel it so close she can feel everything about it. Suddenly the chakra only she intimately knows changes. It takes on a much darker tone and quickly becomes thicker and even more powerful than before. 
But instead of feeling euphoria like before, she feels sick. It becomes closer to the other signature, close but not completely. The feeling grows and grows until she actually pukes from the feeling of his chakra alone. Suddenly there is a large explosion that rocks the base to its foundation. Her wall that faces in the direction of Sasuke's room is blown inward, showing her room with deadly projectiles of rock and whatever else came with the explosion. Her bare skin is cut by several jagged pieces as she covers her head from the shrapnel. When Karen looks back up through the smoke and dust, she can't believe her eyes. Sasuke, if he is Sasuke anymore, is standing still, looking up through the hole in the ceiling and out into the moonlight. His skin is much darker than before. In fact he looks just like when he activates his curse mark LV. 2. The only real difference is there is no mark on his nose and instead of creepy hand looking wings, these are thin, leathery, bony wings. But no warning, Sasuke takes off through the hole in the ceiling and flies into the night, intent on getting some payback on his old master, leaving a ruined base and a confused Karen behind. Scene shift Kanoha, Hokage's office. How many times do I have to say it? No. But, if you say one more word, I'll tear out your tongue and feed it to the Inuzuka's dogs. I have a village to secure and rebuild. I have two cage in a holding cell, and seven jinch cricky in this village, two of which are also in a holding cell. I do not have time to indulge your outrageous requests that we execute the strongest ninja this village has. Now get out of my sight before I decide to have Anko use you for target practice. The man with no name and face, cause the author is too lazy, quickly scampers out of the room. Bamboo, follow that man. Find his supporters and arrest them all for treason and plotting to harm a ninja of Kanoha. There is no indication that her orders are being followed, but Tsunadi knows they are. Electronic communication devices are so handy. Tsunadi sits back in her chair with a sigh. That was the tenth request to kill Naruto. She has lost count of the number of requests to have him exiled. Honestly, can't they just leave her to her job which in of itself is a horrid thing. She shudders at the thought of preferring the mounds of paperwork over petitions to kill the reason she came back. If Naruto was killed or kicked out, she would be the first out of the gates, never to return. Don't let it get to you, Haim. They are all just ignorant and stupid. And you use the door for once, Jureya. Tsunadi asks without opening her eyes or sitting up. I guess I have the ability to. The Hokage suppresses the urge to throw something at him. What are we going to do? That is one of the few times that Tsunadi is showing her true age. This job is taking a toll on her both physically and mentally, and now she sounds and feels as old as she really is. I don't know. I for one would love to see justice done, but I know it won't happen. We are attacked by not only several nations but by demons, and the only reason we are standing here right now is because of Naruto and Kikbi, not to mention his summons. I know but the populace doesn't see it that way. I have the elders on my ass as well, claiming that Naruto was the reason we got invaded in the first place. Tsunadi rubs her eyes, trying to relieve some stress. And then Kashina shows up, and now we have to deal with angels, demons, enemy countries, and Akatsuki. Could this situation get any worse? Actually Haim. Arachimaru is dead. Tsunade's eyes snap to him. What? Hiraya avoids her glare. Rumor has it that Sasuke killed him with some new ability and totaled the base they were staying at. Among the dead were Kabuto and a few other notable experiments. Could he have switched bodies into Sasuke? Hiraya thinks about it for a moment. It isn't the answer of the question he is thinking about, but how to tell her the answer. No, if he merely switched bodies, then why destroy the base and his loyal subjects? No, this is Sasuke's doing. I have a girl in custody and am having her transported here who was at the base when Sasuke went berserk. From what I can tell, this girl is in Yuzumaki and the most gifted sensor I've ever come across. She almost got away with her near precognitive abilities. It took sage mode to find her and then track her down. It is astounding the amount of control over her chakra she has. Tsunadi is silent for a moment as she digests the information. So do you have any idea where Sasuke is headed? Gureya shrugs. Beats me. I can only guess at possible places he could show up at, here being one of them. But it wouldn't be prudent to rely on them. But why here? Because this is Naruto's home and by destroying it, he believes that he will finally beat Naruto once and for all. Plus you beat his ass badly and he would want revenge. That and he is arrogant enough to think that he can take on all of us, and since only we know where Naruto went. He still thinks that Naruto is here. The silence falls between the two teammates before a grin breaks out on Jiraiya's face. On a different note, I hear that a certain Jinch Kriki made you blush like a schoolgirl. Tsunadi throws up her hands. Dear Kami, where did you hear that? It was a moment of weakness, and he was looking very dashing when I first saw him. Plus he didn't rap like his profile said he does. That would have been the most annoying thing ever. But I did promise him not to tell anyone. Yes, B begged her on his hands and knees not to tell off his non-rap page, because the author was too tired to write in bad raps at the time. It would totally ruin his image as an idiot and amateur rap artist. Anyways Jurea, how is the girl going to get here? 
I thought you only had a group of spies among them. Darker side of the entertainment industry. Gareya gives her an annoyed look. Look, you can call me a pervert, preferably a super pervert. You can call me lazy. But don't question my abilities or dedication. I know better than anyone how to run an operation and what characters are needed. As it happens, she is staying with an old associate of mine, and he will get her to another contact of mine, who happens to be a traveling merchant. He will get her here and is in fact already on his way. What about bandits, raiders, enemy shinobi? What happens if the merchant is ambushed? Gureus eyes. Look, I know what to do and have done this before. The only reason I'm not taking her back here myself is I would have been missed. It was a clone that found her, and even then it was pure luck that I picked up her trail. Sunity is silent and leaves it be. Jiraiya may fool around, but he does know his stuff even if he doesn't look like he does. Alright, alright. We'll deal with her when she gets here. Until then, we have to figure out what to do with Iwa and Kusa, not to mention the Jinch Kriki. I would love to get and have all seven here, but I don't think that would be possible. The population has issues with one, imagine their response to all seven here permanently, man. They don't count Naruto as one because Kikni can come and go as she pleases. Plus the Sambi is sealed in a kunai at this time, Gureya scoffs in agreement. They are having enough trouble with the four that are wandering around now. Though the elemental nations won't allow all nine bidge to be held by us for any length of time, even if it is just temporary. Not even Suna will allow that since their Jinch Kriki is their cage. The Rakage, while supportive of us, is not going to allow both of his Jinch Kriki to remain here. We will also have to think of a punishment that will be harsh enough but not led to war. The Daimyo was very insistent that we not go to war. I have a feeling that the Tsuchi Daimyo has been in contact with ours, and they have reached an agreement to reign in Iowa, should the punishment not led to war. Gureya and Tsunadi sit on that for a moment. We could always remove Lenoki from his seat and give it to someone more agreeable. Tsunadi shakes her head. No, that would lead to war, since most of Iowa already resent the leaf, and that would only increase their hatred of us. The decision makers of Iowa are out of reach. Any disciplinary action must come from their daimyo, which I think is what Shijimi was hinting at, she finishes tiredly. Tsunadi rubs her temples with her fingers in frustration, but what to do with Kusa? Jiraiya carries on, not really looking at Tsunadi but out the window. We could get missions from them but what else? We can't touch Shin either. We could force. Please stop. We could make them have a yearly stipend, put a limit on the number of shinobi, and make them unable to. Gureya. Not participate in future Chknin exams for three or four years, or force them to raise the price on all of their exported and imported products. Gureya. Tsunadi yells, finally getting his attention. Just stop Jiraiya, she finishes softly. The white-haired San and his shocked Tsunadi would interrupt him. He can't help but think her hinge is slipping with just how tired, wrinkled, and pale her skin is looking at this moment, her voice matching how she looks. I'm getting too old for this. I'm tired of constantly fighting, I'm tired of having to listen to bullshit day in and day out, and most of all, I'm tired of requests to kill or banish Naruto. He is the reason I'm here and from my understanding, this position was supposed to be temporary while you and the council look for a more permanent replacement. I don't enjoy this position, never have. I hate sending people to their deaths, it goes against my entire philosophy of saving people. I just want to be a medic again and not have to worry about such things. I think it's time to start training Naruto to be my replacement. Gureya crosses the room and in a rare show of maturity, he takes her hand gently in his, and his eyes don't even try to leave her face. Maybe it is but you're exhausted. Go home and get some sleep. It isn't good for us to be so tired and make such important decisions. Tsunadi looks at him sharply. Who are you and what have you done with Ureya? Said man chuckles at her joke while he absentmindedly rubs the back of her hand with his thumb. Hey, I can be a proper man when I want to be. Tsunadi smiles despite herself. This is the Jiraiya that she enjoys being around, the serious, charming, kind, dashing, and non-perverted side. She would have married him long ago if he didn't have so many. Quirks that make him unbearable to be around much less to live with. It's ironic to think his obsession with breasts and acting on that obsession kept him from getting a pair of the largest breasts on the planet. If they were married, she would have no qualms about letting him touch and look as much as he wanted to, as long as it was in the confines of their home. You're right, Jurea. We can talk about this later. Wanna go get a drink with me? No, you're going to bed. Don't make me call Shizun. His answer astounds and boggles her mind. He would always, always, jump at a chance to go drinking with her. It means that he gets one more chance to better or at least see her naked, not that it ever worked before. It is common knowledge that alcohol decreases the inhibitions of one's mind after all. Just what are you up to? She asks herself. But whatever his plan is, he is right. She does need sleep and not the alcohol-induced kind. Fine fine. Gureya smirks with his victory. Now if you excuse me, I need to make preparations for the arrival of our guest. 
Time skipped 10 days. The village is buzzing with news. Some red-headed chick with glasses is in the village, and she is important. Well it wasn't announced that this person is important when you have a visible guard of a dozen shinobi arranging from Jinin to Anbu walking you down the street, people tend to assume. The rumors range from the daughter of the daimyo to a messenger from Iwa, and one even states that she is from a race that lives in the ocean in the water. But to one pink-headed girl, there is only one rumor that she is interested in. That is why Sakura is seeking her out. If the particular rumor she overheard to Anbu at the hospital talking about is true then. Focus. She chides herself. It was three days ago when Kanoha erupted with rumors about this girl. Not soon afterwards, the rumor mill was going full swing, and Ino, the ever-loving queen of gossip, had a field day trying to discern truth from fiction to outlandish and wild speculation. But the redeed has yet to be seen again by the public, which makes Akura's task of finding this mystery girl all the more difficult. But she does have a lead. The Anbu weren't specific about the location of the girl, but from the way they were talking. Sakura rounds the corner and stops across the street from a nondescript building. The store of general merchandise is in front. Under the veil is the intelligence and interrogation department, the logistical center for all of Kanoha, the beating heart and center of the village. She knows this because of two things. She is a shinobi, and while it's Nin in rank, there is a common sense among the shinobi above Jenin. They all know where the Anbu headquarters is, the fact there are tunnels connecting the vital parts of the village, and some even that leave the village, and the location of the IAIC, Intelligence and Interrogation Center. And two. Her teacher in medicine rubbed off on her that it was okay to eavesdrop on conversations where she isn't entitled, and even gave her a technique to make it easier to hear what is being said. Knowing her goal, Sakura walks into the store. It doesn't sell anything that isn't new and exciting or anything that is out of date. Even the building itself seems to just fade into the background. Everything about the building has been meticulously crafted to be overlooked. And they did a masterful job. She looks around the store, trying to seem interested in the clothes they have. The clothing is all long sleeves and dull colors and pants in the same, boring colors. The food isn't too great, and the weapons are not polished nor sharpened past the manufacturing process. However, her eyes are scanning the building, looking for secret compartments, false walls or floors. She even went into the changing room to try on a pair of decent pants. She checked everything she could think of. But after a half hour, she is forced to give up, lest she be suspicious. Hell, she even bought the pants she tried on, even though she has no plans on ever wearing them. She walks down the street dejectedly and eyes the pants vowing to burn them once she is home. She gives an exasperated sigh as a thought crosses her mind. What did she expect? That place was set up by decades of research by the smartest people Kanoha has to offer. It would be either very bad or a trap if a Chknin level shinobi with no training in such things were to find a way in without being detected. She begins to feel a little better about herself and strengthens her determination. She will find a way in there and get her answers. Time skip one week. The table now has a dent in it. A very large and deep dent. This dent is from Sakura's repeated bashing of her head as she squeezes out every bit of knowledge from her head, every idea to find a way in. But after one week, she has found nothing, nothing, to give her some idea as to how to get in or even find the way in. She went to the library, talked with Kakashi, and tried to find blueprints. But the library is conveniently lacking in such material, Kakashi outright refused to answer espionage-related questions, and the blueprint shows nothing out of the ordinary. Hell, she even tried to find Naruto and ask him since he was trained under Jiraiya and could know them. But she couldn't find him and anyone who might know where he would be isn't talking or giving her hints as to his whereabouts. She is out of options, out of research, out of ideas. One might also say that she is out of her mind as well. She sighs in frustration and looks at the clock. She has a shift at the hospital in an hour and needs to get ready. It takes her all of 15 minutes to prepare and leave. As she walks down the street, her head is full of questions and thoughts of Sasuke and what to do. She can't just give up nor can she accept what Naruto said. She grabs her head and nearly screams. She is so confused about everything that she doesn't even know what to do anymore. That is until a flash of red catches her eye. She looks up and lo and behold, the reason for wanting to break into the most secure place in the village is not 30 feet from her. Her brain works quickly. What to do now? Should she ask her now? No, that would draw attention to herself. With probable Anbu watching the red head, a kidnapping is out of the question. So how is she going to get this girl alone where she can question her? She thinks while following the girl from a far distance. Suddenly she gets an idea, but she has to act fast. So she speeds up and within a minute has passed her target. She gets about a hundred feet from her target before dropping into an alleyway. She casts a Jinjutsu over herself, one of the few she looked up and trained to use, effectively hiding herself and chakra from those around her. Next she goes through several hand seals, but stops short of using them. She lies in wait and at the right time, presses her hands to the ground. Oton. 
Chibukaku, she whispers. Earth release. Moving earth core. Just before the Riti takes her next step, the ground just in front of her raises just a tiny bit and lowers where her foot will land. The result is Karen tripping on the raised ground. As she tries to regain her balance, she puts that same foot forward only to fall because the ground is lower than expected. As she falls, her ankle rolls to the right and she lands right on the twisted ankle in a cry of pain. From the side, Sakura smirks at her handiwork. Her ankle is definitely sprained and rolled if not broken entirely. And that means she will have to go to the hospital. Sakura makes it from the scene as quickly as she can and still remains undetected. As soon as she is clear, she drops the Jinjutsu and Sunshine to the hospital. After much begging for forgiveness and promising to get to work right away, her boss, Shizun, allows her to get to work. Sakura practically runs through everything that is given to her. When asked about her drive, she just shrugs and goes back to work. After three hours of non-stop work, Sakura checks the charts for the fifth time. But this time, she sees what she is looking for. A broken right ankle on a girl matching the description of her target has been given a cast in painkillers and is currently under observation in a restricted room. So she goes on break and has the girl's charts in her hand as she walks down the hallway. Her body feels very tingly and hypersensitive. Adrenaline pumps through her veins as she approaches the door. She can already see the Anbu standing outside the door and figures that another two or three are hidden close by. Before she knows it, she has reached the door and is stopped by the Anbu. This is a restricted room. Please go back the way you came, Bill asks. Sakura's stomach goes to her shoes, but she keeps her cool. But I'm here to check on Miss Karen. I need to check on her. Bull squares his shoulders. I'm sorry, but unless I hear from the director i.e. Shizun, you are not permitted. Sakura scowls on the inside. There is a short list of nurses and doctors who are authorized to care for patients requiring a guard for whatever reason and is approved by the director of the hospital herself. So Sakura just lies. I'm sorry but Captain San is in emergency surgery right now. She gave me authorization just before starting the procedure since Natsum San is on break right now and no other authorized nurses are available. Though she did make it clear that this is a one-time thing. Your patient isn't dangerous as is she. Belies her thoroughly, to which she honestly blushes under the scrutiny. But Bull takes it as a sign of sincerity, and he sighs. I'll have to have a talk with her about the procedure later. And no, she isn't dangerous. Bull steps aside to allow Sakura through. She gives him a smile just before closing the door. Inside, Sakura gets the first look at her handiwork. Karen's ankle is suspended from a strap with a heavy white cast around it. However, instead of being groggy from the painkillers, the redhead is wide awake and staring right at her. So you're the one who put me in this condition. That rattles Sakura. H. How? Karen smirks at the. Because I am a censor. Now would you please tell me why you assaulted me before I call in the Anbu from outside? Sakura hastily moves to the corner of the bed. Are the rumors true? Karen rolls her eyes. You're going to have to elaborate, Pinky. I've been here two weeks, and that little outing was my first time outside since I got here. I don't know of any rumors or why there would be any to begin with. Sakura is both embarrassed and annoyed at the redhead. There's been rumors going around that your royalty are a spy. Karen gives her a snort. But the only rumor I'm interested in is if you know the whereabouts of Sasuke Karen's amused mood is gone in an instant, replaced by one of anger and hostility. And why would you want to know where that rapist is? She growls out. Suddenly she finds Sakura in her face, an enraged look on her face. Sasuke Kun is not a rapist. But Karen isn't intimidated. She glares back with the same intensity. Now she gets why this girl wants to know. Let me tell you about your precious Sasuke Kun and how much of a bastard he really is. Sakura is surprised when Karen begins to undress from the hospital gown. Karen struggles with it until she gives into her frustration and tears the thin covering off. The sight makes Sakura's jaw drop. Karen's pale body is riddled with scars, each circular in shape and an inch or so in diameter. And not just on her arms. Her neck, shoulders, breasts, sides, and even one on her jaw. All in all, there are more than 40 of these same exact scars. These are proof of his brutality. See, I have a bloodline that allows others to heal from biting me and ingesting my blood. The drawback is it leaves a scar for every bite. That and it is deeply personal for me. But Sasuke didn't care. Besides actually raping me weekly, more recently daily, he would take a bite out of me every time he felt like it and he wasn't gentle. I was lucky if he would just leave me to crawl back to my room after he was finished. Sometimes he would throw me against a wall or knock me unconscious and toss me out of his room into the hallway on the way to the showers. Baron takes a lot of satisfaction in seeing the disturbed look on Sakura's face. No. No. Sasuke wouldn't do that. But there goes Karen's amusement. Wake up you fangirl. She yells, not caring if the Anbu hurt her or not. The Sasuke you knew is gone and believe me when I say that he isn't coming back. 
The only thing that brute cares about is getting revenge on those who have slighted him and nothing in between. He will destroy everything in his path to get his revenge. Sakura now looks like she wants to cry. Karen softens her tone a little. I would be lying if I didn't understand where you are coming from though. When I first met him, I fawned over him too. I daydreamed about having a family with him among other things. I was exactly like you for a time, believing that he couldn't do anything wrong. But that was thrown out the window. At first, I was elated that he was touching me like he was, that close to his chakra. But he just got rougher and rougher and had no regard to if I was in the mood or not. To him, I was his plaything, his stress reliever, his personal sex slave. Any thoughts I had of growing old with him, living a life of love with him was shattered. All I could do was bear through it, think of something else. Parent trails off for a moment. But now he isn't even human anymore. That knocks Akura out of her thoughts. What? I don't know what happened, but suddenly his chakra changed one night, Karen continues, not hearing Sakura, so wrapped up in her memory she is. He destroyed the base and ripped through it killing everything in his path. And then. Then he killed Arachimaru like it was nothing. After that, he took off and was out of my range within a matter of moments. Sakura sits in silence before speaking. But isn't that good? Now he has the power to get revenge on Itachi so he can come back here. Perrin turns a sharp eye to Sakura who involuntarily takes a step back from the intensity. You don't get it do you? He isn't human anymore, he won't stop killing until there is nothing else left to kill. I don't know what Sasuke had to agree to, but power like that doesn't come cheaply. There is no way that Sasuke will come back here unless it is to destroy it. Unknown to Sakura, there has been an Anbu inside the room and hidden the entire time, listening and reporting in. And he just got his orders. He phases into view and puts a hand on Sakura's shoulder. By order of the Hokage, you, Sakura Haruno, are under arrest. You are being charged with conspiracy, assault, and knowingly trespassing in a restricted area. The voice makes Sakura jump, but Karen has a different reaction. About damn time. I was wondering if you were going to twiddle your thumbs forever. The Anbu gives her a blank look, or at least the look he gave her is hidden behind the mask. You knew he was here? Sakura shouts, trying to break out of the grip of the Anbu, but to no avail. Yeah I knew. I'm the best damn sensor in the world. Before Sakura can retort, she is pulled away by the Anbu and taken to be processed. Later that night, the damp and dark walls surround Sakura, but they aren't the reason she can't sleep. Her mind is so wrapped up in what Karen said. Karen is just one in the long line of people who have told her that Sasuke isn't the knight in shining armor that she thinks he is. But. But, she can't even bring herself to think of a defense for Sasuke or refute Karen's statement and physical marks outright. But to her knowledge she is the only one to have actual experience dealing with Sasuke's theoretical ever-growing darker side beside Naruto. She grips her head in confusion, which seems to grow the longer she thinks about it. She thrashes about for a while, trying to make sense of it all. She tries and tries to think of something, but can only settle on one thing. I have to see him. I have to see if it's true. Then my dear, I have a proposition for you. Sakura wheels around, looking for the source of the voice. But the thick darkness prevents any hint of the person's location. S.H. Show yourself. Ah, but I am already here. You just cannot see me yet. The voice is very soft, like a whisper in the wind. Sakura searches for the source, but finds herself totally incapable of even seeing her hand that is just centimeters from her eyes. W.H. Who are you? Me? I am no one of consequence. I am but a mere messenger. However, I can. Help you. Help me how, she whispers into the darkness. Tell me little girl, what do you desire? What does your heart truly yearn for? The tiny red light goes off in the very depths of Sakura's mind, but it is totally ignored for she is completely enraptured by this voice, this chance. I want Sasuke-kun. I, I have to see him. In the darkness, the owner of the voice grins. Then all you have to do is take my hand. Take it and I will give you a power that none have seen before. You can leave without worry and search for your beloved. You can find him and make him yours. All you need to do is reach out and seize it. Sakura then sees a sickly hand of the palest white reach out of the nothingness. She hesitates only a second before taking the offered hand, and then her world explodes. Of Karen, a few minutes ago, the redeed lays is about her hospital room. With nothing to do, the only thing she can do is to use and refine her sensor abilities. So far there have been a total of 40 different Anbu to watch her since her arrival at the hospital, 10 surgeries in the hospital, and 3 different authorized nurses to tend to her. The only really interesting thing to happen besides what happened with Sakura is a nurse had multiple rounds of sex with several different patients. She is just now paying more attention to the immediate area around the hospital when she feels it. The same feeling from the hideout just before Sasuke's chakra changed, the same vomit-inducing signature. She closes her eyes and concentrates, following the trail to the source, all the while staving off the urge to empty her stomach. 
beads of sweat roll down her brow as she is forced to concentrate as hard as she can, as the distance between her and wherever it is. Just before it gets out of range, Karen locates the source. Her eyes fly open. Let me to the Hokage, now, she yells at the Anbu in her room. She flips over the covers, not caring that her gown has traveled up with wear, exposing her underwear to the shinobi. Anbu shows himself but instead of complying, he tries to push her back down. I'm sorry but I can't let you leave. Besides, you need rest. Karen, however, isn't to be so easily swayed. Damn it, I need to see the Hokage now. Something is going down right now and only I know it, she shouts. If nothing else goes and gets her here quickly, she tries when the Anbu doesn't let up. Anbu doesn't let her go but turns around and speaks to the communicator. After a short chat with the controller on the other side, the Anbu focuses on the retreat again. The commander will try to get her here. Karen hisses at him. Damn it, that's not good enough. Tell the bitch on the other side that the same thing that happened to Orochimaru's hideout is about to happen in the middle of Konoha. Get her ass here and get some units over to the prison. Now the Anbu would normally take exception to being given orders by a person that is heavily under surveillance, but being an Anbu, he has been informed of Orochimaru's current status and the situation around his demise. So instead of getting riled up like some new rookie, he immediately goes to his mick and informs dispatch. After he informs dispatch of the situation, Anbu is immediately sent to the prison, as well as several Junin and the Hokage herself. Karen relaxes at hearing that. Her part is done and can do nothing else. Well new, she can say that this place is a lot better than the cramped claustrophobia-inducing tunnels of Odo's hideouts. Not to mention that she doesn't have a certain someone raping her all the time. So she will do her part to protect this place and the people inside it. However, her moment of relaxation is over when the source of the vile feeling erupts like a volcano from the prison. She shoots up in her bed and gasps at the intense feeling of nausea the feeling brings with it. She retches and shakes uncontrollably, forcing the Anbu to hold her down and call for assistance from the nurse's station. He grits his teeth as his ear hurts from the sudden explosion of chatter and yelling on the Anbu frequency. He rips the earpiece out when two nurses enter along with another Anbu. They see her state and help restrain her. When they ask what she was doing just before, the Anbu assigned inside the room tells her he has no idea what caused this reaction. The nurses are left with no choice but to sedate her as Karen continues to spasm and pitch almost out of the grasp before people. A nurse runs to gather the supplies and heads back as fast as she can. She told the nurse manning the nurse's station just down the hall to get Shizun here immediately. The nurse rushes back into Karen's room and injects the sedative directly into Karen's exposed forearm. The effects are immediate. Karen slumps on the bed in a heap allowing four tired people to finally let her go. She is alive but very much asleep. Anbu cells, soon that he lands just short of the no longer hidden Anbu detention center. Dust and smoke obscure the area making it impossible to see the actual walls of the center. Anbu, clear out the smoke. Two Anbu who were already on site make hand signs. They flash through them and generate a gust of wind, making the smoke and dust dissipate at a quick rate. The walls come into sight just as another explosion blasts through the wall. Tsunadi and the Anbu tense and ready themselves for a fight. But they weren't prepared for what they saw. The person emerges from the dust, the sight making them back away in fear. Asakura. Tsunadi stutters out, shocking those around her. The being turns towards the Sanin, showing recognition of her name. Sakura's body has changed drastically. Her skin is now much darker and has a slight leathery quality. Her eyes have a pink ring around them that glows slightly, and her hair is choppier and has random clumps of hair that stick up. But the greatest change is her body. She is much thinner, showing her ribs. Her thighs, arms, stomach and neck are all noticeably thinner as well. What? What the hell happened to you? Instead of answering, Sakura suddenly grips her head in anguish and confusion. Sasuke-kun. Must. Find. Comes her distorted voice. Tsunadi and the Anbu prepare to apprehend her when she disappears almost instantly. Only a very faint blur can be seen of her. However, her feet leave crater marks for every time she takes a step, showing a newfound speed that none have seen before. The assembled shinobi can do nothing but gape. Squad 8 and 9 follow and capture her. 8 Anbu take off after the escaped prisoner. The rest of you secure the village. I don't know what the hell just happened, but whatever it was, it can't be good. The shinobi salute their cage and move to fulfill their orders. Meanwhile Tsunadi went to the hospital to have a chat. Scene shift, Tsunadi arrives on the scene to see Shizun in a robe and her pajamas, pink with teddy bears, scanning over a knocked out Karen. In the room are two visible Anbu, Cheetah and Sparrow, along with a gaggle of nurses. Everyone not qualified to have a class A clearance leave now. There are several classes of intelligence clearance. The highest being class S. Only the cage, Junin commander, Anbu captain, and former cage have this classification. This is information that is so sensitive that it could incite wars or civil unrest. 
Naruto's lack of being a Jinch Kriki and the identity of his parents are under this category. Any breach of this class is an automatic death sentence. The next is Class A Anbu, Elite Junin, and the heads of departments have this classification. Information in this classification include village defenses, location of the Anbu headquarters, location of the IAIC, the Anbu hospital, Anbu detention center, Anbu entrances, and the like. Revealing secrets of this caliber is between a severe jail time and death, depending on the extent of the The only exception to these is the counselor the advisory board. As clan heads and Jinin themselves, they advise the Hokage on different matters from domestic to war to promotions. They can hear whatever the Hokage and Jinin commander is willing to discuss. Anything that is said in that room automatically has a class S restriction, making a leak punishable by death. It is unfortunate that Saratobi was too old and unwilling to enforce this practice. Back in the room, Shizun whirls around, having not detected her mentor. She waits for the nurses to clear out of the room before starting to speak. Physically there is nothing wrong with her. According to Cheetah here, she suddenly started yelling about needing to go to you or you come to her. When Cheetah didn't allow her up, she shouted how something that happened to Orochimaru's base is going to happen in Kanoha. After that, she just started shaking and having spasms uncontrollably. I called for assistance, and we were eventually able to get her under control with a sedative. However, it took four of us to barely hold her down. That girl is amazingly strong for her build, and Cheetah finishes up for Shizun. Tsunade nods and dismisses the two Anbu back to their posts. She walks over and runs a few chakra-based tests on Karen just to be sure. Shizun may be an excellent medic, but she doesn't have the sheer vast experience that the Hokage does. Finding nothing wrong as Shizun said, Tsunade uses it to instantly burn up most of the sedative in Karen's bloodstream. Tsunade lightly slaps Karen's cheeks to awaken her. It takes a moment, but Karen's eyes slowly open. The Tsunade used leaves with only enough sedative to wake the patient slowly. It is a lot easier to deal with a patient that way. Karen's eyes open telling Tsunade that Karen is awake. Tell me what you know. On instinct, like she has every day after she unlocked her chakra after waking up, Karen scans the area for threats. Her eyes are unfocused as she takes in what her senses tell her. Suddenly her senses go haywire. She feels a moment towards herself from a very large chakra source not a few feet from her. Her body reacts on its own and moves to intercept the attack, but her brain registers just who the signature belongs to. Tsunade and the others stare at Karen, who looked like she had an electric shock run through her. Tsunade had moved her hand forward to gently tap Karen in the cheek to gain her attention and wake her up when Karen just sort of jumped like a bolt of lightning had hit her. Now Karen's mind fully awakens. When she sees the shocked faces of those around her, she puts the pieces together. Sorry about that. I'm a sensor. My body wakes up differently than others. My chakra and sensing abilities are the first to awaken. I must have sensed your chakra so close to me and reacted on instinct. Tsunade takes the information in and proceeds with her questions. Tell me what happened. I need to know. Karen takes a deep breath. It was just like before. I was laying here with nothing to do besides home and test my sensor abilities when I felt it. The feeling of whatever it is so vile it makes me want to throw up. But I fought down that feeling and followed it. I tracked it to its origins and detected it in a cell. I felt two signatures in the room, but from this distance, I couldn't tell who was in the cell beforehand. But then its presence expanded exponentially, almost like it exploded. The person's chakra signature changed just like Sasuke's. The person's chakra became like it, and I couldn't stand the feeling anymore. After that, I blacked out. Tsunade sits in thought. Could you identify it again? Perrin nods immediately. Definitely. I have never felt anything like it before. Last question. Can you tell me the direction that Sakura went? Is that who was in the cell? Tsunade nods and Karen closes her eyes and stretches out her senses. As soon as she pushed her senses far enough, she felt it. It is an easy trail to pick up. Karen follows it until she gets to the detention center, the origin of the chakra explosion. Karen then follows the malevolent chakra into the heart of the village. From there, she tracks it as it makes a turn and makes a beeline for the east gate. Karen follows it for as long as she can, but loses it after two miles outside the village. The signature headed through the middle of the village after escaping. From there, it shot for the eastern gate. Once outside, it goes straight east until it is out of my range. Tsunade nods and turns to the Anbu in the room and Shizun. I need a moment alone. Taking the not-so hint, the room empties. Thank you. Listen, I know you have no real reason to stay, but I would like to consider my proposal. If you agree to become my personal censor you would be in charge of Kanoha Detection Grid and answer only to me. On top of this, you would have free reign to change anything about the entrances and exits, as well as the detection grid to Anbu patrol patterns as you see fit. Lastly, you would track any of the signatures that you felt tonight, whether it be Sasuke, Sakura, or whatever it was that caused their changes. You will be my second in command and have an S-class clearance. 
I'm offering you a home. I'm offering you respect. I'm offering you a chance to restart. To say that Karen is stunned is like saying that Mike Guy likes the color green. Her analytical mind starts working overtime, thinking of the pros and cons of both accepting and rejecting, gracefully and politely, the offer. She understands that Tsunade is taking a massive risk that she could be a spy or worse a saboteur. However, Tsunade must believe that the benefits of a new system and abilities outweigh the risks. She understands that if she were to turn on them after accepting the position, then it will likely cost the Hokage her job. However, this isn't a decision that you can just make a snap judgment on. This requires serious thought as the responsibilities are no joke. People's lives are at risk and people will look to you for orders or advice. One must know how to handle subordinates, manage said subordinates. As confident as she is on her sensor abilities, this is something that she must give pause and think about. And I think about it. Tsunade nods. That's only fair. Tsunade gets up to leave but stops at the door. Oh, and just so you know, Kanoha can be your home even if you don't accept my offer. And with that the busty cage is gone, leaving Karen with a lot of thinking to do. Next day, Tsunade is in her office very early the next day, shocking those around her. One might assume that she had been drunk or at least heavily buzzed last night with all that happened. But Tsunade is there to deal with the situation. She has to cover up and hush the crowd about what happened and keep the location of the detection center a secret. Neither are easy tasks. In fact, she has called a meeting with the advisory board for this very matter. She only has to wait a half hour more so she can conduct this meeting and figure out how to keep it under wraps. She is pushing through paperwork at a fast pace, figuring the sooner she gets this done, the sooner her headache can go away. That is until she gets a knock on the door. After a quick enter, the door opens and reveals the only retreat in the village. Karen walks as swiftly as she can with a boot and crutches to Tsunade's paper-covered desk. She plops down in a chair with a huff and a groan. You know, you could just heal my ankle and be done with it. Tsunade sends her a knowing smile. But why would I deny you such a great learning experience? Besides, unless you're a ninja, we don't use chakra to heal such inconsequential wounds. Karen scowls at her words. And pray tell what lesson am I learning? She doesn't lick at Tsunade's smirk. Empathy. Now I assume you are here because you've made a decision. It is Karen's turn to smirk. I accept. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.